Chapter One of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter One Ancestry. Thomas Lincoln and Nancy Hanks. Rock Spring Farm. Lincoln's Birth. Kentucky Schools. The Journey to Indiana. Pigeon Creek Settlement. Indiana Schools. Sally Bush Lincoln. Gentryville. Work and Books. Satires and Sermons. Flatboat Voyage to New Orleans. The Journey to Illinois. Abraham Lincoln, the sixteenth President of the United States, was born in a log cabin in the backwoods of Kentucky on the twelfth day of February, 1809. His father, Thomas Lincoln, was sixth in direct line of descent from Samuel Lincoln, who emigrated from England to Massachusetts in 1638. Following the prevailing drift of American settlement, these descendants had, during a century and a half, successively moved from Massachusetts to New Jersey, from New Jersey to Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania to Virginia, and from Virginia to Kentucky, while collateral branches of the family eventually made homes in other parts of the West. In Pennsylvania and Virginia, some of them had acquired considerable property and local prominence. In the year 1780, Abraham Lincoln, the President's grandfather, was able to pay into the public treasury of Virginia one hundred and sixty pounds current money, for which he received a warrant directed to the principal surveyor of any county within the Commonwealth of Virginia, to lay off in one or more surveys for Abraham Lincoln, his heirs or assigns, the quantity of four hundred acres of land. The error in the spelling of the name was a blunder of the clerk who made out the warrant. With this warrant and his family of five children, Mordecai, Josiah, Mary, Nancy, and Thomas, he moved to Kentucky, then still a county of Virginia, in 1780, and began opening a farm. Four years later, while at work with his three boys in the edge of his clearing, a party of Indians, concealed in the brush, shot and killed him. Josiah, the second son, ran to a neighboring fort for assistance. Mordecai, the eldest, hurried to the cabin for his gun, leaving Thomas, youngest of the family, a child of six years, by his father. Mordecai had just taken down his rifle from its convenient resting place over the door of the cabin when, turning, he saw an Indian in his war paint stooping to seize the child. He took quick aim through a loophole, shot and killed the savage, at which the little boy also ran to the house, and from this citadel Mordecai continued firing at the Indians until Josiah brought help from the fort. It was doubtless this misfortune which rapidly changed the circumstances of the family. Kentucky was yet a wild new country. As compared with later periods of emigration, settlement was slow and pioneer life a hard struggle. So it was probably under the stress of poverty, as well as by the marriage of the older children, that the home was gradually broken up, and Thomas Lincoln became, quote, even in childhood, a wandering, laboring boy, and grew up literally without education. Before he was grown, he passed one year as a hired hand with his uncle Isaac in Watauga, a branch of the Holston River, unquote. Later he seems to have undertaken to learn the trade of carpenter in the shop of Joseph Hanks in Elizabethtown. When Thomas Lincoln was about twenty-eight years old, he married Nancy Hanks, a niece of his employer near Beachland in Washington County. She was a good-looking young woman of twenty-three, also from Virginia, and so far superior to her husband in education that she could read and write, and taught him how to sign his name. Neither one of the young couple had any money or property, but in those days living was not expensive, and they doubtless considered his trade a sufficient provision for the future. 
he brought her to a little house in Elizabethtown, where a daughter was born to them the following year. During the next twelve months, Thomas Lincoln either grew tired of his carpenter work, or found the wages he was able to earn insufficient to meet his growing household expenses. He therefore bought a little farm on the big south fork of Nolan Creek, in what was then Hardin, and is now LaRue County, three miles from Hodgensville, and thirteen miles from Elizabethtown. Having no means, he of course bought the place on credit a transaction not so difficult when we remember that in that early day there was plenty of land to be bought for mere promises to pay, under the disadvantage, however, that farms to be had on these terms were usually of a very poor quality, on which energetic or forehanded men did not care to waste their labor. It was a kind of land generally known in the West as barrens, rolling upland with very thin, unproductive soil. Its momentary usefulness was that it was partly cleared and cultivated, that an indifferent cabin stood on it ready to be occupied, and that it had one specially attractive as well as useful feature, a fine spring of water, prettily situated amid a graceful clump of foliage, because of which the place was called Rock Spring Farm. The change of abode was perhaps in some respects an improvement upon Elizabethtown. To pioneer families in deep poverty, a little farm offered many more resources than a town lot. Space, wood, water, greens in the spring, berries in the summer, nuts in the autumn, small game everywhere, and they were fully accustomed to the loss of companionship. On this farm, and in this cabin, the future President of the United States was born on the 12th of February, 1809 and here the first four years of his childhood were spent. When Abraham was about four years old, the Lincoln home was changed to a much better farm of 238 acres on Knob Creek, six miles from Hodgensville, bought by Thomas Lincoln, again on credit, for the promise to pay 118 pounds. A year later he conveyed 200 acres of it by deed to a new purchaser. In this new home the family spent four years more, and while here, Abraham and his sister Sarah began going to ABC schools. Their first teacher was Zachariah Riney, who taught near the Lincoln cabin. The next, Caleb Hazel, at a distance of about four miles. Thomas Lincoln was evidently one of those easy-going, good-natured men who carry the virtue of contentment to an extreme. He appears never to have exerted himself much beyond the attainment of a necessary subsistence. By a little farming and occasional jobs at his trade, he seems to have supplied his family with food and clothes. There is no record that he made any payment on either of his farms. The fever of westward emigration was in the air, and, listening to glowing accounts of rich lands and newer settlements in Indiana, he had neither valuable possessions nor cheerful associations to restrain the natural impulse of every frontiersman to move. In this determination his carpenter's skill served him a good purpose, and made the enterprise not only feasible, but reasonably cheap. In the fall of 1816 he built himself a small flatboat, which he launched at the mouth of Knob Creek, half a mile from his cabin, on the waters of the Rolling Fork. This stream would float him to Salt River, and Salt River to the Ohio. He also thought to combine a little speculation with his undertaking. Part of his personal property he traded for four hundred gallons of whiskey. Then, loading the rest on his boat with his carpenter's tools and the whiskey, he made the voyage, with the help of the current, down the Rolling Fork to Salt River down Salt River to the Ohio, and down the Ohio to Thompson's Ferry, in Perry County on the Indiana shore. The boat capsized once on the way, but he saved most of the cargo. Sixteen miles out from the river he found a location in the forest which suited him. Since his boat would not float upstream, he sold it, left his property with a settler, and trudged back home to Kentucky, all the way on foot, to bring his wife and the two children, Sarah, nine years old, and Abraham, seven. 
Another son had been born to them some years before, but had died when only three days old. This time the trip to Indiana was made with the aid of two horses, used by the wife and children for riding, and to carry their little equipage for camping at night by the way. In a straight line the distance is about fifty miles, but it was probably doubled by the very few roads it was possible to follow. Having reached the Ohio and crossed to where he had left his goods on the Indiana side, he hired a wagon, which carried them and his family the remaining sixteen miles through the forest to the spot he had chosen, which in due time became the Lincoln Farm. It was a piece of heavily timbered land, one and a half miles east of what has since become the village of Gentryville in Spencer County. The lateness of the autumn compelled him to provide a shelter as quickly as possible, and he built what is known on the frontier as a half-faced camp, about fourteen feet square. This structure differed from a cabin in that it was closed on only three sides and open to the weather on the fourth. It was usual to build the fire in front of the open side, and the necessity of providing a chimney was thus avoided. He doubtless intended it for a mere temporary shelter, and, as such, it would have sufficed for good weather in the summer season. But it was a rude provision for the winds and snows of an Indiana winter. It illustrates Thomas Lincoln's want of energy that the family remained housed in this primitive camp for nearly a whole year. He must, however, not be too hastily blamed for his dilatory improvement. It is not likely that he remained altogether idle. A more substantial cabin was probably begun, and, besides, there was the heavy work of clearing away the timber, that is, cutting down the large trees, chopping them into suitable lengths, and rolling them together into great log heaps to be burned, or splitting them into rails to fence the small field upon which he managed to raise a patch of corn and other things during the ensuing summer. Thomas Lincoln's arrival was in the autumn of 1816. That same winter Indiana was admitted to the Union as a state. There were as yet no roads worthy of the name to or from the settlement formed by himself and seven or eight neighbors at various distances. The village of Gentryville was not even begun. There was no sawmill to saw lumber. Breadstuff could be had only by sending young Abraham on horseback seven miles with a bag of corn to be ground on a hand gristmill. In the course of two or three years, a road from Corridon to Evansville was laid out, running past the Lincoln Farm, and, perhaps two or three years afterward, another from Rockport to Bloomington, crossing the former. This gave rise to Gentryville. James Gentry entered the land at the crossroads. Gideon Romine opened a small store, and their joint efforts succeeded in getting a post office established from which the village gradually grew. For a year after his arrival Thomas Lincoln remained a mere squatter. Then he entered the quarter section, 160 acres, on which he opened his farm, and made some payments on his entry, but only enough in eleven years to obtain a patent for one half of it. About the time that he moved into his new cabin, relatives and friends followed from Kentucky, and some of them in turn occupied the half-faced camp. In the ensuing autumn much sickness prevailed in the Pigeon Creek settlement. It was thirty miles to the nearest doctor, and several persons died, among them Nancy Hanks Lincoln, the mother of young Abraham. The mechanical skill of Thomas was called upon to make the coffins, the necessary lumber for which had to be cut with a whipsaw. The death of Mrs. Lincoln was a serious loss to her husband and children. Abraham's sister Sarah was only eleven years old, and the tasks and cares of the little household were altogether too heavy for her years and experience. Nevertheless, they struggled on bravely through the winter and next summer. But in the autumn of 1819, Thomas Lincoln went back to Kentucky and married Sally Bush Johnston, whom he had known and, it is said, courted when she was merely Sally Bush. Johnston, to whom she was married about the time Lincoln married Nancy Hanks, had died, leaving her with three children. 
She came of a better station in life than Thomas, and is represented as a woman of uncommon energy and thrift, possessing excellent qualities both of head and heart. The household goods which she brought to the Lincoln home in Indiana filled a four-horse wagon. Not only were her own three children well clothed and cared for, but she was able at once to provide little Abraham and Sarah with home comforts to which they had been strangers during the whole of their young lives. Under her example and urging, Thomas at once supplied the yet unfinished cabin with floor, door, and windows, and existence took on a new aspect for all the inmates. Under her management and control, all friction and jealousy was avoided between the two sets of children, and contentment, if not happiness, reigned in the little cabin. The new stepmother quickly perceived the superior aptitudes and abilities of Abraham. She became very fond of him, and in every way encouraged his marked inclination to study and improve himself. The opportunities for this were meager enough. Mr. Lincoln himself has drawn a vivid outline of the situation. Quote, it was a wild region, with many bears and other wild animals still in the woods. There I grew up. There were some schools so called, but no qualification was ever required of a teacher beyond readin', writin', and cipherin' to the rule of three. If a straggler supposed to understand Latin happened to sojourn in the neighborhood, he was looked upon as a wizard. There was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education. Unquote. As Abraham was only in his eighth year when he left Kentucky, the little beginnings he had learned in the schools kept by Riney and Hazel in that state must have been very slight. Probably only his alphabet, or possibly three or four pages of Webster's elementary spelling book. It is likely that the multiplication table was as yet an unfathomed mystery, and that he could not write or read more than the words he spelled. There is no record at what date he was able again to go to school in Indiana. Some of his schoolmates think it was in his tenth year, or soon after he fell under the care of his stepmother. The schoolhouse was a low cabin of round logs, a mile and a half from the Lincoln home, with split logs, or puncheons, for a floor, split logs roughly leveled with an axe and set up on legs for benches, and a log cut out of one end, and the space filled in with squares of greased paper for window panes. The main light in such primitive halls of learning was admitted by the open door. It was a type of school building common in the early West, in which many a statesman gained the first rudiments of knowledge. Very often Webster's elementary spelling book was the only textbook. Abraham's first Indiana school was probably held five years before Gentryville was located and a store established there. Until then it was difficult, if not impossible, to obtain books, slates, pencils, pen, ink, and paper and their use was limited to settlers who had brought them when they came. It is reasonable to infer that the Lincoln family had no such luxuries, and, as the Pigeon Creek settlement numbered only eight or ten families, there must have been very few pupils to attend this first school. Nevertheless, it is worthy of special note that even under such difficulties and limitations, the American thirst for education planted a schoolhouse on the very forefront of every settlement. Abraham's second school in Indiana was held about the time he was fourteen years old, and the third in his seventeenth year. By this time he probably had better teachers and increased facilities, though with the disadvantage of having to walk four or five miles to the schoolhouse. He learned to write, and was provided with pen, ink, and a copy-book, and probably a very limited supply of writing paper, for facsimiles had been printed of several scraps and fragments upon which he had carefully copied tables, rules, and sums from his arithmetic, such as those of long measure, land measure, and dry measure, and examples in multiplication and compound division. All this indicates that he pursued his studies with a very unusual purpose and determination, not only to understand them at the moment, but to imprint them indelibly upon his memory, 
and even to regain them in visible form for reference when the school-book might no longer be in his hands or possession. Mr. Lincoln has himself written that these three different schools were, quote, kept successively by Andrew Crawford, Sweeney, and Azel W. Dorsey, unquote. Other witnesses state the succession somewhat differently. The important fact to be gleaned from what we learn about Mr. Lincoln's schooling is that the instruction gave him by these five different teachers, two in Kentucky and three in Indiana, in short sessions of attendance scattered over a period of nine years, made up in all less than a twelve-month. He said of it in 1860, quote, Abraham now thinks that the aggregate of all his schooling did not amount to one year. Unquote. This distribution of the tuition he received was doubtless an advantage. Had it all been given him at his first school in Indiana, it would probably not have carried him half through Webster's elementary spelling book. The lazy or indifferent pupils who were his schoolmates doubtless forgot what was taught them at one time, before they had opportunity at another. But to the exceptional character of Abraham, these widely separated fragments of instruction were precious steps to self-help, of which he made unremitting use. It is the concurrent testimony of his early companions that he employed all his spare moments in keeping on with some one of his studies. His stepmother says, Abe read diligently. He read every book he could lay his hands on, and when he came across a passage that struck him, he would write it down on boards, if he had no paper, and keep it there until he did get paper. Then he would rewrite it, look at it, repeat it. He had a copy-book, a kind of scrap-book, in which he put down all things, and thus preserved them. There is no mention that Either he or other pupils had slates and slate pencils to use at school or at home, but he found a ready substitute in pieces of board. It is stated that he occupied his long evenings at home doing sums on the fire shovel. Iron fire shovels were a rarity among pioneers. They used, instead, a broad, thin clapboard with one end narrowed to a handle. In cooking by the open fire, this domestic implement was of the first necessity to arrange piles of live coals on the hearth, over which they set their skillet and oven, upon the lids of which live coals were also heaped. Upon such a wooden shovel Abraham was able to work his sums by the flickering firelight. If he had no pencil, he could use charcoal and probably did so. When it was covered with figures he would take a drawing-knife, shave it off clean, and begin again. Under these various disadvantages, and by the help of such troublesome expedients, Abraham Lincoln worked his way to so much of an education as placed him far ahead of his schoolmates, and quickly abreast of the acquirements of his various teachers. The field from which he could glean knowledge was very limited, though he diligently borrowed every book in the neighborhood. This list is a short one. Robinson Crusoe, Aesop's Fables, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Weems' Life of Washington, and A History of the United States. When he had exhausted other books, he even resolutely attacked the revised statutes of Indiana, which Dave Turnham, the constable, had in daily use, and permitted him to come to his house and read. It needs to be borne in mind that all this effort at self-education extended from first to last over a period of twelve or thirteen years, during which he was also performing hard manual labor, and proves a degree of steady, unflinching perseverance in a line of conduct that brings into strong relief a high aim and the consciousness of abundant intellectual power. He was not permitted to forget that he was on an uphill path, a stern struggle with adversity. The leisure hours which he was able to devote to his reading, his penmanship, and his arithmetic were by no means overabundant. Writing of his father's removal from Kentucky to Indiana, he says, He settled in an unbroken forest, and the clearing away of surplus wood was the great task ahead. Abraham, though very young, was large of his age, and had an axe put into his hands at once. And from that, till within his twenty-third year, 
he was almost constantly handling that most useful instrument, less, of course, in ploughing and harvesting seasons. John Hanks mentions the character of his work a little more in detail. Quote, he and I worked barefoot, grubbed it, ploughed, mowed, and cradled together, ploughed corn, gathered it, and shucked corn. Unquote. The sum of it all is that from his boyhood until after he was of age, most of his time was spent in the hard and varied muscular labor of the farm and the forest, sometimes on his father's place, sometimes as a hired hand for other pioneers. In this very useful but commonplace occupation he had, however, one advantage. He was not only very early in his life a tall, strong country boy, but as he grew up he soon became a tall, strong, sinewy man. He early attained the unusual height of six feet four inches, with arms of proportionate length. This gave him a degree of power and facility as an axeman which few had or were able to acquire. He was therefore usually able to lead his fellows in efforts of both muscle and mind. He performed the task of his daily labor and mastered the lessons of his scanty schooling with an ease and rapidity they were unable to attain. Twice during his life in Indiana this ordinary routine was somewhat varied. When he was sixteen, while working for a man who lived at the mouth of Anderson's Creek, it was part of his duty to manage a ferry-boat which transported passengers across the Ohio River. It was doubtless this which three years later brought him a new experience that he himself related in these words. When he was nineteen, still residing in Indiana, he made his first trip upon a flatboat to New Orleans. He was a hired hand merely, and he and a son of the owner, without other assistance, made the trip. The nature of part of the cargo load, as it was called, made it necessary for them to linger and trade along the sugar coast, and one night they were attacked by seven negroes with intent to kill and rob them. They were hurt some in the melee, but succeeded in driving the negroes from the boat, and then cut cable, weighed anchor, and left. This commercial enterprise was set on foot by Mr. Gentry, the founder of Gentryville. The affair shows us that Abraham had gained an enviable standing in the village as a man of honesty, skill, and judgment, one who could be depended on to meet such emergencies as might arise in selling their bacon and other produce to the cotton planters along the shores of the lower Mississippi. By this time Abraham's education was well advanced. His handwriting, his arithmetic, and his general intelligence were so good that he had occasionally been employed to help in the Gentryville store, and Gentry thus knew by personal test that he was entirely capable of assisting his son Allen in the trading expedition to New Orleans. For Abraham, on the other hand, it was an event which must have opened up wide vistas of future hope and ambition. Allen Gentry probably was nominal supercargo and steersman, but we may easily surmise that Lincoln, as the bow oar, carried his full half of general responsibility. For this service the elder gentry paid him eight dollars a month and his passage home on a steamboat. It was the future president's first eager look into the wide, wide world. Abraham's devotion to his books and his sums stands forth in more striking light from the fact that his habits differed from those of most frontier boys in one important particular. Almost every youth of the backwoods early became a habitual hunter and superior marksman. The Indiana woods were yet swarming with game, and the larder of every cabin depended largely upon this great storehouse of wild meat. The Pigeon Creek settlement was especially fortunate on this point. There was in the neighborhood of the Lincoln home what was known in the West as a deer lick, that is, there existed a feeble salt spring which impregnated the soil in its vicinity or created little pools of brackish water, and various kinds of animals, particularly deer, resorted there to satisfy their natural craving for salt by drinking from these or licking the moist earth. 
Hunters took advantage of this habit, and one of their common customs was to watch in the dusk or at night, and secure their approaching prey by an easy shot. Skill with a rifle and success in the chase were points of friendly emulation. In many localities the boy or youth who shot a squirrel in any part of the animal except its head became the butt of the jests of his companions and elders. Yet, under such conditions and opportunities, Abraham was neither a hunter nor a marksman. He tells us, A few days before the completion of his eighth year, in the absence of his father, a flock of wild turkeys approached the new log cabin, and Abraham, with a rifle gun standing inside, shot through a crack and killed one of them. He has never since pulled a trigger on any larger game. The hours which other boys spent in roaming the woods or lying in ambush at the deer lick, he preferred to devote to his effort at mental improvement. It can hardly be claimed that he did this from calculating ambition. It was a native intellectual thirst, the significance of which he did not himself yet understand. Such exceptional characteristics manifested themselves only in a few matters. In most particulars he grew up as the ordinary backwoods boy develops into the youth and man. As he was subjected to their usual labors, so also he was limited to their usual pastimes and enjoyments. The varied amusements common to our day were not within their reach. The period of the circus, the political speech, and the itinerant show had not yet come. Schools, as we have seen, and probably meetings or church services, were irregular, to be had only at long intervals. Primitive athletic games and commonplace talk, enlivened by frontier jests and stories, formed the sum of social intercourse when half a dozen or a score of settlers of various ages came together at a house-raising or corn-husking, or when mere chance brought them at the same time to the post-office or the country store. On these occasions, however, Abraham was, according to his age, always able to contribute his full share or more. Most of his natural aptitudes equipped him especially to play his part well. He had quick intelligence, ready sympathy, a cheerful temperament, a kindling humor, a generous and helpful spirit. He was both a ready talker and appreciative listener. By virtue of his tall stature and unusual strength of sinew and muscle, he was from the beginning a leader in all athletic games. By reason of his studious habits and his extraordinarily retentive memory, he quickly became the best storyteller among his companions. Even the slight training he gained from his studies greatly quickened his perceptions and broadened and steadied the strong reasoning faculty with which nature had endowed him. As the years of his youth passed by, his less gifted comrades learned to accept his judgments and to welcome his power to entertain and instruct them. On his own part, he gradually learned to write not merely with the hand, but also with the mind, to think. It was an easy transition for him from remembering the jingle of a commonplace rhyme to the constructing of a doggerel verse, and he did not neglect the opportunity of practicing his penmanship in such impromptus. Tradition also relates that he added to his list of stories and jokes humorous imitations from the sermons of eccentric preachers. But tradition has very likely both magnified and distorted these alleged exploits of his satire and mimicry. All that can be said of them is that his youth was marked by intellectual activity far beyond that of his companions. It is an interesting coincidence that nine days before the birth of Abraham Lincoln, Congress passed the act to organize the territory of Illinois, which his future life and career were destined to render so illustrious. Another interesting coincidence may be found in the fact that in the same year, 1818, in which Congress definitely fixed the number of stars and stripes in the national flag, Illinois was admitted as a state to the Union. The star of empire was moving westward at an accelerating speed. Alabama was admitted in 1819, Maine in 1820, Missouri in 1821. Little by little the line of frontier settlement was pushing itself toward the Mississippi. 
No sooner had the pioneer built him a cabin and opened his little farm than during every summer canvas-covered wagons wound their toilsome way over the new-made roads into the newer wilderness, while his eyes followed them with wistful eagerness. Thomas Lincoln and his Pigeon Creek relatives and neighbors could not forever withstand the contagion of this example, and at length they yielded to the irrepressible longing by a common impulse. Mr. Lincoln writes, March 1, 1830, Abraham having just completed his twenty-first year, his father and family, with the families of the two daughters and sons-in-law of his stepmother, left the old homestead in Indiana and came to Illinois. Their mode of conveyance was wagons drawn by ox teams, and Abraham drove one of the teams. They reached the county of Macon and stopped there some time within the same month of March. His father and family settled a new place on the north side of the Sangamon River, at the junction of the Timberland and Prairie, about ten miles westerly from Decatur. Here they built a log cabin, into which they removed, and made sufficient of rails to fence ten acres of ground, fenced and broke the ground, and raised a crop of sown corn upon it the same year. The sons-in-law were temporarily settled in other places in the county. In the autumn all hands were greatly afflicted with egg and fever to which they had not been used, and by which they were greatly discouraged, so much so that they determined on leaving the county. They remained, however, through the succeeding winter, which was the winter of the very celebrated Deep Snow of Illinois. End of chapter 1 Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois Two of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 2. Flatboat. New Salem. Election Clerk. Store and Mill, Kirkham's Grammar, Sangamo Journal, The Talisman, Lincoln's Address, March 9, 1832, Black Hawk War, Lincoln Elected Captain, Mustered Out, May 27, 1832, Re-enlisted in Independent Spy Battalion, Finally Mustered Out, June 16, 1832, Defeated for the Legislature, blacksmith or lawyer, the Lincoln Berry Store, appointed postmaster May 7, 1833, national politics. The life of Abraham Lincoln, or that part of it which will interest readers for all future time, properly begins in March 1831, after the winter of the deep snow. According to frontier custom, being then twenty-one years old, he left his father's cabin to make his own fortune in the world. A man named Denton Offutt, one of a class of local traders and speculators usually found about early western settlements, had probably heard something of young Lincoln's Indiana history, particularly that he had made a voyage on a flatboat from Indiana to New Orleans, and that he was strong, active, honest, and generally, as would be expressed in western phrase, a smart young fellow. He was therefore just the sort of man Offutt needed for one of his trading enterprises, and Mr. Lincoln himself relates somewhat in detail how Offutt engaged him and the beginning of the venture. Quote, Abraham, together with his stepmother's son, John D. Johnston, and John Hanks, yet residing in Macon County, hired themselves to Denton Offutt to make a flatboat from Beardstown, Illinois, on the Illinois River, to New Orleans, and for that purpose were to join him, Offutt, at Springfield, Illinois, so soon as the snow should go off. When it did go off, which was about the 1st of March, 1831, the county was so flooded as to make traveling by land impractical, to obviate which difficulty they purchased a large canoe, 
and came down the Sangamon River in it. This is the time and the manner of Abraham's first entrance into Sangamon County. They found Offutt at Springfield, but learned from him that he had failed in getting a boat at Beardstown. This led to their hiring themselves to him for twelve dollars per month each, and getting the timber out of the trees and building a boat at Old Sangamon Town on the Sangamon River, seven miles northwest of Springfield, which boat they took to New Orleans substantially upon the old contract. End of quote. It needs here to be recalled that Lincoln's father was a carpenter, and that Abraham had no doubt acquired considerable skill in the use of tools during his boyhood, and a practical knowledge of the construction of flatboats during his previous New Orleans trip, sufficient to enable him with confidence to undertake this task in shipbuilding. From the after-history of both Johnston and Hanks, we know that neither of them was gifted with skill or industry, and it becomes clear that Lincoln was from the first leader of the party, master of construction, and captain of the craft. It took some time to build the boat, and before it was finished, the Sangamon River had fallen, so that the new craft stuck midway across the dam at Rutledge's Mill at New Salem, a village of fifteen or twenty houses. The inhabitants came down to the bank, and exhibited great interest in the fate of the boat, which, with its bow in the air and its stern under water, was half bird and half fish, and they probably jestingly inquired of the young captain whether he expected to dive or to fly to New Orleans. He was, however, equal to the occasion. He bored a hole in the bottom of the boat at the bow, and rigged some sort of lever or derrick to lift the stern, so that the water she had taken in behind ran out in front, enabling her to float over the partly submerged dam, and this feat in turn caused great wonderment in the crowd at the novel expedient of bailing a boat by boring a hole in her bottom. This exploit of naval engineering fully established Lincoln's fame at New Salem, and grounded him so firmly in the esteem of his employer Offutt that the latter, already looking forward to his future usefulness, at once engaged him to come back to New Salem, after his New Orleans voyage, to act as his clerk in a store. Once over the dam and her cargo reloaded, partly there and partly at Beardstown, the boat safely made the remainder of her voyage to New Orleans, and, returning by steamer to St. Louis, Lincoln and Johnston, Hanks had turned back from St. Louis, continued on foot to Illinois. Johnston, remaining at the family home, which had meanwhile been removed from Macon to Coles County, and Lincoln going to his employer and friends at New Salem. This was in July or August, 1831. Neither Offutt nor his goods had yet arrived, and during his waiting he had a chance to show the New Salemites another accomplishment. An election was to be held, and one of the clerks was sick and failed to come. Scribes were not plenty on the frontier, and Mentor Graham, the clerk who was present, looking around for a properly qualified colleague, noticed Lincoln, and asked him if he could write, to which he answered in local idiom that he could make a few rabbit tracks, and was thereupon immediately inducted into his first office. He performed his duties not only to the general satisfaction, but so as to interest Graham, who was a schoolmaster, and afterward made himself very useful to Lincoln. Offutt finally arrived with a miscellaneous lot of goods, which Lincoln opened and put in order in a room that a former New Salem storekeeper was just ready to vacate, and whose remnant stock Offutt also purchased. Trade was evidently not brisk at New Salem, for the commercial zeal of Offutt led him to increase his venture by renting the Rutledge and Cameron Mill, on whose historic dam the flatboat had stuck. For a while the charge of the mill was added to Lincoln's duties, until another clerk was engaged to help him. There was likewise good evidence that in addition to his duties at the store and the mill, Lincoln made himself generally useful, that he cut down trees and split rails enough to make a large hog pen adjoining the mill, a proceeding quite natural when we remember that his hitherto active life and still-growing muscles 
imperatively demanded the exercise which measuring calico or weighing out sugar and coffee failed to supply. We know from other incidents that he was possessed of ample bodily strength. In frontier life it is not only needed for useful labor of many kinds, but is also called upon to aid in popular amusement. There was a settlement in the neighborhood of New Salem called Clary's Grove, where lived a group of restless, rollicking backwoodsmen with a strong liking for various forms of frontier athletics and rough practical jokes. In the progress of American settlement there has always been a time, whether the frontier was in New England or Pennsylvania or Kentucky, or on the banks of the Mississippi, when the champion wrestler held some fraction of the public consideration accorded to the victor in the Olympic Games of Greece. Until Lincoln came, Jack Armstrong was the champion wrestler of Clary's Grove and New Salem, and picturesque stories are told how the neighborhood talk, inflamed by Offutt's fulsome laudation of his clerk, made Jack Armstrong feel that his fame was in danger. Lincoln put off the encounter as long as he could, and when the wrestling match finally came off, neither could throw the other. The bystanders became satisfied that they were equally matched in strength and skill, and the cool courage which Lincoln manifested throughout the ordeal prevented the usual close of such incidents with a fight. Instead of becoming chronic enemies and leaders of a neighborhood feud, Lincoln's self-possession and good temper turned the contest into the beginning of a warm and lasting friendship. If Lincoln's muscles were at times hungry for work, no less so was his mind. He was already instinctively feeling his way to his destiny when, in conversation with Mentor Graham, the schoolmaster, he indicated his desire to use some of his spare moments to increase his education, and confided to him his notion to study English grammar. It was entirely in the nature of things that Graham should encourage this mental craving and tell him, quote, if you expect to go before the public in any capacity, I think it the best thing you can do. End of quote. Lincoln said that if he had a grammar, he would begin at once. Graham was obliged to confess that there was no such book at New Salem, but remembered that there was one at Vayner's, six miles away. Promptly after breakfast the next morning, Lincoln walked to Vayner's and procured the precious volume, and, probably with Graham's occasional help, found no great difficulty in mastering its contents. While tradition does not mention any other study begun at that time, we may fairly infer that, slight as may have been Graham's education, he must have had other books from which, together with his friendly advice, Lincoln's intellectual hunger derived further stimulus and nourishment. In his duties at the store and his work at the mill, in his study of Kirkham's grammar and educational conversations with Mentor Graham, in the somewhat rude but frank and hearty companionship of the citizens of New Salem and the exuberant boys of Clary's Grove, Lincoln's life, for the second half of the year 1831, appears not to have been eventful, but was doubtless more comfortable and as interesting as had been his flatboat building and New Orleans voyage during the first half. He was busy in useful labor, and, though he had few chances to pick up scraps of schooling, was beginning to read deeply in that book of human nature, the profound knowledge of which rendered him such immense service in after years. The restlessness and ambition of the village of New Salem was many times multiplied in the restlessness and ambition of Springfield, fifteen or twenty miles away, which, located approximately near the geographical center of Illinois, was already beginning to crave, if not yet to feel, its future destiny as the capital of the state. In November of the same year, that aspiring town produced the first number of its weekly newspaper, the Sangamo Journal, and in its columns we begin to find recorded historical data. Situated in a region of alternating spaces of prairie and forest, of attractive natural scenery and rich soil, it was nevertheless at a great disadvantage in the means of commercial transportation. Lying sixty miles from Beardstown, the nearest landing on the Illinois River, the peculiarities of soil, climate, and primitive roads rendered travel and land carriage extremely difficult. 
often entirely impossible, for nearly half of every year. The very first number of the Sangamo Journal sounded its strongest note on the then leading tenant of the Whig Party. Internal improvements by the general government and active politics to secure them. In later numbers we learn that a regular Eastern mail had not been received for three weeks. The tide of immigration, which was pouring into Illinois, is illustrated in a tabular statement on the commerce of the Illinois River, showing that the steamboat arrivals at Beardstown had risen from one each in the years 1828 and 1829, and only four in 1830, to thirty-two during the year 1831. This naturally directed the thoughts of travelers and traders to some better means of reaching the river landing than the frozen or muddy roads and impassable creeks and sloughs of winter and spring. The use of the Sangamon River, flowing within five miles of Springfield and emptying itself into the Illinois ten or fifteen miles from Beardstown, seemed for the present the only solution of the problem, and a public meeting was called to discuss the project. The deep snows of the winter of 1830 and 31 abundantly filled the channels of that stream, and the winter of 1831 and 32 substantially repeated its swelling floods. Newcomers in that region were therefore warranted in drawing the inference that it might remain navigable for small craft. Public interest on the topic was greatly heightened when one Captain Bogue, commanding a small steamer then at Cincinnati, printed a letter in the Journal of January 26, 1832, saying, quote, I intend to try to ascend the river Sangamo immediately on the breaking up of the ice. End of quote. It was well understood that the chief difficulty would be that the short turns in the channels were liable to be obstructed by a gorge of driftwood and the limbs and trunks of overhanging trees. To provide for this, Captain Bogue's letter added, quote, I should be met at the mouth of the river by ten or twelve men, having axes with long handles under the direction of some experienced man. I shall deliver freight from St. Louis at the landing on the Sangamo River opposite the town of Springfield for thirty-seven and a half cents per hundred pounds. End of quote. The journal of February 16 contained an advertisement that the splendid upper cabin steamer Talisman would leave for Springfield, and the paper of March 1 announced her arrival at St. Louis on the 22nd of February with a full cargo. In due time, the citizen committee appointed by the public meeting met the Talisman at the mouth of the Sangamon, and the journal of March 29th announced with great flourish that the steamboat talisman of one hundred and fifty tons burden arrived at the portland landing opposite this town on saturday last there was great local rejoicing over this demonstration that the sangamon was really navigable and the journal proclaimed with exultation that springfield could no longer be considered an inland town President Jackson's first term was nearing its close, and the Democratic Party was preparing to re-elect him. The Whigs, on their part, had held their first national convention in December 1831, and nominated Henry Clay to dispute the succession. This nomination, made almost a year in advance of the election, indicates an unusual degree of political activity in the East, and voters in the new state of Illinois were fired with an equal party zeal. During the months of January and February, 1832, no less than six citizens of Sangamon County announced themselves in the Sangamo Journal as candidates for the state legislature, the election for which was not to occur until August, and the Journal of March 15 printed a long letter addressed to the people of Sangamon County under date of the 9th, signed A. Lincoln, and beginning, quote, Fellow citizens, having become a candidate for the honorable office of one of your representatives in the next General Assembly of this state, in accordance with an established custom and the principles of true republicanism, it becomes my duty to make known to you, the people whom I propose to represent, my sentiments with regard to local affairs. End of quote. 
He then takes up and discusses in an eminently methodical and practical way the absorbing topic of the moment, the Whig doctrine of internal improvements and its local application, the improvement of the Sangamon River. He mentions that meetings have been held to propose the construction of a railroad, and frankly acknowledges that, quote, no other improvement that reason will justify us in hoping for can equal in utility the railroad, end of quote but contends that its enormous cost precludes any such hope that, therefore, quote, the improvement of the Sangamon River is an object much better suited to our infant resources, end of quote. Relating his experience in building and navigating his flatboat, and his observation of the stage of the water since then, he draws the very plausible conclusion that by straightening its channel and clearing away its driftwood, the stream can be made navigable, quote, to vessels of from twenty-five to thirty tons burden for at least one-half of all common years, and to vessels of much greater burden a part of the time." End of quote. His letter very modestly touches a few other points of needed legislation, a law against usury, laws to promote education, and amendments to estray and road laws. The main interest for us, however, is in the frank avowal of his personal ambition. Quote, Every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I can say, for one, that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. How far I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. I am young and unknown to many of you. I was born and have ever remained in the most humble walks of life. I have no wealthy or popular relations or friends to recommend me. My case is thrown exclusively upon the independent voters of the country, and if elected they will have conferred a favor upon me for which I shall be unremitting in my labors to compensate. But if the good people in their wisdom shall see fit to keep me in the background, I have been too familiar with disappointments to be very much chagrined." End of quote. This written and printed address gives us an accurate measure of the man and the time. When he wrote this document, he was twenty-three years old. He had been in the town and county only about nine months of actual time. As Sangamon County covered an estimated area of twenty-one hundred and sixty square miles, he could know but little of either it or its people. How dared a friendless, uneducated boy working on a flatboat at twelve dollars a month with no wealthy or popular friends to recommend him, aspire to the honors and responsibilities of a legislator. The only answer is that he was prompted by that intuition of genius, that consciousness of powers which justify their claims by their achievements. When we scan the circumstances more closely, we find distinct evidence of some reason for his confidence. Relatively speaking, he was neither uneducated nor friendless. His acquirements were already far beyond the simple elements of reading, writing, and ciphering. He wrote a good, clear, serviceable hand. He could talk well and reason cogently. The simple, manly style of his printed address fully equals in literary ability that of the average collegian in the twenties. His migration from Indiana to Illinois, and his two voyages to New Orleans, had given him a glimpse of the outside world. His natural logic readily grasped the significance of the railroad as a new factor in transportation, although the first American locomotive had been built only one year, and ten to fifteen years were yet to elapse before the first railroad train was to run in Illinois. One other motive probably had its influence. He tells us that Offutt's business was failing, and his quick judgment warned him that he would soon be out of a job as clerk. This, however, could be only a secondary reason for announcing himself as a candidate, for the election was not to occur till August, and even if he were elected there would be neither service nor salary till the coming winter. His venture into politics must therefore be ascribed to the feeling which he so frankly announced in his letter his ambition to become useful to his fellow men, the impulse that, throughout history, has singled out the great leaders of mankind. In this particular instance, 
a crisis was also at hand, calculated to develop and utilize the impulse. Just about a month after the publication of Lincoln's announcement, the Sangamo Journal of April 19 printed an official call from Governor Reynolds, directed to General Neal of the Illinois Militia, to organize 600 volunteers of his brigade for military service in a campaign against the Indians under Black Hawk, the war chief of the Sacs, who, in defiance of treaties and promises, had formed a combination with other tribes during the winter, and had now crossed back from the west to the east side of the Mississippi River, with the determination to reoccupy their old homes in the Rock River country toward the northern end of the state. In the memoranda which Mr. Lincoln furnished for a campaign biography, he thus relates what followed the call for troops. Quote, Abraham joined a volunteer company, and to his own surprise, was elected captain of it. He says he has not since had any success in life which gave him so much satisfaction. He went to the campaign, served near three months, met the ordinary hardships of such an expedition, but was in no battle. End of quote. Official documents furnish some further interesting details. As already said, the call was printed in the Sangamo Journal of April 19. On April 21, the company was organized at Richland, Sangamon County, and on April 28 was inspected and mustered into service at Beardstown and attached to Colonel Samuel Thompson's regiment, the 4th Illinois Mounted Volunteers. They marched at once to the hostile frontier. As the campaign shaped itself, it probably became evident to the company that they were not likely to meet any serious fighting, and, not having been enlisted for any stated period, they became clamorous to return home. The governor, therefore, had them and other companies mustered out of service at the mouth of Fox River on May 27. Not, however, wishing to weaken his forces before the arrival of new levies already on the way, he called for volunteers to remain twenty days longer. Lincoln had gone to the frontier to perform real service, not merely to enjoy military rank or reap military glory. On the same day, therefore, on which he was mustered out as captain, he re-enlisted and became Private Lincoln in Captain Iles's Company of Mounted Volunteers, organized apparently principally for scouting service, and sometimes called the Independent Spy Battalion. Among the other officers who imitated this patriotic example were General Whiteside and Major John T. Stewart, Lincoln's later law partner. The Independent Spy Battalion, having faithfully performed its new term of service, was finally mustered out on June 16, 1832. Lincoln and his messmate, George M. Harrison, had the misfortune to have their horses stolen the day before, but Harrison relates, quote, I laughed at our fate, and he joked at it, and we all started off merrily. The generous men of our company walked and rode by turns with us, and we fared about equal with the rest. But for this generosity our legs would have had to do the better work, for in that day this dreary route furnished no horses to buy or to steal, and, whether on horse or afoot, we always had company, for many of the horses' backs were too sore for riding. End of quote. Lincoln must have reached home about August 1, for the election was to occur in the second week of that month, and this left him but ten days in which to push his claims for popular endorsement. His friends, however, had been doing manful duty for him during his three months' absence, and he lost nothing in public estimation by his prompt enlistment to defend the frontier. Successive announcements in the journal had by this time swelled the list of candidates to thirteen. But Sangamon County was entitled to only four representatives, and when the returns came in, Lincoln was among those defeated. Nevertheless, he made a very respectable showing in the race. The list of successful and unsuccessful aspirants and their votes was as follows. E. D. Taylor, 1,127. John T. Stewart, 991. Achilles Morris, 945. Peter Cartwright, 815. Under the plurality rule, these four had been elected. 
The unsuccessful candidates were A. G. Herndon, 806, W. Carpenter, 774, J. Dawson, 717, A. Lincoln, 657, T. M. Neal, 571, R. Quinton, 485, Z. Peter, 214, E. Robinson, 169, Kirkpatrick, 44. The returns show that the total vote of the county was about 2,168. Comparing this with the vote cast for Lincoln, we see that he received nearly one-third of the total county vote, notwithstanding his absence from the canvas, notwithstanding the fact that his acquaintanceship was limited to the neighborhood of New Salem, notwithstanding the sharp competition. Indeed, his talent and fitness for active practical politics were demonstrated beyond question by the result in his home precinct of New Salem, which, though he ran as a Whig, gave 277 votes for him and only three against him. Three months later it gave 185 for the Jackson and only 70 for the Clay electors, proving Lincoln's personal popularity. He remembered for the remainder of his life with great pride that this was the only time he was ever beaten on a direct vote of the people. The result of the election brought him to one of the serious crises of his life, which he forcibly stated in after years in the following written words, quote, He was now without means and out of business, but was anxious to remain with his friends who had treated him with so much generosity especially as he had nothing elsewhere to go to. He studied what he should do, thought of learning the blacksmith trade, thought of trying to study law, rather thought he could not succeed at that without a better education. End of quote. The perplexing problem between inclination and means to follow it, the struggle between conscious talent and the restraining fetters of poverty, has come to millions of young Americans before and since, but perhaps to none with a sharper trial of spirit or more resolute patience. Before he had definitely resolved upon either career, chance served not to solve, but to postpone his difficulty, and in the end to greatly increase it. New Salem, which apparently never had any good reason for becoming a town, seems already at that time to have entered on the road to rapid decay. Offutt's speculations had failed, and he had disappeared. The brothers Herndon, who had opened a new store, found business dull and uncompromising. Becoming tired of their undertaking, they offered to sell out to Lincoln and Barry on credit, and took their promissory notes in payment. The new partners, in that excess of hope which usually attends all new ventures, also bought two other similar establishments that were in extremity and for these likewise gave their notes. It is evident that the confidence which Lincoln had inspired while he was a clerk in Offutt's store, and the enthusiastic support he had received as a candidate, were the basis of credit that sustained these several commercial transactions. It turned out in the long run that Lincoln's credit and the popular confidence that supported it were as valuable both to his creditors and himself as if the sums which stood over his signature had been gold coin in a solvent bank. But this transmutation was not attained until he had passed through a very furnace of financial embarrassment. Barry proved a worthless partner, and the business a sorry failure. Seeing this, Lincoln and Barry sold out again on credit, to the Trent brothers, who soon broke up and ran away. Barry also departed and died, and finally all the notes came back upon Lincoln for payment. He was unable to meet these obligations, but he did the next best thing. He remained, promised to pay when he could, and most of his creditors, maintaining their confidence in his integrity, patiently bided their time till, in the course of long years, he fully justified it by paying, with interest, every cent of what he learned to call, in humorous satire upon his own folly, the national debt. With one of them he was not so fortunate. Van Bergen, who bought one of the Lincolnberry notes, obtained judgment, and by peremptory sale, 
swept away the horse, saddle, and surveying instruments with the daily use of which Lincoln, quote, procured bread and kept body and soul together, unquote, to use his own words. But here again, Lincoln's recognized honesty was his safety. Out of personal friendship, James Short bought the property and restored it to the young surveyor, giving him time to repay. It was not until his return from Congress, seventeen years after the purchase of the store, that he finally relieved himself of the last installments of his national debt. But by these seventeen years of sober industry, rigid economy, and unflinching faith to his obligations, he earned the title of Honest Old Abe, which proved of greater service to himself and his country than if he had gained the wealth of Croesus. Out of this ill-starred commercial speculation, however, Lincoln derived one incidental benefit, and it may be said it became the determining factor in his career. It is evident from his own language that he underwent a severe mental struggle in deciding whether he would become a blacksmith or a lawyer. In taking a middle course, and trying to become a merchant, he probably kept the latter choice strongly in view. It seems well established by local tradition that during the period while the Lincoln Berry store was running its foredoomed course from bad to worse, Lincoln employed all the time he could spare from his customers, and he probably had many leisure hours, in reading and studying of various kinds. This habit was greatly stimulated and assisted by his being appointed, May 7, 1833, postmaster at New Salem, which office he continued to hold until May 30, 1836, when New Salem partially disappeared and the office was removed to Petersburg. The influences which brought about the selection of Lincoln were not recorded, but it is suggested that he had acted for some time as deputy postmaster under the former incumbent, and thus became the natural successor. Evidently, his politics formed no objection, as New Salem Precinct had at the August election, when he ran as a Whig, given him its almost solid vote for representative, notwithstanding the fact that it was more than two-thirds Democratic. The postmastership increased his public consideration and authority, broadened his business experience, and the newspapers he handled provided him an abundance of reading matter on topics of both local and national importance up to the latest dates. Those were stirring times, even on the frontier. The Sangamo Journal of December 30, 1832 printed Jackson's nullification proclamation. The same paper, of March 9, 1833, contained an editorial on Clay's Compromise, and that of the 16th had a notice of the great nullification debate in Congress. The speeches of Clay, Calhoun, and Webster were published in full during the following month, and Mr. Lincoln could not well help reading them and joining in the feelings and comments they provoked. While the town of New Salem was locally dying, the county of Sangamon and the state of Illinois were having what is now called a boom. Other wide-awake newspapers, such as the Missouri Republican and Louisville Journal, abounded in notices of the establishment of new stage lines and the general rush of immigration. But the joyous dream of the New Salemites, that the Sangamon River would become a commercial highway, quickly faded. The talisman was obliged to hurry back down the rapidly falling stream, tearing away a portion of the famous dam to permit her departure. There were rumors that another steamer, the Sylph, would establish regular trips between Springfield and Beardstown, but she never came. The freshets and floods of 1831 and 1832 were succeeded by a series of dry seasons, and the navigation of the Sangamon River was never afterward a telling plank in the county platform of either political party. End of chapter 2. Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer The Short Life of Abraham Lincoln 
by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 3 Appointed Deputy Surveyor Elected to Legislature in 1834 Campaign Issues Begins Study of Law Internal Improvement System The Lincoln Stone Protest Candidate for Speaker in 1838 and 1840 when Lincoln was appointed postmaster in May 1833, the Lincoln Berry store had not yet completely winked out, to use his own picturesque phrase. When at length he ceased to be a merchant, he yet remained a government official, a man of consideration and authority, who still had a responsible occupation and definite home, where he could read, write, and study. The proceeds of his office were doubtless very meager, but in that day, when the rate of postage on letters was still twenty-five cents, a little change now and then came into his hands, which, in the scarcity of money prevailing on the frontier, had an importance difficult for us to appreciate. His positions as candidate for the legislature and as postmaster probably had much to do in bringing him another piece of good fortune. In the rapid settlement of Illinois in Sangamon County, and the obtaining titles to farms by purchase or preemption, as well as in the locating and opening of new roads, the county surveyor had more work on his hands than he could perform throughout a county extending forty miles east and west and fifty north and south, and was compelled to appoint deputies to assist him. The name of the county surveyor was John Calhoun, recognized by all his contemporaries in Sangamon as a man of education and talent, and an aspiring democratic politician. It was not an easy matter for Calhoun to find properly qualified deputies, and when he became acquainted with Lincoln, and learned his attainments and aptitudes, and the estimation in which he was held by the people of New Salem, he wisely concluded to utilize his talents and standing, notwithstanding their difference in politics. The incident is thus recorded by Lincoln, quote, the surveyor of Sangamon offered to depute to Abraham that portion of his work which was within his part of the county. He accepted, procured a compass and chain, studied Flint and Gibson a little, and went at it. This procured bread, and kept soul and body together." Unquote. Tradition has it that Calhoun not only gave him the appointment, but lent him the book in which to study the art, which he accomplished in a period of six weeks, aided by the schoolmaster, Mentor Graham. The exact period of this increase in knowledge and business capacity is not recorded, but it must have taken place in the summer of 1833, as there exists a certificate of survey in Lincoln's handwriting, signed J. Calhoun, S.S.C., by A. Lincoln, dated January 14, 1834. Before June of that year, he had surveyed and located a public road from, quote, quote, Music's Ferry on Salt Creek, via New Salem, to the county line in the direction to Jacksonville, unquote, 26 miles and 70 chains in length, the exact course of which survey, with detailed bearings and distances, was drawn on common white-letter paper pasted in a long slip, to a scale of two inches to the mile, in ordinary yet clear and distinct penmanship. The compensation he received for this service was three dollars per day for five days, and two dollars and fifty cents for making the plat and report. An advertisement in the journal shows that the regular fees of another deputy were, quote, two dollars per day, or one dollar per lot of eight acres or less, and fifty cents for a single line, with ten cents per mile for traveling. While this class of work and his post office, with its emoluments, probably amply supplied his board, lodging, and clothing, it left him no surplus with which to pay his debts. For it was in the latter part of the same year, 1834, that Van Bergen caused his horse and surveying instruments to be sold under the hammer, as already related. Meanwhile, amid these fluctuations of good and bad luck, Lincoln maintained his equanimity, his steady, persevering industry, and his hopeful ambition and confidence in the future. Through all his misfortunes and his failures, he preserved his self-respect and his determination to succeed. Two years had nearly elapsed since he was defeated for the legislature, and, having received so flattering a vote on that occasion, it was entirely natural that he should determine to try a second chance. Four new representatives were to be chosen at the August election of 1834, and, near the end of April, Lincoln published his announcement that he would again be a candidate. 
he could certainly view his expectations in every way in a more hopeful light. His knowledge had increased, his experience broadened, his acquaintanceship greatly increased, his talents were acknowledged, his ability recognized. He was postmaster and deputy surveyor. He had become a public character whose services were in demand. As compared with the majority of his neighbors, he was a man of learning who had seen the world. Greater, however, than all these advantages, his sympathetic kindness of heart, his sincere, open frankness, his sturdy, unshrinking honesty, and that inborn sense of justice that yielded to no influence, made up a nobility of character and bearing that impressed the rude frontiersman as much as, if not more quickly and deeply than, it would have done the most polished and erudite society. Beginning his campaign in April, he had three full months before him for electioneering, and he evidently used the time to good advantage. The pursuit of popularity probably consisted mainly of the same methods that in backwoods districts prevail even to our day, personal visits and solicitations, attendance at various kinds of neighborhood gatherings, such as raisings of new cabins, horse races, shooting matches, sales of town lots, or of personal property under execution, or whatever occasion served to call a dozen or two of the settlers together. One recorded incident illustrates the practical nature of the politician's art at that day. Quote, he, Lincoln, came to my house, near Island Grove, during harvest. There were some thirty men in the field. He got his dinner and went out in the field where the men were at work. I gave him an introduction, and the boys said that they could not vote for a man unless he could make a hand. Well, boys, said he, if that is all, I am sure of your votes. He took hold of the cradle, and led the way all the round with perfect ease. The boys were satisfied, and I don't think he lost a vote in the crowd. Unquote. Sometimes two or more candidates would meet at such places, and short speeches be called for and given. Altogether, the campaign was livelier than that of two years before. Thirteen candidates were again contesting for the four seats in the legislature, to say nothing of candidates for governor, for Congress, and for the state Senate. The scope of discussion was enlarged and localized. From the published address of an industrious aspirant who received only 92 votes, we learn that the issues now were the construction by the general government of a canal from Lake Michigan to the Illinois River, the improvement of the Sangamon River, the location of the state capitol at Springfield, a United States bank, a better road law, and amendments to the Estray laws. When the election returns came in, Lincoln had reason to be satisfied with the efforts he had made. He received the second highest number of votes in the long list of candidates. Those cast for the representatives chosen stood Dawson, 1390, Lincoln, 1376, Carpenter, 1170, Stewart, 1164. The location of the state capitol had also been submitted to popular vote at this election. Springfield, being much nearer the geographical center of the state, was anxious to deprive Vandalia of that honor, and the activity of the Sangamon politicians proved it to be a dangerous rival. In the course of a month, the returns from all parts of the state had come in, and showed that Springfield was third in the race. It must be frankly admitted that Lincoln's success at this juncture was one of the most important events of his life. A second defeat might have discouraged his efforts to lift himself to a professional career, and sent him to the anvil to make horseshoes and to iron wagons for the balance of his days. But this handsome popular endorsement assured his standing and confirmed his credit. With this lift into the clouds of his horizon, he could resolutely carry his burden of debt and hopefully look to wider fields of public usefulness. Already, during the progress of the canvass, he had received cheering encouragement and promise of most valuable help. One of the four successful candidates was John T. Stewart, who had been major of volunteers in the Black Hawk War while Lincoln was captain, and who, together with Lincoln, had re-enlisted as a private in the Independent Spy Battalion. There is every likelihood that the two begun a personal friendship during their military service, which was, of course, strongly cemented by their being fellow candidates and both belonging to the Whig Party. Mr. Lincoln relates, quote, Major John T. Stewart, then in full practice of the law at Springfield, was also elected. 
During the canvass, in a private conversation, he encouraged Abraham to study law. After the election, he borrowed books of Stuart, took them home with him, and went at it in good earnest. He studied with nobody. In the autumn of 1836, he obtained a law license, and on April 15, 1837, removed to Springfield and commenced the practice, his old friend Stuart taking him into partnership. Unquote. From and after this election in 1834 as a representative, Lincoln was a permanent factor in the politics and the progress of Sangamon County. At a Springfield meeting in the following November, to promote common schools, he was appointed one of eleven delegates to attend a convention at Vandalia, called to deliberate on that subject. He was re-elected to the legislature in 1836, in 1838, and in 1840, and thus, for a period of eight years, took a full share in shaping and enacting the public and private laws of Illinois, which in our day has become one of the leading states in the Mississippi Valley. Of Lincoln's share in that legislation, it need only be said that it was as intelligent and beneficial to the public interest as that of the best of his colleagues. The most serious error committed by the legislature of Illinois during that period was that it enacted law setting on foot an extensive system of internal improvements, in the form of railroads and canals, altogether beyond the actual needs of transportation for the then existing population of the state, and the consequent reckless creation of a state debt for money borrowed at extravagant interest in liberal commissions. The state underwent a season of speculative intoxication, in which, by the promised and expected rush of immigration, and the swelling currents of its business, its farms were suddenly to become villages, its villages spreading towns, and its towns transformed into great cities, while all its people were to be made rich by the increased value of their land and property. Both parties entered with equal recklessness into this ill-advised internal improvement system, which, in the course of about four years, brought the state to bankruptcy, with no substantial works to show for the foolishly expended millions. In voting for these measures, Mr. Lincoln represented the public opinion and wish of his county and the whole state, and while he was as blamable, he was at the same time no more so than the wisest of his colleagues. It must be remembered in extenuation that he was just beginning his parliamentary education. From the very first, however, he seems to have become a force in the legislature, and to have rendered special service to his constituents. It is conceded that the one object which Springfield and most of Sangamon County had at heart was the removal of the capital from Vandalia to that place. This was accomplished in 1836, and the management of the measure appears to have been entrusted mainly to Mr. Lincoln. One incident of his legislative career stands out in such prominent relation to the great events of his afterlife that it deserves special explanation and emphasis. Even at that early date, a quarter of a century before the outbreak of the Civil War, the slavery question was now and then obtruding itself as an irritating and perplexing element into the local legislation of almost every new state. Illinois, though guaranteed its freedom by the Ordinance of 1787, nevertheless underwent a severe political struggle, in which, about four years after her admission into the Union, politicians and settlers from the South made a determined effort to change her to a slave state. The legislature of 1822-1823, with the two-thirds pro-slavery majority of the state Senate, and a technical, but legally questionable, two-thirds majority in the House, submitted to popular vote an act calling a state convention to change the Constitution. It happened, fortunately, that Governor Coles, though a Virginian, was strongly anti-slavery, and gave the weight of his official influence and his whole four-year salary to counteract the dangerous scheme. From the fact that Southern Illinois, up to that time, was mostly peopled from the slave states, the result was seriously in doubt through an active and exciting campaign, and the convention was finally defeated by a majority of 1,800, and a total vote of 11,612. While this result effectually decided that Illinois would remain a free state, the propagandism and reorganization left a deep and tenacious undercurrent of pro-slavery opinion that, for many years, 
manifested itself in vehement and intolerant outcries against abolitionism, which on one occasion caused the murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy for persisting in his right to print an anti-slavery newspaper at Alton. Nearly a year before this tragedy, the Illinois legislature had under consideration certain resolutions from the eastern states on the subject of slavery, and the committee to which they had been referred reported a set of resolves highly disapproving abolition societies, holding that the right of property in slaves is secured to the slaveholding states by the federal constitution, together with other phraseology calculated on the whole to soothe and comfort pro-slavery sentiment. After much irritating discussion, the committee's resolutions were finally passed, with but Lincoln and five others voting in the negative. No record remains whether or not Lincoln joined in the debate, but, to leave no doubt upon his exact position and feeling, he and his colleague, Dan Stone, caused the following protest to be formally entered on the journals of the House. Quote, Resolutions upon the subject of domestic slavery, having passed both branches of the General Assembly at its present session, the undersigned hereby protest against the passage of the same. They believe that the institution of slavery is founded on both injustice and bad policy, but that the promulgation of abolition doctrines tends rather to increase than abate its evils. They believe that the Congress of the United States has no power under the Constitution to interfere with the institution of slavery in the different states. They believe that the Congress of the United States has the power, under the Constitution, to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, but that the power ought not to be exercised unless at the request of the people of the district. The difference between these opinions and those contained in the said resolutions is their reasons for entering this protest. Unquote. In view of the great scope and quality of Lincoln's public service in afterlife, it would be a waste of time to trace out in detail his words or his votes upon the multitude of questions on which he acted during this legislative career of eight years. It needs only to be remembered that it formed a varied and thorough school of parliamentary practice and experience that laid the broad foundation of that extraordinary skill and sagacity in statesmanship which he afterward displayed in party controversy and executive direction. The quick proficiency and ready aptitude for leadership evidenced by him in this, as it may be called, his preliminary parliamentary school are strikingly proved by the fact that the Whig members of the Illinois House of Representatives gave him their full party vote for Speaker, both in 1838 and 1840. But, being in a minority, they could not, of course, elect him. End of Chapter 3 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 4. Law Practice. Rules for a Lawyer. Law and Politics. Twin Occupations, The Springfield Coterie, Friendly Help, Anne Rutledge, Mary Owens. Lincoln's removal from New Salem to Springfield and his entrance into a law partnership with Major John T. Stewart begin a distinctively new period in his career. From this point, we need not trace in detail his progress in his new and this time deliberately chosen vocation. The lawyer who works his way up in professional merit, from a five-dollar fee in a suit before a justice of the peace, to a five-thousand-dollar fee before the Supreme Court of his state, has a long and difficult path to climb. Mr. Lincoln climbed this path for twenty-five years, with industry, perseverance, patience. Above all, with that sense of moral responsibility that always clearly traced the dividing line between his duty to his client and his duty to society and truth. 
his unqualified frankness of statement assured him the confidence of judge and jury in every argument. His habit of fully admitting the weak points in his case gained their close attention to its strong ones, and, when clients brought him bad cases, his uniform advice was not to begin the suit. Among his miscellaneous writings, there exist some fragments of autograph notes, evidently intended for a little lecture or talk to law students, which set forth with brevity and force his opinion of what a lawyer ought to be and do. He earnestly commands diligence in study, and, next to diligence, promptness in keeping up his work. As a general rule, never take your whole fee in advance, he says, nor any more than a small retainer. When fully paid beforehand, you are more than a common mortal if you can feel the same interest in the case as if something was still in prospect for you as well as for your client. Extemporaneous speaking should be practiced and cultivated. It is the lawyer's avenue to the public. However able and faithful he may be in other respects, people are slow to bring him business if he cannot make a speech. And yet, there is not a more fatal error to young lawyers than relying too much on speech-making. If anyone, upon his rare powers of speaking, shall claim an exemption from the drudgery of the law, his case is a failure in advance. Discourage litigation. Persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them how the nominal winner is often a real loser, in fees, expenses, and waste of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. There will still be business enough. Never stir up litigation. A worse man can scarcely be found than one who does this. Who can be more nearly a fiend than he who habitually overhauls the register of deeds in search of defects and titles, whereon to stir up strife and put money in his pocket? A moral tone ought to be infused into the profession, which should drive such men out of it. There is a vague popular belief that lawyers are necessarily dishonest. I say vague because when we consider to what extent confidence and honors are opposed in and conferred upon lawyers by the people, it appears improbable that their impression of dishonesty is very distinct and vivid. Yet the impression is common, almost universal. Let no young man choosing the law for a calling for a moment yield to the popular belief. Resolve to be honest at all events. And if, in your own judgment, you cannot be an honest lawyer, resolve to be honest without being a lawyer. Choose some other occupation, rather than one in the choosing of which you do, in advance, consent to be a knave. While Lincoln thus became a lawyer, he did not cease to remain a politician. In the early West, law and politics were parallel roads to usefulness, as well as distinction. Newspapers had not then reached any considerable circulation. There existed neither fast presses to print them, mail routes to carry them, nor subscribers to read them. Since even the laws had to be newly framed for these new communities, the lawyer became the inevitable political instructor and guide as far as ability and fame extended. His reputation as a lawyer was a twin of his influence as an orator, whether through logic or eloquence. Local conditions fostered, almost necessitated, this double pursuit. Westward immigration was in its full tide, and population was pouring into the great state of Illinois with ever-accelerating rapidity. Settlements were spreading, roads were being opened, towns laid out, the larger counties divided and new ones organized, and the enthusiastic visions of coming prosperity threw the state into that fever of speculation which culminated in wholesale internal improvements on borrowed capital and brought collapse, stagnation, and bankruptcy in its inevitable train. As already said, these swift changes required a plentiful supply of new laws, to frame which lawyers were in a large proportion sent to the legislature every two years. These same lawyers also filled the bar and recruited the bench of the new state, and, as they followed the itinerant circuit courts from county to county in their various sections, were called upon in these summer wanderings to explain in public speeches their legislative work of the winter. By a natural connection, this also involved a discussion of national and party issues. 
it was also during this period that party activity was stimulated by the general adoption of the new system of party caucuses and party conventions to which President Jackson had given the impulse. In the American system of representative government, elections not only occur with the regularity of clockwork, but pervade the whole organism in every degree of its structure from top to bottom, federal, state, county, township, and school district. In Illinois, even the state judiciary has, at different times, been chosen by popular ballot. The function of the politician, therefore, is one of continuous watchfulness and activity, and he must have intimate knowledge of details if he would work out grand results. Activity in politics also produces eager competition and sharp rivalry. In 1839, the seat of government was definitely transferred from Vandalia to Springfield, and there soon gathered at the new state capital a group of young men whose varied ability and future success in public service has rarely been excelled. Douglas, Shields, Calhoun, Stewart, Logan, Baker, Treat, Hardin, Trumbull, McClernand, Browning, McDougall, and others. His new surroundings greatly stimulated and reinforced Mr. Lincoln's growing experience and spreading acquaintance, giving him a larger share and wider influence in local and state politics. He became a valued and sagacious advisor in party caucuses, and a power in party conventions. Gradually, also, his gifts as an attractive and persuasive campaign speaker were making themselves felt and appreciated. His removal, in April 1837, from a village of twenty houses to a city of about two thousand inhabitants, placed him in striking new relations and necessities as to dress, manners, and society, as well as politics. Yet here again, as in the case of his removal from his father's cabin to New Salem six years before, peculiar conditions rendered the transition less abrupt than would at first appear. Springfield, notwithstanding its greater population and prospective dignity as the capital, was in many respects no great improvement on New Salem. It had no public buildings, its streets and sidewalks were unpaved, its stores, in spite of all their flourish of advertisements, were staggering under the hard times of 1837 to 1839, and stagnation of business imposed a rigid economy on all classes. If we may credit tradition, this was one of the most serious crises of Lincoln's life. His intimate friend, William Butler, related to the writer that, having attended a session of the legislature at Vandalia, he and Lincoln returned together at its close to Springfield, by the usual mode of horseback travel. At one of their stopping places overnight, Lincoln, in one of his gloomy moods, told Butler the story of the almost hopeless prospects which lay immediately before him. That the session was over, his salary all drawn, and his money all spent, that he had no resources and no work, that he did not know where to turn to earn even a week's board. Butler bade him be of good cheer, and, without any formal proposition or agreement, took him and his belongings to his own house, and domesticated him there as a permanent guest, with Lincoln's tacit compliance rather than any definite consent. Later, Lincoln shared a room in genial companionship, which ripened into closest intimacy, in the store of his friend Joshua F. Speed, all without charge or expense, and these brotherly offerings helped the young lawyer over present necessities which might otherwise have driven him to muscular handiwork at weekly or monthly wages. From this time onward, in daily conversation, in argument at the bar, in political consultation and discussion, Lincoln's life gradually broadened into contact with the leading professional minds of the growing state of Illinois. The man who could not pay a week's board bill was twice more elected to the legislature, was invited to public banquets and toasted by name, became a popular speaker, moved in the best society of the new capital, and made what was considered a brilliant marriage. Lincoln's stature and strength his intelligence and ambition, in short, all the elements which gave him popularity among men in New Salem, rendered him equally attractive to the fair sex of that village. On the other hand, his youth, his frank sincerity, his longing for sympathy and encouragement, made him peculiarly sensitive to the society and influence of women. 
Soon after coming to New Salem, he chanced much in the society of Miss Anne Rutledge, a slender, blue-eyed blonde, nineteen years old, moderately educated, beautiful according to local standards, and altogether lovely, tender-hearted, universally admired, and generally fascinating girl. From the personal descriptions of her which tradition has preserved, the inference is naturally drawn that her temperament and disposition were very much akin to those of Mr. Lincoln himself. It is little wonder, therefore, that he fell in love with her. But two years before, she had become engaged to a Mr. McNamara, who had gone to the East to settle certain family affairs, and whose absence became so unaccountably prolonged that Anne finally despaired of his return, and in time betrothed herself to Lincoln. A year or so after this event, Anne Rutledge was taken sick and died, the neighbors said of a broken heart, but the doctor called it brain fever, and his science was more likely to be correct than their psychology. Whatever may have been the truth upon this point, the incident threw Lincoln into profound grief, and a period of melancholy so absorbing as to cause his friends apprehension for his own health. Gradually, however, their studied and devoted companionship won him back to cheerfulness, and his second affair of the heart assumed altogether different characteristics, most of which may be gathered from his own letters. Two years before the death of Anne Rutledge, Mr. Lincoln had seen and made the acquaintance of Miss Mary Owens, who had come to visit her sister, Mrs. Abel, and had passed about four weeks in New Salem, after which she returned to Kentucky. Three years later, and perhaps a year after Miss Rutledge's death, Mrs. Abel, before starting for Kentucky, told Mr. Lincoln, probably more in jest than in earnest, that she would bring her sister back with her on condition that he would become her, Mrs. Abel's, brother-in-law. Lincoln, also probably more in jest than earnest, promptly agreed to the proposition, for he remembered Mary Owens as a tall, handsome, dark-haired girl with fair skin and large blue eyes, who in conversation could be intellectual and serious, as well as jovial and witty, who had a liberal education, and was considered wealthy, one of those well-poised, steady characters who look upon matrimony and life with practical views and social matronly instincts. The bantering offer was made and accepted in the autumn of 1836, and in the following April Mr. Lincoln removed to Springfield. Before this occurred, however, he was surprised to learn that Mary Owens had actually returned with her sister from Kentucky, and felt that the romantic jest had become a serious and practical question. Their first interview dissipated some of the illusions in which each had been indulged. The three years elapsed since they first met had greatly changed her personal appearance. She had become stout. Her twenty-eight years, one year more than his, had somewhat hardened the lines of her face. Both in figure and feature, she presented a disappointing contrast to the slim and not yet totally forgotten Anne Rutledge. On her part, it was more than likely that she did not find in him all the attractions her sister had pictured. The speech and manners of the Illinois frontier lacked much of the chivalric attentions and flattering compliments to which the Kentucky beaux were addicted. He was yet a diamond in the rough and she would not immediately decide till she could better understand his character and prospects, so no formal engagement resulted. In December, Lincoln went to his legislative duties at Vandalia, and in the following April took up his permanent abode in Springfield. Such a separation was not favorable to rapid courtship, yet they had occasional interviews and exchanged occasional letters. None of hers to him have been preserved, and only three of his to her. From these it appears that they sometimes discussed their affair in a cold, hypothetical way, even down to problems of housekeeping, in the light of mere worldly prudence, much as if they were guardians arranging a mariage de convenance, rather than impulsive and ardent lovers wandering in Arcady. Without Mrs. Owen's letters, it is impossible to know what she may have said to him, but in May 1837, Lincoln wrote to her, quote, I am often thinking of what we said about your coming to live at Springfield. I am afraid you would not be satisfied. There is a great deal of flourishing about in carriages here, which it would be your doom to see without sharing it. You would have to be poor, without the means of hiding your poverty. 
do you believe you could bear that patiently? Whatever woman may cast her lot with mine, should any ever do so, it is my intention to do all in my power to make her happy and contented, and there is nothing I can imagine that would make me more unhappy than to fail in the effort. I know I should be much happier with you than the way I am, provided I saw no signs of discontent in you. What you have said to me may have been in the way of jest, or I may have misunderstood it. If so, then let it be forgotten. If otherwise, I much wish you would think seriously before you decide. What I have said I will most positively abide by, provided you wish it. My opinion is that you had better not do it. You have not been accustomed to hardship, and it may be more severe than you now imagine. I know you are capable of thinking correctly on any subject, and if you deliberate maturely upon this before you decide, then I am willing to abide your decision. Unquote. Whether, after receiving this, she wrote him the good long letter he asked for in the same epistle is not known. Apparently they did not meet again until August, and the interview must have been marked by reserve and coolness on both sides, which left each more uncertain than before, for on the same day Lincoln again wrote her, and, after saying that she might perhaps be mistaken in regard to his real feelings towards her, continued thus, quote, I want in all cases to do right, and most particularly so in all cases with women. I want at this particular time, more than anything else, to do right with you. And if I knew it would be doing right, as I rather suspect it would, to let you alone, I would do it. And for the purpose of making the matter as plain as possible, I now say that you can now drop the subject, dismiss your thoughts, if you ever had any, from me forever, and leave this letter unanswered without calling forth one accusing murmur from me. And I will even go further, and say that if it will add anything to your comfort or peace of mind to do so, it is my sincere wish that you should. Do not understand by this that I wish to cut your acquaintance. I mean no such thing. What I do wish is that our further acquaintance shall depend upon yourself. If such further acquaintance would contribute nothing to your happiness, I am sure it would not to mine. If you feel yourself in any degree bound to me, I am now willing to release you, provided you wish it. While, on the other hand, I am willing, and even anxious, to bind you faster, if I can be convinced that it will, in any considerable degree, add to your happiness. This, indeed, is the whole question with me. Unquote. All that we know of the sequel is contained in a letter which Lincoln wrote to his friend Mrs. Browning nearly a year later after Miss Owens had finally returned to Kentucky, in which, without mentioning the lady's name, he gave a serio-comic description of what might be called a courtship to escape matrimony. He dwells on his disappointment at her changed appearance, and continues, quote, But what could I do? I had told her sister that I would take her for better or for worse, and I made a point of honor and conscience in all things to stick to my word, especially if others had been induced to act on it which in this case I had no doubt they had, for I was now fairly convinced that no other man on earth would have her, and hence the conclusion that they were bent on holding me to my bargain. Well, thought I, I have said it, and, be the consequences what they may, it shall not be my fault if I fail to do it. Although I was fixed, firm as the surge-repelling rock in my resolution, I found I was continually repenting the rashness which had led me to make it. Through life I have been in no bondage, either real or imaginary, from the thraldom of which I so much desired to be free. After I had delayed the matter as long as I thought I could in honor do, which, by the way, had brought me round into last fall, I concluded I might as well bring it to a consummation without further delay, and so I mustered my resolution and made the proposal to her direct. But, shocking to relate, she answered, no. At first I suppose she did it through an affectation of modesty, which I thought but ill became her under the peculiar circumstances of her case. But on my renewal of the charge, I found she repelled it with greater firmness than before. I tried it again and again, but with the same success, or rather with the same want of success. I finally was forced to give it up, at which I very unexpectedly found myself mortified almost beyond endurance. I was mortified, it seemed to me, in a hundred different ways. 
my vanity was deeply wounded by the reflection that I had so long been too stupid to discover her intentions, and at the same time never doubting that I understood them perfectly, and also that she, whom I had taught myself to believe nobody else would have, had actually rejected me with all my fancied greatness. And to cap the whole, I then, for the first time, began to suspect that I was really a little in love with her." Unquote. The serious side of this letter is undoubtedly genuine and candid, while the somewhat over-exaggeration of the comic side points as clearly that he had not fully recovered from the mental suffering he had undergone in the long conflict between doubt and duty. From the beginning, the matchmaking zeal of the sister had placed the parties in a false position, produced embarrassment, and created distrust. A different beginning might have resulted in a very different outcome, for Lincoln, while objecting to her corpulency, acknowledges that in both feature and intellect she was as attractive as any woman he had ever met, and Miss Owens's letters, written after his death, state that her principal objection lay in the fact that his training had been different from hers, and that Mr. Lincoln was deficient in those little links which make up the chain of a woman's happiness. She adds, The last message I ever received from him was about a year after we parted in Illinois. Mrs. Abel visited Kentucky, and he said to her in Springfield, Tell your sister that I think she was a great fool because she did not stay here and marry me. She was even then not quite clear in her own mind, but that his words were true. End of chapter 4《Of a Short Life of Abraham Lincoln》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Powell A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter 5 Springfield Society Miss Mary Todd Lincoln's Engagement his deep despondency. Visit to Kentucky. Letters to Speed. The Shields Duel. Marriage. Law Partnership with Logan. Hardin, nominated for Congress, 1843. Baker, nominated for Congress, 1844. Lincoln, nominated and elected, 1846. The deep impression which the Mary Owens affair made upon Lincoln is further shown by one of the concluding phrases of his letter to Mrs. Browning. I have now come to the conclusion never again to think of marrying. But it was not long before a reaction set in from this pessimistic mood. The actual transfer of the seat of government from Vandalia to Springfield in 1839 gave the new capital fresh animation. Business revived, public improvements were begun. Politics ran high. Already there was a spirit in the air that in the following year culminated in the extraordinary enthusiasm and fervor of the Harrison presidential campaign of 1840, that rollicking and uproarious party carnival of humor and satire, of song and jollification, of hard cider and log cabins. While the state of Illinois was strongly democratic, Sangamon County was as distinctly Whig, and the local party disputes were hot and aggressive. The Whig delegation of Sangamon in the legislature, popularly called the Long Nine because the sum of the stature of its members was 54 feet, became noted for its influence in legislation in a body where the majority was against them. And of these, Mr. Lincoln was the tallest, both in person and ability, as was recognized by his twice receiving the minority vote for a Speaker of the House. Society also began organizing itself upon metropolitan rather than provincial assumptions. As yet, however, society was liberal. Men of either wealth or position were still too few to fill its ranks. Energy, ambition, talent were necessarily the standard of admission, and Lincoln, though poor as a church mouse, was as welcome as those who could wear ruffled shirts and carry gold watches. The meetings of the legislature at Springfield then first brought together that splendid group of young men of genius whose phenomenal careers and distinguished services have given Illinois fame in the history of the nation. It is a marked peculiarity of the American character that the bitterest foes in party warfare 
generally meet each other on terms of perfect social courtesy in the drawing rooms of society. And future presidential candidates, cabinet members, senators, congressmen, jurists, orators, and battle heroes lent the little social reunions of Springfield a zest and exultation never found, perhaps impossible, amid the heavy, oppressive surroundings of conventional ceremony, gorgeous upholstery, and magnificent decorations. It was at this period also that Lincoln began to feel and exercise his expanding influence and powers as a writer and speaker. Already, two years earlier, he had written and delivered the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield an address upon the perpetuation of our political institutions, strongly enforcing the doctrine of rigid obedience to law. In December 1839, Douglas, in a heated conversation, challenged the young Whigs to present a political discussion. The challenge was immediately taken up, and the public of Springfield listened with eager interest to several nights of sharp debate between Whig and Democratic champions, in which Lincoln bore a prominent and successful share. In the following summer, Lincoln's name was placed upon the Harrison electoral ticket for Illinois, and he lent all his zeal and eloquence to swell the general popular enthusiasm for Tippecanoe and Tyler II. In the midst of this political and social awakening of the new capital, and the quickened interest and high hopes of leading citizens gathered there from all parts of the state, there came into the Springfield circles Miss Mary Todd of Kentucky, 21 years old, handsome, accomplished, vivacious, witty, a dashing and fascinating figure in dress and conversation, gracious and imperious by turns. She easily singled out and secured the admiration of such of the Springfield beau as most pleased her somewhat capricious fancy. She was a sister of Mrs. Ninian W. Edwards, whose husband was one of the Long Nine. This circumstance made Lincoln a frequent visitor at the Edwards house, and being thus much thrown in her company, he found himself, almost before he knew it, entangled in a new love affair, and in the course of a twelve-month engaged to marry her. Much to the surprise of Springfield society, however, the courtship took a sudden turn. Whether it was caprice or jealousy, a new attachment, a mature reflection will always remain a mystery. Every such case is a law unto itself, and neither science nor poetry is ever able to analyze and explain its causes and effects. The conflicting stories then current, and the varying traditions that yet exist, either fail to agree or to fit the sparse facts which came to light. There remains no dispute, however, that the occurrence, whatever shape it took, threw Mr. Lincoln into a deeper despondency than any he had yet experienced, for on January 23, 1841, he wrote to his law partner, John D. Stewart. For not giving you a general summary of news, you must pardon me. It is not in my power to do so. I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better. Apparently his engagement to Miss Todd was broken off, but whether that was the result or the cause of his period of gloom seems still a matter of conjecture. His mind was so perturbed that he felt unable to attend the sessions of the legislature of which he was a member, and, after its close, his intimate friend Joshua F. Speed carried him off for a visit to Kentucky. The change of scene and surroundings proved a great benefit. He returned home about midsummer very much improved but not yet completely restored to a natural mental equipoise. While on their visit to Kentucky, Speed had likewise fallen in love, and in the following winter had become afflicted with doubts and perplexities akin to those from which Lincoln had suffered. It now became his turn to give sympathy and counsel to his friend, and he did this with a warmth and delicacy born of his own spiritual trials, not yet overmastered. He wrote letter after letter to Speed to convince him that his doubts about not truly loving the woman of his choice were all nonsense. Why, Speed, if you did not love her, although you might not wish her death, you would most certainly be resigned to it. Perhaps this point is no longer a question with you, and my pertinacious dwelling upon it is a rude intrusion upon your feelings. If so, you must pardon me. You know the hell I have suffered on that point, and how tender I am upon it. I am now fully convinced that you love her as ardently as you are capable of loving. It is the peculiar misfortune of both you and me to dream dreams of Elysium far exceeding all that anything earthly can realize. 
When Lincoln heard that Speed was finally married, he wrote him, It cannot be told how it now thrills me with joy to hear you say that you are far happier than you ever expected to be. That much I know is enough. I know you too well to suppose your expectations were not, at least, sometimes extravagant. And if reality exceeds them all, I say, Enough, dear Lord. I am not going beyond the truth when I tell you that the short space it took me to read your last letter gave me more pleasure than the total sum of all I have enjoyed since the fatal 1st of January, 1841. Since then, it seems to me I should have been entirely happy, but for the never-absent idea that there is still one unhappy whom I have contributed to make so. That still kills my soul. I cannot but reproach myself for even wishing to be happy while she is otherwise. It is quite possible that a series of incidents that occurred during the summer in which the above was written had something to do with bringing such a frame of mind to a happier conclusion. James Shields, afterward a general in two wars and a senator from two states, was at that time auditor of Illinois, with his office at Springfield. Shields was an Irishman by birth and, for an active politician of the Democratic Party, had the misfortune to be both sensitive and irascible in party warfare. Shields, together with the Democratic governor and treasurer, issued a circular order forbidding the payment of taxes in the depreciated paper of the Illinois state banks, and the Whigs were endeavoring to make capital by charging that the order was issued for the purpose of bringing enough silver into the treasury to pay the salaries of these officials. Using this as a basis of argument, a couple of clever Springfield Society girls wrote and printed in the Sangamo Journal a series of humorous letters in the country dialect purporting to come from the lost townships and signed by Aunt Rebecca, who called herself a farmer's widow. It is hardly necessary to say that Mary Todd was one of the culprits. The young ladies originated the scheme more to poke fun at the personal weaknesses of Shields than for the sake of party effect, and they embellished their simulated plaint about taxes with an embroidery of fictitious social happenings and personal allusions to the auditor that put the town on a grin and Shields into fury. The fair and mischievous writers found it necessary to consult Lincoln about how they should frame the political features of their attack, and he set them a pattern by writing the first letter of the series himself. Shields sent a friend to the editor of the journal and demanded the name of the real Rebecca. The editor, as in duty bound, asked Lincoln what he should do, and was instructed to give Lincoln's name and not to mention the ladies. Then followed a letter from Shields to Lincoln demanding retraction and apology. Lincoln's replied that he declined to answer under menace and a challenge from Shields. Thereupon, Lincoln instructed his friend as follows. If former offensive correspondence were withdrawn and a polite and gentlemanly inquiry made, he was willing to explain that. I did write the Lost Townships letter, which appeared in the journal of the second instant, but had no participation in any form in any other article alluding to you. I wrote that wholly for political effect. I had no intention of injuring your personal or private character or standing as a man or a gentleman. And I did not then think, and do not now think, that that article could produce or has produced that effect against you. And had I anticipated such an effect, I would have forborne to write it. And I will add that your conduct toward me, so far as I know, had always been gentlemanly, and that I had no personal pique against you and no cause for any. If nothing like this is done, the preliminaries of the fight are to be, first, weapons, cavalry broadswords of the largest size, precisely equal in all respects, and such as now used by the cavalry company at Jacksonville. Second, position, a plank 10 feet long and from nine to 12 inches broad to be firmly fixed on edge on the ground as the line between us, which neither is to pass his foot over upon forfeit of his life. Next, a line drawn on the ground on either set of said plank and parallel with it, each at the distance of the whole length of the sword and three feet additional from the plank, and the passing of his own such line by either party during the fight shall be deemed a surrender of the contest. The two seconds met and with great unction pledged our honor to each other that we would endeavor to settle the matter amicably, but persistently higgled over points till publicity and arrest seemed imminent. Procuring the necessary broadswords, all parties then hurried away to an island in the Mississippi River opposite Alton where, long before the planks were set on edge or the swords drawn, mutual friends took the case out of the hands of the seconds and declared an adjustment. The terms of the fight as written by Mr. Lincoln show plainly enough that in his judgment it was to be treated as a farce and would never proceed beyond preliminaries. 
There, of course, ensued the very bellicose after discussion in the newspapers, with additional challenges between the seconds about the proper etiquette of such farces, all resulting only in the shedding of much ink and furnishing Springfield with topics of lively conversation for a month. These occurrences, naturally enough, again drew Mr. Lincoln and Miss Todd together in friendly interviews, and Lincoln's letter to Speed detailing the news of the duels contains this significant paragraph. But I began this letter not for what I have been writing, but to say something on that subject, which you know to be of such infinite solicitude to me. The immense sufferings you endured from the 1st of September till the middle of February you never tried to conceal from me, and I well understood. You have now been the husband of a lovely woman nearly eight months, that you are happier now than the day you married her I well know, for without you could not be living. But I have your word for it too, and the returning elasticity of spirits which is manifested in your letters. But I wanted to ask a close question. Are you now in feeling as well as judgment glad that you are married as you are? From anybody but me this would be an impudent question not to be tolerated, but I know you will pardon it in me. Please answer it quickly, as I am patient to know. The answer was evidently satisfactory, for on November 4, 1842, the Reverend Charles Dresser united Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd in the holy bonds of matrimony. His marriage to Miss Todd ended all those mental perplexities and periods of despondency from which he had suffered more or less during his several love affairs, extending over nearly a decade. Out of the keen anguish he had endured, he finally gained that perfect mastery over his own spirit which Scripture declares to denote a greatness superior to that of him who takes a city. Few men have ever attained that complete domination of the will over the emotions, of reason over passion, by which he was able in the years to come to meet and solve the tremendous questions destiny had in store for him. His wedding, once over, he took up with resolute patience the hard, practical routine of daily life in which he had already been so severely schooled. Even his sentimental correspondence with his friend Speed lapsed into neglect. He was so poor that he and his bride could not make the contemplated visit to Kentucky they would have both so much enjoyed. His national debt of the New Salem days was not yet fully paid off. We are not keeping house, but boarding at the Globe Tavern, he writes. Our room and boarding only cost us four dollars a week. His law partnership with Stewart had lasted four years, but was dissolved by reason of Stewart's election to Congress, and a new one was formed with Judge Stephen T. Logan, who had recently resigned from the circuit bench where he had learned both the quality and promise of Lincoln's talents. It was an opportune and important change. Stewart had devoted himself mainly to politics, while with Logan Law was the primary object. Under Logan's guidance and encouragement, he took up both the study and practical work of the profession in a more serious spirit. Lincoln's interest in politics, however, was in no way diminished, and, in truth, his limited practice at that date easily afforded him the time necessary for both. Since 1840, he had declined a re-election to the legislature, and his ambition had doubtless contributed much to this decision. His late law partner, Stewart, had been three times a candidate for Congress. He was defeated in 1836, but successfully gained his election in 1838 and 1840. His service of two terms extending from December 2nd, 1839 to March 3rd, 1843. For some reason, the next election had been postponed from the year 1842 to 1843. It was but natural that Stuart's success should excite a similar desire in Lincoln, who had reached equal party prominence and rendered even more conspicuous party service. Lincoln had profited greatly by the companionship and friendly emulation of many talented young politicians of Springfield, but the same condition also increased competition and stimulated rivalry, not only himself, but both Hardin and Baker desired the nomination, which, as the district then stood, was equivalent to an election. When the leading Whigs of Sangamon County met, Lincoln was under the impression that it was Baker and not Hardin who was his most dangerous rival, as it appears in a letter to Speed of March 24th, 1843. We had a meeting of the Whigs of the county here on last Monday to appoint delegates to a district convention, and Baker beat me and got the delegation instructed to go for him. The meeting, in spite of my attempt to decline it, appointed me one of the delegates, so that in getting Baker the nomination, I shall be fixed a good deal like a fellow who has made groomsman to a man that has cut him out and is marrying his own dear gal. 
The causes that led to his disappointment are set forth more in detail in a letter two days later to a friend in the new county of Menard, which now included his old home, New Salem, whose powerful assistance was therefore lost from the party councils of Sangamon. The letter also dwells more particularly on the complicated influences which the practical politician has to reckon with, and shows that even his marriage had been used to turn popular opinion against him. It is truly gratifying to me to learn that while the people of Sangamon have cast me off, my old friends of Menard, who have known me longest and best, stick to me. It would astonish, if not amuse, the older citizens to learn that I, a stranger, friendless, uneducated, penniless boy, working on a flatboat at $10 per month, have been put down here as the candidate of pride, wealth, and aristocratic family distinction. Yet so, chiefly it was. There was, too, the strangest combination of church influence against me. Baker is a Campbellite, and therefore, as I suppose, with few exceptions, got all that church. My wife has some relations in the Presbyterian churches, and some of the Episcopal churches, and therefore, wherever it would tell, I was set down as either the one or the other, while it was everywhere contended that no Christian ought to go for me, because I belonged to no church, was suspected of being a deist, and had talked about fighting a duel. With all these things, Baker, of course, had nothing to do, nor do I complain of them. As to his own church going for him, I think that was right enough. And as to the influences I've spoken of in the other, though they were very strong, it would be grossly untrue and unjust to charge that they acted upon them in a body or were very near so. I only mean that those influences levied a tax of considerable percent upon my strength through the religious community. In the same letter, we have a striking illustration of Lincoln's intelligence and skill in the intricate details of political management, together with the high sense of honor and manliness which directed his action in such manners. Speaking of the influences of Menard County, he wrote, If she and Mason act circumspectly, they will in the convention be able so far to enforce their rights as to decide absolutely which one of the candidates shall be successful. Let me show the reason of this. Hardin, or some other Morgan candidate, will get Putnam, Marshall, Woodford, Tazewell, and Logan counties, making 16. Then you and Mason, having three, can give the victory to either side. You say you shall instruct your delegates for me unless I object. I certainly shall not object. That would be too pleasant a compliment for me to tread in the dust. And besides, if anything should happen, which however is not probable, by which Baker should be thrown out of the fight, I would be at liberty to accept the nomination if I could get it. I do, however, feel myself bound not to hinder him in any way from getting the nomination. I should despise myself were I to attempt it. I think, then, it would be proper for your meeting to appoint three delegates and to instruct them to go for someone as a first choice, someone else as a second, and perhaps someone as a third. And if in those instructions I were named as the first choice, it would gratify me very much. If you wish to hold the balance of power, it is important for you to attend and secure the vote of Mason also. A few weeks again changed the situation, of which he informed Speed in a letter dated May 18th. In relation to our Congress matter here, you are right in supposing I would support the nominee. Neither Baker nor I, however, is the man, but Hardin, so far as I can judge from present appearances. We shall have no split or trouble about the matter. All will be harmony. In the following year, 1844, Lincoln was once more compelled to exercise his patience. The Campbellite friends of Baker must again have been very active in behalf of their church favorite. For their influence, added to his dashing politics and eloquent oratory, appears to have secured him the nomination without serious contention, while Lincoln found a partial recompense in being nominated a candidate for presidential elector, which furnished him opportunity for all his party energy and zeal during the spirited but unsuccessful presidential campaign for Henry Clay. He not only made an extensive canvass in Illinois, but also made a number of speeches in the adjoining state of Indiana. It was probably during that year that a tacit agreement was reached among the Whig leaders in Sangamon County that each would be satisfied with one term in Congress and would not seek a second nomination. But Hardin was the aspirant from the neighboring county of Morgan, and apparently therefore not included in this arrangement. Already in the fall of 1845, Lincoln industriously began his appeals and instructions to his friends in the district to secure the secession. 
Thus, he wrote on November 17th, The paper at Pekin has nominated Hardin for governor, and, commenting on this, the Alton paper indirectly nominated him for Congress. It would give Hardin a great start, and perhaps use me up, if the Whig papers of the district should nominate him for Congress. If your feelings towards me are the same as when I saw you, which I have no reason to doubt, I wish you would let nothing appear in your paper which may operate against me. You understand. Matters stand just as they did when I saw you. Baker is certainly off the track, and I fear Hardin intends to be on it. But again, as before, the spirit of absolute fairness governed all his movements, and he took special pains to guard against it being suspected that I was attempting to juggle Hardin out of a nomination for Congress by juggling him into one for governor. I should be pleased, he wrote again in January, if I could concur with you in the hope that my name would be the only one presented to the convention, but I cannot. Hardin is a man of desperate energy and perseverance, and one that never backs out, and I fear to think otherwise is to be deceived in the character of our adversary. I would rejoice to be spared the labor of a contest, but being in, I shall go it thoroughly and to the bottom. He then goes on to recount in much detail the chances for and against him in the several counties of the district, and in later letters discusses the system of selecting candidates, where the convention ought to be held, how the delegates should be chosen, the instructions they should receive, and how the places of absent delegates should be filled. He watched his field of operations, planned his strategy, and handled his forces almost with the vigilance of a military commander. As a result, he won both his nomination in May and his election to the 30th Congress in August 1846. In that same year, the Mexican War broke out. Hardin became colonel of one of the three regiments of Illinois volunteers called for by President Polk, while Baker raised a fourth regiment, which was also accepted. Colonel Hardin was killed in the Battle of Buena Vista, and Colonel Baker won great distinction in the fighting near the city of Mexico. Like Abraham Lincoln, Douglas was also elected to Congress in 1846, where he had already served the two preceding terms. But these redoubtable Illinois champions were not to have a personal tilt in the House of Representatives. Before Congress met, the Illinois legislature elected Douglas to the United States Senate for six years, from March 4th, 1847. End of chapter 5《Of a Short Life of Abraham Lincoln》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rob Powell — A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter 6 First Session of the 30th Congress Mexican War, Wilmo Proviso, Campaign of 1848, Letters to Herndon about Young Men in Politics, Speech in Congress on the Mexican War, Second Session of the 30th Congress, Bill to Prohibit Slavery in the District of Columbia, Lincoln's Recommendations of Office Seekers, Letters to Speed, Commissioner of the General Land Office, declines governorship of Oregon. Very few men are fortunate enough to gain distinction during their first term in Congress. The reason is obvious. Legally, a term extends over two years. Practically, a session of five or six months during the first and three months during the second year ordinarily reduce their opportunities more than one half. In those two sessions, even if we presuppose some knowledge of parliamentary law, they must learn the daily routine of business, make the acquaintance of their fellow members who, already, in the 30th Congress, numbered something over 200, study the past and prospective legislation on a multitude of minor national questions entirely new to the new members, and perform the drudgery of haunting the departments in the character of unpaid agent and attorney to attend to the private interests of constituents, a physical task of no small proportion in Lincoln's day, when there were neither streetcar nor omnibus in the city of magnificent distances, as Washington was nicknamed. 
Add to this that the principal work of preparing legislation is done by the various committees in their committee rooms, of which the public hears nothing, and that members cannot choose their own time for making speeches. Still further, that the management of debate on prepared legislation must necessarily be entrusted to members of long experience as well as talent, and it will be seen that the novice need not expect immediate fame. It is therefore not to be wondered at that Lincoln's single term in the House of Representatives at Washington added practically nothing to his reputation. He did not attempt to shine forth in debate by either a stinging retort or a witty epigram, or by a sudden burst of inspired eloquence. On the contrary, he took up his task as a quiet but earnest and patient apprentice in the great workshop of national legislation, and performed his share of duty with industry and intelligence, as well as with a modest and appreciative respect for the ability and experience of his seniors. As to speech making, he wrote, by way of getting the hang of the house, I made a little speech two or three days ago on a post office question of no general interest. I find speaking here and elsewhere about the same thing. I was about as badly scared and no worse as I am when I speak in court. I expect to make one within a week or two in which I hope to succeed well enough to wish you to see it. And again, some weeks later, I just take my pen to say that Mr. Stevens of Georgia, a little slim, pale faced, consumptive man with a voice like Logan's has just concluded the very best speech of an hour's length I have ever heard. My old withered dry eyes are full of tears yet. He was appointed the junior Whig member of the committee on post offices and post roads and shared its prosaic, but eminently useful labors, both in the committee room and the house debates. His name appears on only one other committee that on expenditures of the war department. And he seems to have interested himself in certain amendments of the law relating to bounty lands for soldiers and such minor military topics. He looked carefully after the interest of Illinois in certain grants of land to that state for railroads, but expressed his desire that the government price of the reserve sections should not be increased to actual settlers. During the first session of the 30th Congress, he delivered three set speeches in the House, all of them carefully prepared and fully written out. The first of these, on January 12, 1848, was an elaborate defense of the Whig doctrine summarized in a House resolution passed a week or 10 days before, that the Mexican-American War had been unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the President, James K. Polk. The speech is not a mere party diatribe, but a terse historical and legal examination of the origin of the Mexican War. In the afterlight of our own times, which shines upon these transactions, we may readily admit that Mr. Lincoln and the Whigs had the best of the argument, but it must be quite as readily conceded that they were far behind the president and his defenders in political and party strategy. The former were clearly wasting their time in discussing an abstract question of international law upon conditions existing 20 months before. During those 20 months, the American arms had won victory after victory and planted the American flag on the halls of the Montezumas. Could even successful argument undo those victories or call back to life the brave American soldiers who had shed their blood to win them? It may be assumed as an axiom that Providence has never gifted any political party with all of political wisdom or blinded it with all of political folly. Upon the foregoing point of controversy, the Whigs were sadly thrown on the defensive and labored heavily under their already discounted declamation. But instinct, rather than sagacity, led them to turn their eyes to the future and successfully upon other points to retrieve their mistake. Within six weeks after Lincoln's speech, President Polk sent to the Senate a treaty of peace under which Mexico ceded to the United States an extent of territory equal in area to Germany, France, and Spain combined. And thereafter, the origin of the war was an obsolete question. What should be done with the new territory was now the issue. This issue embraced the already exciting slavery question. And Mr. Lincoln was doubtless gratified that the Whigs had taken a position upon it so consonant with his own convictions. Already, in the previous Congress, the body of the Whig members had joined a small group of anti-slavery Democrats in fastening upon an appropriation bill the famous 
Wilmo Proviso, that slavery should never exist in territory acquired from Mexico, and the Whigs of the 30th Contra steadily followed the policy of voting for the same restriction in regard to every piece of legislation where it was applicable. Mr. Lincoln often said he had voted 40 or 50 times for the Wilmo Proviso in various forms during his single term. Upon another point, he and the other Whigs were equally wise. Repelling the Democratic charge that they were unpatriotic in denouncing the war, they voted in favor of every measure to sustain, supply, and encourage the soldiers in the field. But their most adroit piece of strategy, now that the war was ended, was in their movement to make General Taylor president. In this movement, Mr. Lincoln took a leading and active part. No living American statesman has ever been idolized by his party adherents, as was Henry Clay for a whole generation. And Mr. Lincoln fully shared this hero worship. But his practical campaigning as a candidate for presidential elector in the Harrison campaign of 1840 and the Clay campaign of 1844 in Illinois and the adjoining states afforded him a basis for sound judgment and convinced him that the day when Clay could have been elected president was forever past. Mr. Clay's chance for an election is just no chance at all, he wrote on April 30th. He might get New York, and that would have elected in 1844, but it will not now, because he must now, at the least, lose Tennessee, which he had then, and in addition, the 15 new votes of Florida, Texas, Iowa, and Wisconsin. In my judgment, we can elect nobody but General Taylor, and we cannot elect him without a nomination. Therefore, don't fail to send a delegate. And again, on the same day, Mr. Clay's letter has not advanced his interests any here. Several who were against Taylor, but not for anybody particularly before, are since taking ground, some for Scott and some for McLean. Who will be nominated, neither I nor anyone else can tell. Now, let me pray to you in turn. My prayer is that you let nothing discourage or baffle you, but that, in spite of every difficulty, you send us a good tailored delegate from your circuit. Make Baker, who is now with you, I suppose, help about it. He is a good hand to raise a breeze. In due time, Mr. Lincoln's sagacity and earnestness were both justified, for on June 12th, he was able to write an Illinois friend. On my return from Philadelphia, where I had been attending the nomination of Old Rough, I found your letter in a mass of others which had accumulated in my absence. By many, and often, it has been said they would not abide the nomination of Taylor. But since the deed has been done, they are fast falling in, and in my opinion, we shall have a most overwhelming, glorious triumph. One unmistakable sign is that all the odds and ends are with us, barn burners, Native Americans, Tyler men, disappointed office-seeking locofocos, and the Lord knows what. This is important, if in nothing else, in showing which way the wind blows. Some of the sanguine men have set down all the states as certain for Taylor but Illinois, and it is as doubtful. Cannot something be done even in Illinois? Taylor's nomination takes the locos on the blind side. It turns the war thunder against them. The war is now to them the gallows of Haman, which they built for us, and which they are doomed to be hanged themselves. Nobody understood better than Mr. Lincoln the obvious truth that in politics it does not suffice merely to nominate candidates. Something must also be done to elect them. Two of the letters which he at this time wrote home to his young law partner, William H. Herndon, are especially worth quoting in part, not alone to show his zeal in industry, but also as a perennial instruction and encouragement to young men who have an ambition to make a name and a place for themselves in American politics. Last night, I was attending a sort of caucus of the Whig members held in relation to the coming presidential election. The whole field of the nation was scanned, and all is high hope and confidence. Now, as to the young men, you must not wait to be brought forward by the older men. For instance, do you suppose that I should have ever got into notice if I had waited to be hunted up and pushed forward by older men? You young men get together and form a rough and ready club and have regular meetings and speeches. Let everyone play the part he can play best. Some speak, some sing, and all holler. Your meetings will be of evenings. The older men and the women will go to hear you so that it will not only contribute to the election of old Zach, but will be an interesting pastime and improving to the intellectual faculties of all engaged. 
And in another letter, answering one from Herndon, in which that young aspirant complains of having been neglected, he says, The subject of that letter is exceedingly painful to me, and I cannot but think that there is some mistake in your impression of the motives of the old men. I suppose I am now one of the old men, and I declare on my veracity, which I think is good with you, that nothing could afford me more satisfaction than to learn that you and others of my young friends at home are doing battle in the contest and endearing themselves to the people and taking a stand far above any I have been able to reach in their admiration. I cannot conceive that other old men feel differently. Of course, I cannot demonstrate what I say, but I was young once and I'm sure I was never ungenerously thrust back. I hardly know what to say. The way for a young man to rise is to improve himself every way he can, never suspecting that anybody wishes to hinder him. Allow me to assure you that suspicion and jealousy never did help any man in any situation. There may sometimes be ungenerous attempts to keep a young man down, and they will succeed, too, if he allows his mind to be diverted from its true channel to brood over the attempted injury. Cast about! and see if this feeling has not injured every person you have ever known to fall into it. Mr. Lincoln's interest in this presidential campaign did not expend itself merely in advice to others. We have his own written record that he also took an active part for the election of General Taylor after his nomination. Speaking a few times in Maryland near Washington, several times in Massachusetts, and canvassing quite fully his own district in Illinois. Before the session of Congress ended, he also delivered two speeches in the House, one on the general subject of internal improvements and the other the usual political campaign speech which members of Congress are in the habit and the other the usual political campaign speech which members of Congress are in the habit of making to be printed for home circulation, made up mainly of humorous and satirical criticism favoring the election of General Taylor and opposing the election of General Cass, the Democratic candidate. Even this production, however, is lighted up by a passage of impressive earnestness and eloquence, in which he explains and defends the attitude of the Whigs in the denouncing the origin of the Mexican War. If to say the war was unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the President be opposing the war, then the Whigs have very generally opposed it. Wherever they have spoken at all, they have said this, and they have said it on what has appeared good reason to them. The marching an army into the midst of a peaceful Mexican settlement, frightening the inhabitants away, leaving their growing crops and other property to destruction, to you may appear a perfectly amiable, peaceful, unprovoking procedure, but it does not appear so to us. So to call such an act to us appears no other than a naked, impudent absurdity, and we speak of it accordingly. But if, when the war had begun, and had become the cause of the country, the giving of our money and our blood, in common with yours, with support of the war, then it is not true that we have always opposed the war. With few individual exceptions, you have constantly had our votes here for all the necessary supplies, and more than this, you have had the services, the blood, and the lives of our political brethren in every trial and on every field. The beardless boy and the mature man, the humble and the distinguished, you have had them. Through suffering and death, by disease and in battle, they have endured and fought and fell with you. Clay and Webster each gave a son, never to be returned. From the state of my own residence, besides other worthy but less known Whig names, we sent Marshall, Morrison, Baker, and Hardin. They all fought and one fell, and in the fall of that one, we lost our best Whig man. Nor were the Whigs few in number or laggard in the day of danger. In that fearful, bloody, breathless struggle at Buena Vista, where each man's hard task was to beat back five foes or die himself, of the five high officers who perished, four were Whigs. In speaking of this, I mean no odious comparison between the line-hearted Whigs and the Democrats who fought there. On other occasions, and among the lower officers and privates on that occasion, I doubt not the proportion was different. I wish to do justice to all. I think of all those brave men as Americans, in whose proud fame as an American I too have a share. Many of them, Whigs and Democrats, are my constituents and personal friends, and I thank them, more than thank them, one and all for the high, imperishable honor they have conferred 
on our common state. During the second session of the 30th Congress, Mr. Lincoln made no long speeches, but in addition to the usual routine work devolved on him by the committee of which he was a member, he busied himself in preparing a special measure which, because its relation to the great events of his later life, needs to be particularly mentioned. Slavery existed in Maryland and Virginia when those states ceded the territory out of which the District of Columbia was formed. Since, by that session, this land passed under the exclusive control of the federal government, the institution within this 10-mile square could no longer be defended by the plea of state sovereignty. An anti-slavery sentiment naturally demanded that it should cease. Pro-slavery statesmen, on the other hand, as persistently opposed its removal, partly as a matter of pride and political consistency, partly because it was a convenience to Southern senators and members of the Congress when they came to Washington to bring their family servants where the local laws afforded them the same security over their black chattels which existed at their homes. Mr. Lincoln, in his Peoria speech of 1854, emphasized the sectional dispute with his vivid touch of local color. The South clamored for a more efficient fugitive slave law. The North clamored for the abolition of a peculiar species of slave trade in the District of Columbia, in connection with which, in view from the windows of the Capitol, a sort of Negro livery stable, where droves of Negroes were collected, temporarily kept, and finally taken to Southern markets, precisely like droves of horses had been openly maintained for 50 years. Thus, the question remained a minor but never-ending bone of contention and point of irritation. And excited debate arose in the 30th Congress over a House resolution that the Committee on the Judiciary be instructed to report a bill, as soon as practicable, prohibiting the slave trade in the District of Columbia. In this situation of affairs, Mr. Lincoln conceived the fond hope that he might be able to present a plan of compromise. He already entertained the idea, which in later years during his presidency, he urged upon both Congress and the border slave states that the just and generous mode of getting rid of the barbarous institution of slavery was by a system of compensated emancipation, giving freedom to the slave and a money indemnity to the owner. He therefore carefully framed a bill providing for the abolishment of slavery in the district upon the following principal conditions. First, that the law should be adopted by a popular vote in the district. Second, a temporary system of apprenticeship and gradual emancipation for children born of slave mothers after January 1st, 1850. Third, the government to pay full cash value for slaves voluntarily manumitted by their owners. Fourth, prohibiting bringing slaves into the district or selling them out of it. Fifth, providing that government officers, citizens of slave states might bring with them and take them away again, their slave house servants. Sixth, leaving the existing fugitive slave law in force. When Mr. Lincoln presented this amendment to the House, he said that he was authorized to state that of about 15 of the leading citizens of the District of Columbia to whom the proposition had been submitted, there was not one who did not approve the adoption of such a proposition. He did not wish to be misunderstood. He did not know whether or not they would vote for this bill on the first Monday in April, but he repeated that out of the 15 persons to whom it had been submitted, he had authority to say that every one of them desired that some proposition like this should pass. While Mr. Lincoln did not so state to the House, it was well understood in intimate circles that the bill had the approval on the one hand of Mr. Seaton, the conservative mayor of Washington, and on the other hand of Mr. Giddings, the radical anti-slavery member of the House of Representatives. Notwithstanding the singular merit of the bill and reconciling such extremes of opposing factions in its support, the temper of Congress had already become too hot to accept such a rational and practical solution, and Mr. Lincoln's wise proposition was not allowed to come to a vote. The triumphant election of General Taylor to the presidency in November 1848 very soon devolved upon Mr. Lincoln the delicate and difficult duty of making recommendations to the incoming administration of persons suitable to be appointed to fill the various federal offices in Illinois, as Colonel E.D. Baker and himself were the only Whigs elected to Congress from that state. In performing this duty, one of his leading characteristics, impartial honesty, and absolute fairness to political friends and foes alike stands out with noteworthy clearness. His term ended with General Taylor's inauguration, and he appears to have remained in Washington but a few days thereafter. Before leaving, he wrote to the new Secretary of the Treasury, Colonel E.D. Baker and myself are the only Whig members of Congress from Illinois, I of the 30th and he of the 31st. 
We have reason to think the Whigs of that state hold us responsible, to some extent, for the appointments which may be made of our citizens. We do not know you personally, and our efforts to see you have, so far, been unavailing. I therefore hope I am not obtrusive in saying in this way, for him and myself, that when a citizen of Illinois is to be appointed in your department to an office either in or out of the state, we most respectfully ask to be heard. On the following day, March 10, 1849, he addressed to the Secretary of State his first formal recommendation. It is remarkable from the fact that between the two Whig applicants whose papers are transmitted, he says rather less in favor of his own choice than of the opposing claimant. Sir, there are several applicants for the Office of United States Marshal for the District of Illinois, among the most prominent of whom are Benjamin Bond, Esquire of Carlisle, and Thomas, Esquire of Galena. Mr. Bond, I know to be personally every way worthy of the office, and he is very numerously and most respectably recommended. His papers I send to you, and I solicit for his claims a full and fair consideration. Having said this much, I add that in my individual judgment, the appointment of Mr. Thomas would be the better. Your obedient servant, A. Lincoln, endorsed on Mr. Bond's papers. In this and the accompanying envelope are the recommendations of about 200 good citizens of all parts of Illinois that Benjamin Bond be appointed marshal for that district. They include the names of nearly all our Whigs who now are, or have ever been, members of the state legislature, besides 46 of the Democratic members of the present legislature, and many other good citizens. I add that from personal knowledge, I consider Mr. Bond every way worthy of office and qualified to fill it. Holding the individual opinion that the appointment of a different gentleman would be better, I ask a special attention and consideration for his claims, and for the opinions expressed in his favor by those over whom I can claim no superiority. There were but three other prominent federal appointments to be made in Mr. Lincoln's congressional district, and he waited until after his return home so that he might be better informed of the local opinion concerning them before making his recommendations. It was nearly a month after he left Washington before he sent his decision to the several departments at Washington. The letter quoted below, relating to one of those appointments, is in substance almost identical with the others, and particularly refrains from expressing any opinion of his own for or against the policy of political removals. He also expressly explains that Colonel Baker, the other Whig representative, claims no voice in the appointment. Dear Sir, I recommend that Walter Davis be appointed receiver of the land office at this place, wherever there shall be a vacancy. I cannot say that Mr. Herndon, the present incumbent, has failed in the proper discharge of any of the duties of the office. He is a very warm partisan and openly and actively opposed to the election of General Taylor. I also understand that since General Taylor's election, he has received a reappointment from Mr. Polk, his old commission not having expired. Whether this is true, the records of the department will show. I may add that the Whigs here almost universally desire his removal. If Mr. Lincoln's presence in Washington during two sessions in Congress did not add materially to either his local or national fame, it was of incalculable benefit in other respects. It afforded him a close inspection of the complex machinery of the federal government and its relations to that of the states, and enabled him to notice both the easy routine and the occasional friction of their movements. It brought him into contact, and to some degree, intimate companionship with political leaders from all parts of the Union and gave him the opportunity of joining in the caucus and the national convention that nominated General Taylor for president. It broadened immensely the horizon of his observation and the sharp personal rivalries he noted at the center of the nation opened to him new lessons in the study of human nature. His quick intelligence acquired knowledge quite as, or even more rapidly by the process of logical intuition than by a mere dry laborious study. And it was the inestimable experience of the single term in the Congress of the United States which prepared him for his coming, yet undreamed of, responsibilities, as fully as it would have done the ordinary man in a dozen. Mr. Lincoln had frankly acknowledged to his friend Speed, after his election in 1864, that, being elected to Congress, though I am very grateful to our friends for having done it, it has not pleased me as much as I expected. It has already been said that an agreement had been reached among the several Springfield aspirants that they would limit their ambition to a single term and take turns in securing and enjoying the coveted distinction, and Mr. Lincoln remained faithful to this agreement. When the time to prepare for the election of 1848 approached, he wrote to his law partner, It is very pleasant to learn from you that there are some who would desire that I should be re-elected. I most heartily thank them for their kind partiality, 
And I can say, as Mr. Clay said of the annexation of Texas, that personally, I would not object to a re-election, although I thought at the time, and still think, it would be quite as well for me to return to the law at the end of a single term. I made the declaration that I would not be a candidate again, more from a wish to deal fairly with others to keep peace among our friends and to keep the district from going to the enemy than for any cause personal to myself. So that if it should so happen that nobody else wishes to be elected, I could not refuse the people the right of sending me again, but to enter myself as a competitor of others or to authorize anyone else so to enter me is what my word and honor forbid. Judge Stephen T. Logan, his late law partner, was nominated for the place and heartily supported not only by Mr. Lincoln, but also by the Whigs of the district. By this time, however, the politics of the district had undergone a change by reason of the heavy emigration to Illinois at that period, and Judge Logan was defeated. Mr. Lincoln's strict and sensitive adherence to his promises now brought him a disappointment, which was one of those blessings in disguise so commonly deplored for the time being by the wisest and the best. A number of the Western members of Congress had joined in a recommendation to President-elect Taylor to give Colonel E.D. Baker a place in his cabinet, a reward he richly deserved for his talents, his party service, and the military honor he had won in the Mexican War. When this application bore no fruit, the Whigs of Illinois, expressing at least some encouragement from the new administration, laid claim to a bureau appointment that of Commissioner of the General Land Office in the new Department of the Interior recently established. I believe that, so far as the Whigs in Congress are concerned, wrote Lincoln to Speed 12 days before Taylor's inauguration, I could have the General Land Office almost by common consent. But then Sweet and Don Morrison and Browning and Cyrus Edwards all want it. And what is worse, while well, I think I could easily take it myself, I fear I shall have trouble to get it for any other man in Illinois. Unselfishly yielding his own chances, he tried to induce the four Illinois candidates to come to a mutual agreement in favor of one of their own number. They were so tardy in settling their differences as to excite his impatience, and he wrote to a Washington friend, I learned from Washington that a man by the name of Butterfield will probably be appointed commissioner of the general land office. This ought not to be. Some kind friends think I ought to be an applicant, but I am for Mr. Edwards. Try to defeat Butterfield, and in doing so, use Mr. Edwards, J.L.D. Morrison, or myself, whichever you can to best advantage. As the situation grew persistently worse, Mr. Lincoln at length, about the 1st of June, himself became a formal applicant. But the delay resulting from his devotion to his friends had dissipated his chances. Butterfield received the appointment, and the defeat was aggravated when, a few months later, his unrelenting spirit of justice and fairness impelled him to write a letter defending Butterfield and the Secretary of the Interior from an attack by one of Lincoln's warm personal but indiscreet friends in the Illinois legislature. It was, however, a fortunate escape. In the four succeeding years, Mr. Lincoln qualified himself for better things than the monotonous drudgery of an administrative bureau at Washington. It is probable that this defeat also enabled him more easily to pass by another temptation. The Taylor administration, realizing its ingratitude, at length, in September, offered him the governorship of the recently organized territory of Oregon, but he replied, on as much reflection as if I had time to give the subject, I cannot consent to accept it. End of chapter 6「Peoria Debate Trumbull Elected Letter to Robinson The Know-Nothings Decature Meeting Bloomington Convention Philadelphia Convention Lincoln's Vote for Vice President Fremont and Dayton Lincoln's Campaign Speeches Chicago Banquet Speech
After the expiration of his term in Congress, Mr. Lincoln applied himself with unremitting assiduity to the practice of law, which the growth of the state in population and the widening of his acquaintanceship no less than his own growth in experience and legal acumen rendered ever more important and absorbing. In 1854, he writes, his profession had almost superseded the thought of politics in his mind when the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused him as he had never been before. Not alone Mr. Lincoln, but indeed the whole nation was so aroused, the Democratic Party and nearly the entire South, to force the passage of that repeal through Congress, and an alarmed majority, including even a considerable minority of the Democratic Party in the North, to resist its passage. Mr. Lincoln, of course, shared the general indignation of Northern sentiment, that the whole of the remaining Louisiana Territory, out of which six states and the greater part of two more have since been organized and admitted to the Union, should be open to the possible extension of slavery. But two points served specially to enlist his energy in the controversy. One was personal, in that Senator Douglas of Illinois, by whom the repeal was championed, and whose influence as a free state senator and powerful democratic leader alone made the repeal possible, had been his personal antagonist in Illinois politics for almost twenty years. The other was moral, in that the new question involved the elemental principles of the American government, the fundamental maxim of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. His intuitive logic needed no demonstration that bank, tariff, internal improvements, the Mexican War, and their related incidents were questions of passing expediency but that this sudden reaction, needlessly grafted upon a routine statute to organize a new territory, was the unmistakable herald of a coming struggle which might transform republican institutions. It was in January 1854 that the accidents of a Senate debate threw into Congress and upon the country the firebrand of the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. The repeal was not consummated till the month of May, and from May until the autumn elections the flame of acrimonious discussion ran over the whole country like a wildfire. There is no record that Mr. Lincoln took any public part in the discussion until the month of September, but it is very clear that he not only carefully watched its progress, but that he studied its phases of development, its historical origins, and its legal bearings with close industry, and gathered from party literature and legislative documents a harvest of substantial facts and data rather than the wordy campaign phrases and explosive epithets with which more impulsive students and speakers were content to produce their oratorical effects. Here we may again quote Mr. Lincoln's exact written statement of the manner in which he resumed his political activity. In the autumn of that year, 1854, he took the stump with no broader practical aim or object than to secure, if possible, the re-election of the Honorable Richard Yates to Congress. His speeches at once attracted a more marked attention than they had ever before done. As the canvass proceeded, he was drawn to different parts of the state, outside of Mr. Yates' district. He did not abandon the law, but gave his attention by turns to that and politics. The state agricultural fair was at Springfield that year and Douglas was announced to speak there. The new question had created great excitement and uncertainty in Illinois politics, and there were abundant signs that it was beginning to break up the organization of both the Whig and the Democratic parties. This feeling brought together at the State Fair an unusual number of local leaders from widely scattered counties, and almost spontaneously a sort of political tournament of speech-making broke out. In this, Senator Douglas, doubly conspicuous by his leadership of the Nebraska Bill in the Congress, was expected to play the leading part, while the opposition, by a common impulse, called upon Lincoln to answer him. Lincoln performed the task with such aptness and force, with such freshness of argument, illustrations from history and citations from authorities, as secured him a decided oratorical triumph and lifted him at a single bound to the leadership of the opposition to Douglas's propagandism. Two weeks later Douglas and Lincoln met at Peoria in a similar debate, and on his return to Springfield, Lincoln wrote out and printed his speech in full. 
The reader who carefully examines this speech will at once be impressed with the genius which immediately made Mr. Lincoln a power in American politics. His grasp of the subject is so comprehensive, his statement so clear, his reasoning so convincing, his language so strong and eloquent by turns, that the wonderful power he manifested in the discussions and debates of the six succeeding years does not surpass, but only amplifies this, his first examination of the whole brood of questions relating to slavery precipitated upon the country by Douglas's repeal. After a searching history of the Missouri Compromise, he attacks the demoralizing effects and portentous consequences of its repeal. This declared indifference, he says, but, as I must think, covert real zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our republican example of its just influence in the world, enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites, causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many good men among ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty, criticizing the Declaration of Independence, and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest. Slavery is founded in the selfishness of man's nature, opposition to it in his love of justice. These principles are an internal antagonism, and when brought into collision so fiercely as slavery extension brings them, shocks and throes and convulsions must ceaselessly follow. Repeal the Missouri Compromise, repeal all compromises, repeal the Declaration of Independence, repeal all past history, you still cannot repeal human nature. It still will be the abundance of man's heart that slavery extension is wrong, and out of the abundance of his heart his mouth will continue to speak. With argument as impetuous and logic as inexorable, he disposes of Douglas's plea of popular sovereignty. Here, or at Washington, I would not trouble myself with the oyster laws of Virginia or the cranberry laws of Indiana. The doctrine of self-government is right, absolutely and eternally right, but it has no just application as here attempted. Or perhaps I should rather say, that whether it has such application depends upon whether a negro is not or is a man. If he is not a man, in that case he who is a man may, as a matter of self-government, do just what he pleases with him. But if the negro is a man, is it not to that extent a total destruction of self-government to say that he too shall not govern himself? When the white man governs himself, that is self-government but when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government, that is despotism. I particularly object to the new position which the avowed principle of this Nebraska law gives to slavery in the body politic. I object to it because it assumes that there can be moral right in the enslaving of one man by another. I object to it as a dangerous dalliance for a free people a sad evidence that feeling prosperity we forget right, that liberty as a principle we have ceased to revere. Little by little, but steadily, as man's march to the grave, we have been giving up the old for the new faith. Near eighty years ago we began by declaring that all men are created equal. But now, from that beginning we have run down to the other declaration that for some men to enslave others is a sacred right of self-government. These principles cannot stand together. They are as opposite as God and Mammon. If one compares the serious tone of this speech with the hard cider and coonskin buncombe of the Harrison campaign of 1840, and its lofty philosophical thought with the humorous declamation of the Taylor campaign of 1848, the speaker's advance in mental development at once becomes apparent. In this single effort, Mr. Lincoln had risen from the class of the politician to the rank of the statesman. There is a well-founded tradition that Douglas, disconcerted and troubled by Lincoln's unexpected manifestation of power in the Springfield and Peoria debates, sought a friendly interview with his opponent and obtained from him an agreement that neither one of them would make any further speeches before the election. 
The local interest in the campaign was greatly heightened by the fact that the term of Douglas's Democratic colleague in the United States Senate was about to expire, and that the state legislature to be elected would have the choosing of his successor. It is not probable that Lincoln built much hope upon this coming political chance, as the Democratic Party had been throughout the whole history of the state in decided political control. It turned out, nevertheless, that in the election held on November 7th, an opposition majority of the members of the legislature was chosen, and Lincoln became, to outward appearances, the most available opposition candidate. But party disintegration had been only partial. Lincoln and his party friends still called themselves Whigs, though they could muster only a minority of the total membership of the legislature. The so-called anti-Nebraska Democrats, opposing Douglas and his followers, were still too full of traditional party prejudice to help elect a pronounced Whig to the United States Senate, though as strongly anti-Nebraska as themselves. Five of them brought forward and stubbornly voted for Lyman Trumbull, an anti-Nebraska Democrat of ability who had been chosen representative in Congress from the 8th Illinois district in the recent election. On the ninth ballot it became evident to Lincoln that there was danger of a new Democratic candidate, neutral on the Nebraska question, being chosen. In this contingency he manifested a personal generosity and political sagacity far above the comprehension of the ordinary smart politician. He advised and prevailed upon his Whig supporters to vote for Trumbull, and thus secure a vote in the United States Senate against slavery extension. He had rightly interpreted both statesmanship and human nature. His personal sacrifice on this occasion contributed essentially to the coming political regeneration of his state, and the five anti-Nebraska Democrats, who then wrought his defeat, became his most devoted personal followers and efficient allies in his own later political triumph, which adverse currents, however, were still to delay to a tantalizing degree. The circumstances of his defeat at that critical stage of his career must have seemed especially irritating, yet he preserved a most remarkable equanimity of temper. I regret my defeat moderately, he wrote to a sympathizing friend, but I am not nervous about it. We may fairly infer that while Mr. Lincoln was not nervous, he was nevertheless deeply impressed by the circumstance as an illustration of the grave nature of the pending political controversy. A letter written by him about half a year later to a friend in Kentucky is full of such serious reflection as to show that the existing political conditions in the United States had engaged his most profound thought and investigation. That spirit, he wrote, which desire the peaceful extinction of slavery has itself become extinct with the occasion and the men of the revolution. Under the impulse of that occasion nearly half the states adopted systems of emancipation at once, and it is a significant fact that not a single state has done the like since. So far as peaceful voluntary emancipation is concerned, the condition of the negro slave in America, scarcely less terrible to the contemplation of a free mind, is now as fixed and hopeless of change for the better as that of the lost souls of the finally impenitent. The autocrat of all Russias will resign his crown and proclaim his subjects free republicans sooner than will our American masters voluntarily give up their slaves. Our political problem now is, can we as a nation continue together permanently, forever, half slave and half free? The problem is too mighty for me. May God in his mercy superintend the solution. Not quite three years later, Mr. Lincoln made the concluding problem of this letter the text of a famous speech. On the day before his first inauguration as President of the United States, the autocrat of all Russias, Alexander II, by imperial decree emancipated his serfs, while six weeks after the inauguration the American masters, headed by Jefferson Davis, began the greatest war of modern times to perpetuate and spread the institution of slavery. The excitement produced by the repeal of the Missouri Compromise in 1854, by the election forays of the Missouri border ruffians into Kansas in 1855, and by the succeeding civil strife in 1856 in that territory, wrought an effective transformation of political parties in the Union, in preparation for the presidential election of that year. This transformation, though not seriously checked, was very considerably complicated by an entirely new faction, 
or rather by the sudden revival of an old one, which in the past had called itself Native Americanism, and now assumed the name of the American Party, though it was more popularly known by the nickname of Know Nothings, because of its secret organization. It professed a certain hostility to foreign-born voters and to the Catholic religion, and demanded a change in the naturalization laws from five years to twenty-one years preliminary residence. This faction had gained some sporadic successes in eastern cities, but when its national convention met in February 1856 to nominate candidates for president and vice president, the pending slavery question that it had hitherto studiously ignored caused the disruption of its organization, and though the adhering delegates nominated Millard Fillmore for president and A.J. Donaldson for vice president, who remained in the field and were voted for to some extent in the presidential election, the organization was present only as a crippled and disturbing factor and disappeared totally from politics in the following years. Both North and South party lines adjusted themselves defiantly upon the single issue, for or against men and measures representing the extension or restriction of slavery. The Democratic Party, though radically changing its constituent elements, retained the party name and became the party of slavery extension, having forced the repeal and supported the resulting measures. While the Whig Party entirely disappeared, its members in the northern states joining the anti-Nebraska Democrats in the formation of the new Republican Party. Southern Whigs either went boldly into the Democratic camp or followed for a while the delusive prospects of the know-nothings. This party change went on somewhat slowly in the state of Illinois because that state extended in territorial length from the latitude of Massachusetts to that of Virginia, and its population contained an equally diverse local sentiment. The northern counties had at once become strongly anti-Nebraska, the conservative Whig counties of the center inclined to the know-nothings, while the Kentuckians and Carolinians who had settled the southern end had strong antipathies to what they called abolitionism and applauded Douglas and the repeal. The agitation, however, swept on, and further hesitation became impossible. Early in 1856, Mr. Lincoln began to take an active part in organizing the Republican Party. He attended a small gathering of anti-Nebraska editors in February at Decatur, who issued a call for a mass convention, which met at Bloomington in May at which the Republican Party of Illinois was formally constituted by an enthusiastic gathering of local leaders who had formerly been bitter antagonists, but who now joined their efforts to resist slavery extension. They formulated an empathic but not radical platform, and through a committee selected a composite ticket of candidates for state offices, which the convention approved by acclamation. The occasion remains memorable because of the closing address made by Mr. Lincoln in one of his most impressive oratorical moods. So completely were his auditors carried away by the force of his denunciation of existing political evils and by the eloquence of his appeal for harmony and union to redress them, that neither a verbatim report nor even an authentic abstract was made during its delivery, but the lifting inspiration of its periods will never fade from the memory of those who heard it. About three weeks later, the first national convention of the Republican Party met in Philadelphia and nominated John C. Fremont of California for president. There was a certain fitness in this selection from the fact that he had been elected to the United States Senate when California applied for admission as a free state, and that the resistance of the South to her admission had been the entering wedge of the slavery agitation of 1850. This, however, was in reality a minor consideration. It was rather his romantic fame as a daring Rocky Mountain explorer, appealing strongly to popular imagination and sympathy, which gave him prestige as a presidential candidate. It was at this point that the career of Abraham Lincoln had a narrow and fortunate escape from a premature and fatal prominence. The Illinois Bloomington Convention had sent him as a delegate to the Philadelphia Convention, and no doubt very unexpectedly to himself, on the first ballot for a candidate for vice president, he received 110 votes against 259 votes for William L. Dayton of New Jersey, upon which the choice of Mr. Dayton was at once made unanimous. But the incident proves that Mr. Lincoln was already gaining a national fame among the advanced leaders of political thought. Happily, a mysterious providence reserved him for larger and nobler uses. The nominations thus made at Philadelphia completed the array for the presidential battle of 1856. 
The Democratic National Convention had met at Cincinnati on June 2nd and nominated James Buchanan for President and John C. Breckinridge for Vice President. Its work presented two points of noteworthy interest, namely that the South, in an arrogant pro-slavery dictatorship, relentlessly cast aside the claims of Douglas and Pierce, who had effected the repeal of the Missouri Compromise and nominated Buchanan in apparently sure confidence of that superserviceable zeal in behalf of slavery which he so obediently rendered. Also that in a platform of intolerable length there was such a cunning ambiguity of words and concealment of sense, such a double dealing of phrase and meaning as to render it possible that the pro-slavery Democrats of the South and some anti-slavery Democrats of the North might join for the last time to elect a northern man with southern principles. Again in this campaign, as in several former presidential elections, Mr. Lincoln was placed upon the electoral ticket of Illinois, and he made over fifty speeches in his own and adjoining states in behalf of Fremont and Dayton. Not one of these speeches was reported in full, but the few fragments which have been preserved show that he occupied no doubtful ground on the pending issues. Already the Democrats were raising the potent alarm cry that the Republican Party was sectional and that its success would dissolve the Union. Mr. Lincoln did not then dream that he would ever have to deal practically with such a contingency, but his mind was very clear as to the method of meeting it. Speaking for the Republican Party, he said, But the Union in any event will not be dissolved. We don't want to dissolve it, and if you attempt it, we won't let you. With the purse and sword, the army and navy and treasury in our hands and at our command, you could not do it. This government would be very weak, indeed, if a majority with a disciplined army and navy and a well-filled treasury could not preserve itself when attacked by an unarmed, undisciplined, unorganized minority. All this talk about the dissolution of the Union is humbug, nothing but folly. We do not want to dissolve the Union, you shall not. While the Republican Party was much cast down by the election of Buchanan in November, the Democrats found significant cause for apprehension in the unexpected strength with which the Fremont ticket had been supported in the free states. Especially was this true in Illinois, where the adherents of Fremont and Fillmore had formed a fusion and thereby elected a Republican governor and state officers. One of the strong elements of Mr. Lincoln's leadership was the cheerful hope that he was always able to inspire in his followers, in the correct political instincts of popular majorities. This trait was happily exemplified in a speech he made at a Republican banquet in Chicago about a month after the presidential election. Recalling the pregnant fact that though Buchanan gained a majority of the electoral vote, he was in a minority by about 400,000 of the popular vote for president, Mr. Lincoln thus summed up the chances of Republican success in the future. Our government rests in public opinion. Whoever can change public opinion can change the government practically just so much. Public opinion on any subject always has a central idea, from which all its minor thoughts radiate. That central idea in our political public opinion at the beginning was, and until recently has continued to be, the equality of man. And although it has always submitted patiently to whatever of inequality there seemed to be as a matter of actual necessity, its constant working has been a steady progress towards the practical equality of all men. The late presidential election was a struggle by one party to discard that central idea and to substitute for it the opposite idea that slavery is right in the abstract, the workings of which as a central idea may be the perpetuity of human slavery and its extension to all countries and colors. All of us who did not vote for Mr. Buchanan taken together are a majority of 400,000. But in the late contest we were divided between Fremont and Fillmore. Can we not come together for the future? Let every one who really believes and is resolved that free society is not and shall not be a failure, and who can conscientiously declare that in the past contest he has done only what he thought best, let every such one have charity to believe that every other one can say as much. Thus let bygones be bygones, let past differences as nothing be, and with steady eye on the real issue, let us reinaugurate the good old central ideas of the Republic. We can do it. The human heart is with us, God is with us. 
we shall again be able not to declare that all states as states are equal, nor yet all citizens as citizens are equal, but to renew the broader, better declaration, including both these and much more, that all men are created equal. End of chapter 7 Recording by Ernst Schnell in Aberdeen Life of Abraham Lincoln This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John George Nicolay Chapter 8 Buchanan Elected President The Dred Scott Decision Douglas's Springfield Speech, 1857 Lincoln's Answering Speech Criticism of Dred Scott Decision Kansas Civil War, Buchanan Appoints Walker, Walker's Letter on Kansas, The Lecompton Constitution, Revolt of Douglas. The election of 1856 once more restored the Democratic Party to full political control in national affairs. James Buchanan was elected president to succeed Pierce. The Senate continued, as before, to have a decided Democratic majority, and a clear Democratic majority of 25 was chosen to the House of Representatives to succeed the heavy opposition majority of the previous Congress. Though the new House did not organize till a year after it was elected, the certainty of its coming action was sufficient not only to restore, but greatly to accelerate the pro-slavery reaction begun by the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. This impending drift of national policy now received a powerful impetus by an act of the third coordinate branch, the Judicial Department of the Government. Very unexpectedly to the public at large, the Supreme Court of the United States, a few days after Buchanan's inauguration, announced its judgment in what quickly became famous as the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott, a Negro slave in Missouri, sued for his freedom on the ground that his master had taken him to reside in the state of Illinois and the territory of Wisconsin, where slavery was prohibited by law. The question had been twice decided by Missouri courts, once for and then against Dred Scott's claim. And now the Supreme Court of the United States, after hearing the case twice elaborately argued by eminent counsel, finally decided that Dred Scott, being a Negro, could not become a citizen, and therefore was not entitled to bring suit. This branch, under ordinary precedent, simply threw the case out of court. But in addition, the decision, proceeding with what lawyers call obiter dictum, went on to declare that under the Constitution of the United States, neither Congress nor a territorial legislature possessed power to prohibit slavery in federal territories. The whole country immediately flared up with the agitation of the slavery question in this new form. The South defended the decision with heat, the North protested against it with indignation, and the controversy was greatly intensified by a phrase in the opinion of Chief Justice Taney that at the time of the Declaration of Independence, Negroes were considered by general public opinion to be so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. This decision of the Supreme Court placed Senator Douglas in a curious dilemma. While it served to endorse and fortify his course in repealing the Missouri Compromise, it, on the other hand, totally negatived his theory by which he had sought to make the repeal palatable, that the people of a territory, by the exercise of his great principle of popular sovereignty, could decide the slavery question for themselves. But, being a subtle sophist, he sought to maintain a show of consistency by an ingenious evasion. In the month of June following the decision, he made a speech at Springfield, Illinois, in which he tentatively announced what in the next year became widely celebrated as his Freeport Doctrine, and was immediately denounced by his political confreres of the South as serious party heterodoxy, first lauding the Supreme Court as the highest judicial tribunal on earth, and declaring that violent resistance to its decrees must be put down by the strong arm of the government. He went on thus to define a master's right to his slave in Kansas. While the right continues in full force under the guarantees of the Constitution, and cannot be divested or alienated by an act of Congress, it necessarily remains a barren and a worthless right unless sustained, protected, and enforced by appropriate police regulations and local legislation prescribing adequate remedies for its violation. These regulations and remedies must necessarily depend entirely upon the will and wishes of the people of the territory, as they can only be prescribed by the local legislatures. 
Hence the great principle of popular sovereignty and self-government is sustained and firmly established by the authority of this decision. Both the legal and political aspects of the new question immediately engaged the earnest attention of Mr. Lincoln, and his splendid power of analysis set its ominous portent in a strong light. He made a speech in reply to Douglas about two weeks after, subjecting the Dred Scott decision to a searching and eloquent criticism. He said, That decision declares two propositions. First, that a Negro cannot sue in the United States courts and secondly that congress cannot prohibit slavery in the territories it was made by a divided court dividing differently on the different points judge douglas does not discuss the merits of the decision and in that respect i shall follow his example believing i could no more improve on mclean and curtis than he could on taney we think the dred scott decision was erroneous we know the court that made it has often overruled its own decisions and we shall do what we can to have it overrule this we offer no resistance to it. If this important decision had been made by the unanimous concurrence of the judges, and without any apparent partisan bias, and in accordance with legal public expectation, and with the steady practice of the departments throughout our history, and had been in no part based on assumed historical facts which are not really true, or if, wanting in some of these, it had been before the court more than once, and had there been affirmed and reaffirmed through a course of years, it then might be, perhaps would be, factious, nay, even revolutionary, not to acquiesce in it as a precedent. But when, as is true, we find it wanting in all these claims to the public confidence, it is not resistance, it is not factious, it is not even disrespectful, to treat it as not having yet quite established a settled doctrine for the country." The Chief Justice does not directly assert, but plainly assumes, as a fact, that the public estimate of the black man is more favorable now than it was in the days of the Revolution. This assumption is a mistake. In some trifling particulars the condition of that race has been ameliorated, but as a whole in this country the change between then and now is decidedly the other way, and their ultimate destiny has never appeared so hopeless as in the last three or four years. In two of the five states, New Jersey and North Carolina, that then gave the free Negro the right of voting, the right has since been taken away. And in the third, New York, it has been greatly abridged, while it has not been extended, so far as I know, to a single additional state, though the number of the states has more than doubled. In those days, as I understand, masters could, at their own pleasure, emancipate their slaves but since then such legal restraints have been made upon emancipation as to amount almost to prohibition in those days legislatures held the unquestioned power to abolish slavery in their respective states but now it is becoming quite fashionable for state constitutions to withhold that power from the legislatures in those days by common consent the spread of the black man's bondage to the new countries was prohibited but now Congress decides that it will not continue the prohibition, and the Supreme Court decides that it could not if it would. In those days our Declaration of Independence was held sacred by all, and thought to include all. But now, to aid in making the bondage of the Negro universal and eternal, it is assailed and sneered at and construed, and hawked at and torn, till, if its framers could rise from their graves, they could not at all recognize it. All the powers of earth seem rapidly combining against him. Mammon is after him, ambition follows, philosophy follows, and the theology of the day is fast joining the cry. They have him in his prison house, they have searched his person, and left no prying instrument with him. One after another they have closed the heavy iron doors upon him, and now they have him, as it were, bolted in with a lock of a hundred keys, which can never be unlocked without the concurrence of every key, the keys in the hands of a hundred different men, and they scattered to a hundred different and distant places, and they stand musing as to what invention in all the dominions of mind and matter can be produced to make the impossibility of his escape more complete than it is. There is not room to quote the many other equally forcible points in Mr. Lincoln's speech. Our narrative must proceed to other significant events in the great pro-slavery reaction. Thus far the Kansas experiment had produced nothing but agitation, strife, and bloodshed. First the storm in Congress over repeal, then a mad rush of immigration to occupy the territory. This was followed by the border ruffian invasions, in which Missouri voters elected a bogus territorial legislature, and the bogus legislature enacted a code of bogus laws. 
In turn, the more rapid immigration from free states filled the territory with a majority of free state voters, who quickly organized a compact free state party, which sent a free state constitution, known as the Topeka Constitution, to Congress, and applied for admission. This movement proved barren, because the two houses of Congress were divided in sentiment. Meanwhile, President Pierce recognized the bogus laws, and issued proclamations declaring the free state movement illegal and insurrectionary and the Free State Party had, in its turn, baffled the enforcement of the bogus laws, partly by concerted action of non-conformity and neglect, partly by open defiance. The whole finally culminated in a chronic border war between Missouri raiders on one hand and Free State guerrillas on the other, and it became necessary to send federal troops to check the disorder. These were instructed by Jefferson Davis, then Secretary of War, that rebellion must be crushed. The future Confederate president little suspected the tremendous prophetic import of his order. The most significant illustration of the underlying spirit of the struggle was that President Pierce had successively appointed three Democratic governors for the territory, who, starting with pro-slavery bias, all became free state partisans, and were successively insulted and driven from the territory by the pro-slavery faction, when, in manly protest, they refused to carry out the behests of the Missouri conspiracy. After a three years' struggle, neither faction had been successful, neither party was satisfied, and the administration of Pierce bequeathed to its successor the same old question embittered by rancor and defeat. President Buchanan began his administration with a boldly announced pro-slavery policy. In his inaugural address, he invoked the popular acceptance of the Dred Scott decision, which he already knew was coming and a few months later declared in a public letter that slavery exists in Kansas under the Constitution of the United States. How it ever could have been seriously doubted is a mystery. He chose for the governorship of Kansas Robert J. Walker, a citizen of Mississippi of national fame and of pronounced pro-slavery views, who accepted his dangerous mission only upon condition that a new constitution, to be formed for that state, must be honestly submitted to the real voters of Kansas for adoption or rejection. President Buchanan and his advisers, as well as Senator Douglas, accepted this condition repeatedly and emphatically. But when the new governor went to the territory, he soon became convinced, and reported to his chief, that to make a slave state of Kansas was a delusive hope. Indeed, he wrote, it is universally admitted here that the only real question is this, whether Kansas shall be a conservative, constitutional, democratic, and ultimately free state, or whether it shall be a republican and abolition state. As a compensation for the disappointment, however, he wrote, later, direct to the president, but we must have a slave state out of the southwestern Indian territory, and then a calm will follow, Cuba be acquired with the acquiescence of the North, and your administration, having in reality settled the slavery question, be regarded in all time to come as a re-signing and re-sealing of the Constitution. I shall be pleased soon to hear from you. Cuba, Cuba, in Puerto Rico if possible, should be the countersign of your administration, and it will close in a blaze of glory. And the governor was doubtless much gratified to receive the president's unqualified endorsement in reply. On the question of submitting the Constitution to the bona fide resident settlers of Kansas, I am willing to stand or fall. The sequel to this heroic posturing of the chief magistrate is one of the most humiliating chapters in American politics. Attendant circumstances leave little doubt that a portion of Mr. Buchanan's cabinet, in secret league and correspondence with the pro-slavery Missouri-Kansas cabal, aided and abetted the framing and adoption of what is known to history as the Lecompton Constitution, an organic instrument of a radical pro-slavery type, that its pretended submission to popular vote was under phraseology, and in combination with such gigantic electoral frauds and dictatorial procedure as to render the whole transaction a mockery of popular government. Still worse, that President Buchanan himself, proving too weak in insight and will to detect the intrigue or resist the influence of his malign counselors, abandoned his solemn pledges to Governor Walker, adopted the Lecompton Constitution as an administration measure, and recommended it to Congress in a special message, announcing dogmatically, Kansas is therefore at this moment as much a slave state as Georgia or South Carolina. The radical pro-slavery attitude thus assumed by President Buchanan and Southern leaders threw the Democratic Party of the Free States into serious disarray, while upon Senator Douglas the blow fell with the force of party treachery, 
almost of personal indignity. The Dred Scott decision had rudely brushed aside his theory of popular sovereignty, and now the Lecompton Constitution proceedings brutally trampled it down in practice. The disaster overtook him, too, at a critical moment. His senatorial term was about to expire. The next Illinois legislature would elect his successor. The prospect was none too bright for him, for at the late presidential election Illinois had chosen Republican state officers. He was compelled either to break his pledges to the Democratic voters of Illinois, or to lead a revolt against President Buchanan and the Democratic leaders in Congress. Party disgrace at Washington, or popular disgrace in Illinois, were the alternatives before him. To lose his re-election to the Senate would almost certainly end his public career. When, therefore, Congress met in December 1857, Douglas boldly attacked and denounced the Lecompton Constitution, even before the President had recommended it in his special message. "'Stand by the doctrine,' he said, "'that leaves the people perfectly free to form and regulate their institutions for themselves, in their own way, and your party will be united and irresistible in power. If Kansas wants a slave state constitution, she has a right to it.' If she wants a free state constitution, she has a right to it. It is none of my business which way the slavery clause is decided. I care not whether it is voted down or voted up. Do you suppose, after the pledges of my honor, that I would go for that principle and leave the people to vote as they choose, that I would now degrade myself by voting one way if the slavery clause be voted down, and another way if it be voted up? I care not how that vote may stand. Ignore Lecompton. Ignore Topeka. Treat both those party movements as irregular and void. Pass a fair bill, the one that we framed ourselves when we were acting as a unit. Have a fair election, and you will have peace in the Democratic Party, and peace throughout the country in ninety days. The people want a fair vote. They will never be satisfied without it. But if this Constitution is to be forced down our throats in violation of the fundamental principle of free government under a mode of submission that is a mockery and insult, I will resist it to the last." Walker, the fourth Democratic governor, who had now been sacrificed to the interests of the Kansas pro-slavery cabal, also wrote a sharp letter of resignation denouncing the Lecompton fraud in policy. And such was the indignation aroused in the free states, that although the Senate passed the Lecompton bill, twenty-two Northern Democrats joining their vote to that of the Republicans, the measure was defeated in the House of Representatives. The President and his Southern partisans bitterly resented this defeat and the schism between them on the one hand, and Douglas and his adherents on the other, became permanent and irreconcilable. End of chapter 8《Of a Short Life of Abraham Lincoln》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 9. The Senatorial Contest in Illinois. House Divided Against Itself Speech. The Lincoln-Douglas Debates. The Freeport Doctrine. Douglas Deposed from Chairmanship of Committee on Territories. Benjamin on Douglas. Lincoln's Popular Majority. Douglas Gains Legislature Greeley, Crittenden, et al. The Fight Must Go On Douglas's Southern Speeches Senator Brown's Questions Lincoln's Warnings Against Popular Sovereignty The War of Pamphlets Lincoln's Ohio Speeches The John Brown Raid Lincoln's Comment the hostility of the Buchanan administration to Douglas for his part in defeating the Lecompton Constitution and the multiplying chances against him served only to stimulate his followers in Illinois to greater efforts to secure his re-election. Precisely the same elements inspired the hope and increased the enthusiasm of the Republicans of the state to accomplish his defeat. For a candidate to oppose the little giant, there could be no rival in the Republican ranks to Abraham Lincoln. He had, in 1854, yielded his priority of claim to Trumbull. He alone had successfully encountered Douglas in debate. The political events themselves seemed to have selected and pitted these two champions against each other. 
Therefore, when the Illinois State Convention on June 16, 1858, passed by acclamation a separate resolution that Abraham Lincoln is the first and only choice of the Republicans of Illinois for the United States Senate as the successor of Stephen A. Douglas, it only recorded the well-known judgment of the party. After its routine work was finished, the convention adjourned to meet again in the hall of the State House at Springfield at eight o'clock in the evening. At that hour Mr. Lincoln appeared before the assembled delegates and delivered a carefully studied speech, which has become historic. After a few opening sentences, he uttered the following significant prediction. Quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south." End of quote. Then followed his critical analysis of the legislative objects and consequences of the Nebraska Bill and the judicial effects and doctrines of the Dred Scott decision with their attendant and related incidents. The first of these had opened all the national territory to slavery. The second established the constitutional interpretation that neither Congress nor a territorial legislature could exclude slavery from any United States territory. The President had declared Kansas to be already practically a slave state. Douglas had announced that he did not care whether slavery was voted down or voted up. Adding to these many other indications of current politics, Mr. Lincoln proceeded, quote, Put this and that together, and we have another nice little niche, which we may ere long see filled with another Supreme Court decision declaring that the Constitution of the United States does not permit a state to exclude slavery from its limits. Such a decision is all that slavery now lacks of being alike lawful in all the states. We shall lie down pleasantly dreaming that the people of Missouri are on the verge of making their state free, and we shall awake to the reality instead that the Supreme Court has made Illinois a slave state. End of quote. To avert this danger, Mr. Lincoln declared it was the duty of Republicans to overthrow both Douglas and the Buchanan political dynasty. Quote, Two years ago the Republicans of the nation mustered over 1,300,000 strong. We did this under the single impulse of resistance to a common danger, with every external circumstance against us. Of strange, discordant, and even hostile elements we gathered from the four winds, and formed and fought the battle through, under the constant hot fire of a disciplined, proud, and pampered enemy. Did we brave all then to falter now? Now when that same enemy is wavering, dissevered, and belligerent? The result is not doubtful. We shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsels may accelerate or mistakes delay it, but sooner or later the victory is sure to come. End of quote. Lincoln's speech excited the greatest interest everywhere throughout the free states. The grave peril he so clearly pointed out came home to the people of the North almost with the force of a revelation, and thereafter their eyes were fixed upon the Illinois senatorial campaign with undivided attention. Another incident also drew to it the equal notice and interest of the politicians of the slave states. Within a month from the date of Lincoln's speech, Douglas returned from Washington and began his campaign of active speech-making in Illinois. The fame he had acquired as the champion of the Nebraska Bill, and, more recently, the prominence into which his opposition to the Lecompton fraud had lifted him in Congress, attracted immense crowds to his meetings, and for a few days it seemed as if the mere contagion of popular enthusiasm would submerge all intelligent political discussion. To counteract this, Mr. Lincoln, at the advice of his leading friends, 
sent him a letter challenging him to joint public debate. Douglas accepted the challenge, but with evident hesitation, and it was arranged that they should jointly address the same meetings at seven towns in the state, on dates extending through August, September, and October. The terms were that, alternately, one should speak an hour in opening, the other an hour and a half in reply, and the first again have half an hour in closing. This placed the contestants upon an equal footing before their audiences. Douglas's senatorial prestige afforded him no advantage. Face to face, with the partisans of both, gathered in immense numbers and alert with critical and jealous watchfulness, there was no evading the square, cold, rigid test of skill in argument and truth in principle. The processions and banners, the music and fireworks of both parties, were stilled and forgotten, while the audience listened with high-strung nerves to the intellectual combat of three hours' duration. It would be impossible to give the scope and spirit of these famous debates in the space allotted to these pages, but one of the turning points in the oratorical contest needs particular mention. Northern Illinois, peopled mostly from free states, and southern Illinois, peopled mostly from slave states, were radically opposed in sentiment on the slavery question. Even the old Whigs of central Illinois had, to a large extent, joined the Democratic Party, because of their ineradicable prejudice against what they stigmatized as abolitionism. To take advantage of this prejudice, Douglas, in his opening speech in the first debate at Ottawa in northern Illinois, propounded to Lincoln a series of questions designed to commit him to strong anti-slavery doctrines. He wanted to know whether Mr. Lincoln stood pledged to the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law, against the admission of any more slave states, to the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, to the prohibition of the slave trade between different states, to prohibit slavery in all the territories, to oppose the acquisition of any new territory unless slavery were first prohibited therein. In their second joint debate at Freeport, Lincoln answered that he was pledged to none of these propositions except the prohibition of slavery in all territories of the United States. In turn, he propounded four questions to Douglas, the second of which was, quote, Can the people of a United States territory, in any lawful way, against the wish of any citizen of the United States, exclude slavery from its limits prior to the formation of a state constitution. End of quote. Mr. Lincoln had long and carefully studied the import and effect of this interrogatory, and nearly a month before, in a private letter, accurately foreshadowed Douglas's course upon it. You shall have hard work, he wrote, to get him directly to the point whether a territorial legislature has or has not the power to exclude slavery. But if you succeed in bringing him to it, though he will be compelled to say it possesses no such power, he will instantly take ground that slavery cannot actually exist in the territories unless the people desire it, and so give it protection by territorial legislation. If this offends the South, he will let it offend them, as at all events he means to hold on to his chances in Illinois. On the night before the Freeport debate, the question had also been considered in a hurried caucus of Lincoln's party friends. They all advised against propounding it, saying, If you do, you can never be senator. Gentlemen, replied Lincoln, I am killing larger game. If Douglas answers, he can never be president, and the Battle of 1860 is worth a hundred of this. As Lincoln had predicted, Douglas had no resource but to repeat the sophism he had hastily invented in his Springfield speech of the previous year. It matters not, replied he, what way the Supreme Court may hereafter decide as to the abstract question whether slavery may or may not go into a territory under the Constitution. The people have the lawful means to introduce it or exclude it, as they please, for the reason that slavery cannot exist a day or an hour anywhere unless it is supported by local police regulations. 
those police regulations can only be established by the local legislature, and if the people are opposed to slavery, they will elect representatives to that body who will by unfriendly legislation effectually prevent the introduction of it into their midst. If, on the contrary, they are for it, their legislation will favor its extension. Hence, no matter what the decision of the Supreme Court may be on that abstract question, still the right of the people to make a slave territory or a free territory is perfect and complete under the Nebraska Bill. In the course of the next joint debate at Jonesboro, Mr. Lincoln easily disposed of this sophism by showing 1. that practically slavery had worked its way into territories without police regulations in almost every instance. 2. That United States courts were established to protect and enforce rights under the Constitution. 3. That members of a territorial legislature could not violate their oath to support the Constitution of the United States. And 4. That in default of legislative support, Congress would be bound to supply it for any right under the Constitution. The serious aspect of the matter, however, to Douglas was not the criticism of the Republicans, but the view taken by Southern Democratic leaders of his Freeport Doctrine, or Doctrine of Unfriendly Legislation. His opposition to the Lecompton Constitution in the Senate, grievous stumbling block to their schemes as it had proved, might yet be passed over as a reckless breach of party discipline. But this new announcement at Freeport was unpardonable doctrinal heresy, as rank as the abolitionism of Giddings and Lovejoy. The Freeport Joint Debate took place August 27, 1858, when Congress convened on the first Monday in December of the same year, one of the first acts of the Democratic Senators was to put him under party ban by removing him from the chairmanship of the Committee on Territories, a position he had held for eleven years. In due time, also, the Southern leaders broke up the Charleston Convention rather than permit him to be nominated for President, and three weeks later, Senator Benjamin of Louisiana frankly set forth, in a Senate speech, the light in which they viewed his apostasy. Quote, we accuse him for this, to wit, that having bargained with us upon a point upon which we were at issue, that it should be considered a judicial point, that he would abide the decision, that he would act under the decision, and consider it a doctrine of the party, that having said that to us here in the Senate, he went home, and under the stress of a local election, his knees gave way, his whole person trembled, his adversary stood upon principle and was beaten, and lo, he is the candidate of a mighty party for the presidency of the United States. The senator from Illinois faltered. He got the prize for which he faltered, but lo, the grand prize of his ambition today slips from his grasp because of his faltering in his former contest, and his success in the canvas for the Senate, purchased for an ignoble price, has cost him the loss of the presidency of the United States. End of quote. In addition to the seven joint debates, both Lincoln and Douglas made speeches at separate meetings of their own during almost every day of the three months' campaign, and sometimes two or three speeches a day. At the election which was held on November 2, 1858, a legislature was chosen containing 54 Democrats and 46 Republicans, notwithstanding the fact that the Republicans had a plurality of 3,821 on the popular vote. But the apportionment was based on the census of 1850 and did not reflect recent changes in political sentiment, which, if fairly represented, would have given them an increased strength of from six to ten members in the legislature. Another circumstance had great influence in causing Lincoln's defeat. Douglas's opposition to the Lecompton Constitution in Congress had won him great sympathy among a few Republican leaders in the eastern states. It was even whispered that Seward wished Douglas to succeed as a strong rebuke to the Buchanan administration. The most potent expression and influence of this feeling came, however, from another quarter. 
Senator Crittenden of Kentucky, who, since Clay's death in 1852, was the acknowledged leader of what remained of the Whig Party, wrote a letter during the campaign openly advocating the re-election of Douglas, and this, doubtless, influenced the vote of all the Illinois Whigs who had not yet formally joined the Republican Party. Lincoln's own analysis gives, perhaps, the clearest view of the unusual political conditions. Quote, Douglas had three or four very distinguished men of the most extreme anti-slavery views of any men in the Republican Party expressing their desire for his re-election to the Senate last year. That would of itself have seemed to be a little wonderful, but what wonder is heightened when we see that Wise of Virginia, a man exactly opposed to them, a man who believes in the divine right of slavery, was also expressing his desire that Douglas should be re-elected that another man that may be said to be kindred to wise, Mr. Breckinridge, the vice president, and of your own state, was also agreeing with the anti-slavery men in the North that Douglas ought to be re-elected. Still to heighten the wonder, a senator from Kentucky, whom I have always loved with an affection as tender and as endearing as I have ever loved any man, who was opposed to the anti-slavery men for reasons which seemed sufficient to him, and equally opposed to Wise and Breckinridge, was writing letters to Illinois to secure the re-election of Douglas. Now that all these conflicting elements should be brought, while at daggers points with one another, to support him, is a feat that is worthy for you to note and consider. It is quite probable that each of these classes of men thought by the re-election of Douglas their peculiar views would gain something. It is probable that the anti-slavery men thought their views would gain something that Wise and Breckinridge thought so too, as regards their opinions. That Mr. Crittenden thought that his views would gain something, although he was opposed to both these other men. It is probable that each and all of them thought they were using Douglas, and it is yet an unsolved problem whether he was not using them all. End of quote. Lincoln, though beaten in his race for the Senate, was by no means dismayed, nor did he lose his faith in the ultimate triumph of the cause he had so ably championed. Writing to a friend, he said, quote, You doubtless have seen ere this the result of the election here. Of course I wished, but I did not much expect a better result. I am glad I made the late race. It gave me a hearing on the great and durable question of the age, which I could have had in no other way. And though I now sink out of view and shall be forgotten, I believe I have made some marks which will tell for the cause of civil liberty long after I am gone. End of quote. And to another, quote, Yours of the 13th was received some days ago. The fight must go on. The cause of civil liberty must not be surrendered at the end of one or even one hundred defeats. Douglas had the ingenuity to be supported in the late contest both as the best means to break down and to uphold the slave interest. No ingenuity can keep these antagonistic elements in harmony long. Another explosion will soon come. End of quote. In his house divided against itself speech, Lincoln had emphatically cautioned Republicans not to be led on a false trail by the opposition Douglas had made to the Lecompton Constitution, that his temporary quarrel with the Buchanan administration could not be relied upon to help overthrow that pro-slavery dynasty. Quote, How can he oppose the advances of slavery? He don't care anything about it. His avowed mission is impressing the public heart to care nothing about it. Whenever, if ever, he and we can come together on principle, so that our great cause may have assistance from his great ability, I hope to have interposed no adventitious obstacle. But clearly he is not now with us. He does not pretend to be. He does not promise ever to be. Our cause, then, must be entrusted to, and conducted by, its own undoubted friends, those whose hands are free, whose hearts are in the work, who do care for the result. End of quote. Since the result of the Illinois senatorial campaign had assured the re-election of Douglas to the Senate, Lincoln's sage advice acquired a double significance and value. 
almost immediately after the close of the campaign, Douglas took a trip through the southern states, and in speeches made by him at Memphis, at New Orleans, and at Baltimore, sought to regain the confidence of southern politicians by taking decidedly advanced ground toward southern views on the slavery question. On the sugar plantations of Louisiana, he said, it was not a question between the white man and the negro, but between the negro and the crocodile. He would say that between the negro and the crocodile he took the side of the negro, but between the negro and the white man he would go for the white man. The Almighty had drawn a line on this continent, on the one side of which the soil must be cultivated by slave labor, on the other by white labor. That line did not run at thirty-six degrees and thirty minutes the Missouri Compromise Line, for thirty-six degrees and thirty minutes runs over mountains and through valleys. But this slave line, he said, meanders in the sugar fields and plantations of the South, and the people living in their different localities and in the territories must determine for themselves whether their middle belt were best adapted to slavery or free labor. He advocated the eventual annexation of Cuba and Central America. Still going a step further, he had laid down a far-reaching principle. It is a law of humanity, he said, a law of civilization that whenever a man or a race of men show themselves incapable of managing their own affairs, they must consent to be governed by those who are capable of performing the duty. In accordance with this principle, I assert that the Negro race, under all circumstances, at all times, and in all countries, has shown itself incapable of self-government. This pro-slavery coquetting, however, availed him nothing, as he felt himself obliged in the same speeches to defend his Freeport doctrine. Having taken his seat in Congress, Senator Brown of Mississippi, toward the close of the short session, catechized him sharply on this point. If the territorial legislature refuses to act, he inquired, will you act? If it pass unfriendly acts, will you pass friendly? If it pass laws hostile to slavery, will you annul them and substitute laws favoring slavery in their stead? There was no evading these direct questions, and Douglas answered frankly. Quote, I tell you, gentlemen of the South, in all candor, I do not believe a Democratic candidate can ever carry any one Democratic state of the North on the platform that it is the duty of the federal government to force the people of a territory to have slavery when they do not want it." End of quote. An extended discussion between Northern and Southern Democratic Senators followed the colloquy, which showed that the Freeport Doctrine had opened up an irreparable schism between the Northern and Southern Whigs of the Democratic Party. In all the speeches made by Douglas during his Southern tour, he continually referred to Mr. Lincoln as the champion of abolitionism, and to his doctrines as the platform of the abolition or Republican Party. The practical effect of this course was to extend and prolong the Illinois senatorial campaign of 1858, to expand it to national breadth, and gradually to merge it in the coming presidential campaign. The effect of this was not only to keep before the public the position of Lincoln as the Republican champion of Illinois, but also gradually to lift him into general recognition as a national leader. Throughout the year 1859, politicians and newspapers came to look upon Lincoln as the one antagonist who could at all times be relied on to answer and refute the Douglas arguments. His propositions were so forcible and direct his phraseology so apt and fresh that they held the attention and excited comment. A letter written by him in answer to an invitation to attend a celebration of Jefferson's birthday in Boston contains some notable passages. Quote, Soberly, it is now no child's play to save the principles of Jefferson from total overthrow in this nation. One would state with great confidence that he could convince any sane child that the simpler propositions of Euclid are true, but nevertheless he would fail utterly with one who should deny the definitions and axioms. The principles of Jefferson are the definitions and axioms of free society, and yet they are denied and evaded with no small show of success. 
one dashingly calls them glittering generalities, another bluntly calls them self-evident lies, and others insidiously argue that they apply to superior races. These expressions, differing in form, are identical in object and effect. The supplanting of the principles of free government, and restoring those of classification, caste, and legitimacy. They would delight a convocation of crowned heads plotting against the people. They are the vanguard, the miners and sappers of returning despotism. We must repulse them, or they will subjugate us. This is a world of compensation, and he who would be no slave must consent to have no slave. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves, and under a just God cannot long retain it. End of quote. Douglas's quarrel with the Buchanan administration had led many Republicans to hope that they might be able to utilize his name and his theory of popular sovereignty to aid them in their local campaigns. Lincoln knew from his recent experience the peril of this delusive party strategy, and was constant and earnest in his warnings against adopting it. In a little speech after the Chicago municipal election on March 1, 1859, he said, quote, if we, the Republicans of this state, had made Judge Douglas our candidate for the Senate of the United States last year, and had elected him, there would today be no Republican Party in this Union. Let the Republican Party of Illinois dally with Judge Douglas, let them fall in behind him and make him their candidate, and they do not absorb him, he absorbs them. They would come out at the end, all Douglas men, all claimed by him as having endorsed every one of his doctrines upon the great subject with which the whole nation is engaged at this hour, that the question of Negro slavery is simply a question of dollars and cents, that the Almighty has drawn a line across the continent on one side of which labor, the cultivation of the soil, must always be performed by slaves. It would be claimed that we, like him, do not care whether slavery is voted up or voted down. Had we made him our candidate, and given him a great majority, we should never have heard an end of declarations by him that we had endorsed all these dogmas." End of quote. To a Kansas friend he wrote on May 14, 1859, quote, You will probably adopt resolutions in the nature of a platform. I think the only temptation will be to lower the Republican standard in order to gather recruits. In my judgment, such a step would be a serious mistake, and open a gap through which more would pass out than pass in. And this would be the same whether the letting down should be in deference to Douglasism or to the Southern opposition element. Either would surrender the object of the Republican organization, the preventing of the spread and nationalization of slavery. Let a union be attempted on the basis of ignoring the slavery question and magnify other questions which the people are just not caring about, and it will result in gaining no single electoral vote in the South and losing everyone in the North. End of quote. To Schuyler Colfax, afterward vice president, he said in a letter dated July 6, 1859, quote, my main object in such conversation would be to hedge against divisions in the Republican ranks generally, and particularly for the contest of 1860. The point of danger is the temptation in different localities to platform for something which will be popular just there, but which, nevertheless, will be a firebrand elsewhere and especially in a national convention. As instances, the movement against foreigners in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire to make obedience to the fugitive slave law punishable as a crime, in Ohio to repeal the fugitive slave law, and squatter sovereignty in Kansas. In these things there is explosive matter enough to blow up half a dozen national conventions, if it gets into them, and what gets very rife outside of conventions is very likely to find its way into them." End of quote. And again, to another warm friend in Columbus, Ohio, he wrote in a letter dated July 28, 1859, quote, There is another thing our friends are doing which gives me some uneasiness. 
it is their leaning toward popular sovereignty. There are three substantial objections to this. First, no party can command respect which sustains this year what it opposed last. Secondly, Douglas, who is the most dangerous enemy of liberty, because he is the most insidious one, would have left little support in the North, and by consequence no capital to trade on in the South, if it were not for his friends thus magnifying him and his humbug. But lastly and chiefly, Douglas's popular sovereignty, accepted by the public mind as a just principle, nationalizes slavery and revives the African slave trade inevitably. Taking slaves into new territories and buying slaves in Africa are identical things, identical rights or identical wrongs, and the argument which establishes one will establish the other. Try a thousand years for a sound reason why Congress shall not hinder the people of Kansas from having slaves, and when you have found it, it will be an equally good one why Congress should not hinder the people of Georgia from importing slaves from Africa. End of quote. An important election occurred in the state of Ohio in the autumn of 1859, and during the canvass, Douglas made two speeches in which, as usual, his pointed attacks were directed against Lincoln by name. Quite naturally, the Ohio Republicans called Lincoln to answer him and the marked impression created by Lincoln's replies showed itself not alone in their unprecedented circulation in print and newspapers and pamphlets, but also in the decided success which the Ohio Republicans gained at the polls. About the same time, also, Douglas printed a long political essay in Harper's Magazine, using as a text quotation from Lincoln's House Divided Against Itself speech, and Seward's Rochester speech defining the irrepressible conflict. Attorney General Black of President Buchanan's cabinet here entered the lists with an anonymously printed pamphlet in pungent criticism of Douglas's Harper essay, which again was followed by reply and rejoinder on both sides. Into this field of overheated political controversy, the news of the John Brown raid at Harper's Ferry on Sunday, October 19, fell with startling portent. The scattering and tragic fighting in the streets of the little town on Monday, the dramatic capture of the fanatical leader on Tuesday by a detachment of Federal Marines under the command of Robert E. Lee, the famous Confederate general of subsequent years, the undignified haste of his trial and condemnation by the Virginia authorities, the interviews of Governor Wise, Senator Mason, and Representative Vallandigham with the prisoner, his sentence and execution on the gallows on December 2, and the hysterical laudations of his acts by a few prominent and extreme abolitionists in the East, kept public opinion, both North and South, in an inflamed and feverish state for nearly six weeks. Mr. Lincoln's habitual freedom from passion, and the steady and common-sense judgment he applied to this exciting event, which threw almost everybody into an extreme of feeling or utterance, are well illustrated by the tempered criticism he made of it a few months later. Quote, John Brown's effort was peculiar. It was not a slave insurrection. It was an attempt by white men to get up a revolt among slaves, in which the slaves refused to participate. In fact, it was so absurd that the slaves, with all their ignorance, saw plainly enough it could not succeed. That affair, in its philosophy, corresponds with the many attempts, related in history, at the assassination of kings and emperors. An enthusiast broods over the oppression of a people till he fancies himself commissioned by heaven to liberate them. He ventures the attempt which ends in little else than his own execution. Orsini's attempt on Louis Napoleon and John Brown's attempt at Harper's Ferry were in their philosophy precisely the same. The eagerness to cast blame on old England in the one case and on New England in the other does not disprove the sameness of the two things. End of chapter 9 Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois
Chapter 10 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Schnell. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 10 Lincoln's Kansas Speeches, The Cooper Institute Speech, New England speeches, the Democratic schism, Senator Brown's resolutions, Jefferson Davis's resolutions, the Charleston Convention, majority and minority reports, cotton state delegations secede, Charleston Convention adjourns, Democratic Baltimore Convention splits, Breckenridge nominated, Douglas nominated, Bell nominated by Union Constitutional Convention, Chicago Convention, Lincoln's letters to Pickett and Judd, the pivotal states, Lincoln nominated. During the month of December 1859, Mr. Lincoln was invited to the territory of Kansas, where he made speeches at a number of its new and growing towns. In these speeches, he laid special emphasis upon the necessity of maintaining undiminished the vigor of the Republican organization and the high plane of the Republican doctrine. We want and must have, said he, a national policy as to slavery which deals with it as being a wrong. Whoever would prevent slavery becoming national and perpetual yields all when he yields to a policy which treats it either as being right or as being a matter of indifference. To effect our main object, we have to employ auxiliary means. We must hold conventions, adopt platforms, select candidates and carry elections. At every step we must be true to the main purpose. If we adopt a platform falling short of our principle, or elect a man rejecting our principle, we not only take nothing affirmative by our success, but we draw upon us the positive embarrassment of seeming ourselves to have abandoned our principle. A still more important service, however, in giving the Republican presidential campaign of 1860 precise form and issue was rendered by him during the first three months of the new year. The public mind had become so preoccupied with the dominant subject of national politics that a committee of enthusiastic young Republicans of New York and Brooklyn arranged a course of public lectures by prominent statesmen and Mr. Lincoln was invited to deliver the third one of the series. The meeting took place in the hall of the Cooper Institute in New York on the evening of February 27, 1860, and the audience was made up of ladies and gentlemen comprising the leading representatives of the wealth, culture and influence of the great metropolis. Mr. Lincoln's name and arguments had filled so large a space in Eastern newspapers, both friendly and hostile, that the listeners before him were intensely curious to see and hear this rising Western politician. The West was even at that late day but imperfectly understood by the East. The poets and editors, the bankers and merchants of New York vaguely remembered having read in their books that it was the home of Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, the country of bowie knives and pistols, of steamboat explosions and mobs, of wild speculation and the repudiation of state debts. And these half-forgotten impressions had lately been vividly recalled by a several years' succession of newspaper reports retailing the incidents of border ruffian violence and free state guerrilla reprisals during the Civil War in Kansas. What was to be the type, the character, the language of this speaker? How could he impress the great editor Horace Greeley, who sat among the invited guests? David Dudley Field, the great lawyer who escorted him to the platform? William Cullen Bryant, the great poet who presided over the meeting. Judging from after effects, the audience quickly forgot these questioning thoughts. They had but time to note Mr. Lincoln's impressive stature, his strongly marked features, the clear ring of his rather high-pitched voice, and the almost commanding earnestness of his manner. His beginning foreshadowed a dry argument using as a text Douglas's phrase that our fathers, when they framed the government under which we live, understood this question just as well and even better than we do now. But the concise statements, the strong links of reasoning and the irresistible conclusions of the argument, 
with which the speaker followed his close historical analysis of how our fathers understood this question, held every listener as though each were individually merged with the speaker's thought and demonstration. It is surely safe to assume, said he with emphasis, that the thirty-nine framers of the original Constitution and the seventy-six members of the Congress, which framed the amendments thereto, taken together do certainly include those who may be fairly called our fathers who framed the government under which we live. And so assuming, I defy any man to show that any one of them ever in his whole life declared that, in his understanding, any proper division of local from federal authority or any part of the Constitution forbade the federal government to control as to slavery in the federal territories. With equal skill he next dissected the complaints, the demands, and the threats to dissolve the Union made by the southern states, pointed out their emptiness, their fallacy, and their injustice, and defined the exact point and center of the agitation. Holding as they do, said he, that slavery is morally right and socially elevating, they cannot cease to demand a full national recognition of it as a legal right and a social blessing. Nor can we justifiably withhold this on any ground, save our conviction that slavery is wrong. If slavery is right, all words, acts, laws, and constitutions against it are themselves wrong and should be silenced and swept away. If it is right, we cannot justly object to its nationality, its universality. If it is wrong, they cannot justly insist upon its extension, its enlargement. All they ask we could readily grant if we thought slavery right. All we ask they could readily grant if they thought it wrong. Their thinking it right and our thinking it wrong is the precise fact upon which depends the whole controversy. Wrong as we think slavery is, we can yet afford to let it alone where it is, because that much is due to the necessity arising from its actual presence in the nation. But can we, while our votes will prevent it, allow it to spread into the national territories and to overrun us here in the free states? If our sense of duty forbids this, then let us stand by our duty fearlessly and effectively. Let us be diverted by none of those sophistical contrivances wherewith we are so industriously plied and belabored, contrivances such as groping for some middle ground between the right and the wrong vain as the search for a man who should be neither a living man nor a dead man. Such as a policy of don't care on a question about which all true men do care. Such as union appeals beseeching true union men to yield to disunionist reversing the divine rule and calling not the sinners but the righteous to repentance. Such as invocations to Washington imploring men to unsay what Washington said and then do what Washington did. Neither let us be slandered from our duty by false accusation against us, nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction to the government, nor of dungeons to ourselves. Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith let us, to the end, dare to do our duty as we understand it. The close attention bestowed on its delivery, the hearty applause that greeted its telling points, and the enthusiastic comments of the Republican journals next morning showed that Lincoln's Cooper Institute speech had taken New York by storm. It was printed in full in four of the leading New York dailies, and at once went into large circulation in carefully edited pamphlet editions. From New York, Lincoln made a tour of speech-making through several of the New England states, and was everywhere received with enthusiastic welcome, and listened to with an eagerness that bore a marked result in their spring elections. The interest of the factory men who listened to these addresses was equaled, perhaps excelled, by the gratified surprise of college professors when they heard the style and method of a popular Western orator that would bear the test of their professional criticism and compare with the best examples in their standard textbooks. The attitude of the Democratic Party in the coming presidential campaign was now also rapidly taking shape. Great curiosity existed whether the radical differences between its northern and southern wings could by any possibility be removed or adjusted, whether the adherents of Douglas and those of Buchanan could be brought to join in a common platform and in the support of a single candidate. 
The Democratic leaders in the southern states had become more and more outspoken in their pro-slavery demands. They had advanced step by step from the repeal of the Missouri Compromise in 1854, the attempt to capture Kansas by Missouri invasions in 1855 and 1856, the support of the Dred Scott decision and the Lecompton fraud in 1857, the repudiation of Douglas's Freeport heresy in 1858, to the demand for a congressional slave code for the territories and the recognition of the doctrine of property in slaves. These last two points they had distinctly formulated in the first session of the 36th Congress. On January 18, 1860, Senator Brown of Mississippi introduced into the Senate two resolutions, one asserting the nationality of slavery the other that, when necessary, Congress should pass laws for its protection in the territories. On February 2nd, Jefferson Davis introduced another series of resolutions intended to serve as a basis for the National Democratic Platform, the central points of which were that the right to take and hold slaves in the territories could neither be impaired nor annulled, and that it was the duty of Congress to supply any deficiency of laws for its protection. Perhaps even more significant than these formulated doctrines was the pro-slavery spirit manifested in the congressional debates. Two months were wasted in a parliamentary struggle to prevent the election of the Republican John Sherman as Speaker of the House of Representatives, because the Southern members charged that he had recommended an abolition book, during which time the most sensational and violent threats of disunion were made in both the House and the Senate, containing repeated declarations that they would never submit to the inauguration of a black Republican president. When the National Democratic Convention met at Charleston on April 23, 1860, there at once became evident the singular condition that the delegates from the free states were united and enthusiastic in their determination to secure the nomination of Douglas as the Democratic candidate for president while the delegates from the slave states were equally united and determined upon forcing the acceptance of an extreme pro-slavery platform. All expectations of a compromise, all hope of coming to an understanding by juggling omissions or evasions in the declaration of party principles, were quickly dissipated. The platform committee, after three days and nights of fruitless effort, presented two antagonistic reports. The majority report declared that neither Congress nor a territorial legislature could abolish or prohibit slavery in the territories, and that it was the duty of the federal government to protect it when necessary. To this doctrine the northern members could not consent, but they were willing to adopt the ambiguous declaration that property rights in slaves were judicial in their character, and that they would abide the decisions of the Supreme Court on such questions. The usual expedient of recommitting both reports brought no relief from the deadlock. A second majority and a second minority report exhibited the same irreconcilable divergence in slightly different language, and the words of mutual defiance exchanged in debating the first report rose to a parliamentary storm when the second came under discussion. On the seventh day the convention came to a vote and the northern delegates being in the majority, the minority report was substituted for that of the majority of the committee by 165 to 138 delegates. In other words, the Douglas platform was declared adopted. Upon this, the delegates of the cotton states, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, South Carolina, Florida, Texas and Arkansas, withdrew from the convention. It soon appeared, however, that the Douglas delegates had achieved only a barren victory. Their majority could indeed adopt a platform, but under the acknowledged two-thirds rule which governs democratic national conventions, they had not sufficient votes to nominate their candidate. During the 57 ballots taken, the Douglas men could muster only 152 and one-half votes of the 202 necessary to a choice and to prevent mere slow disintegration, the convention adjourned on the tenth day under a resolution to reassemble in Baltimore on June 18th. Nothing was gained, however, by the delay. In the interim, Jefferson Davis and nineteen other southern leaders published an address commending the withdrawal of the cotton state delegates, and in a Senate debate Davis laid down the plain proposition, We want nothing more than a simple declaration that Negro slaves are property, 
and we want the recognition of the obligation of the federal government to protect that property like all other. Upon the reassembling of the Charleston Convention at Baltimore, it underwent a second disruption on the fifth day. The northern wing nominated Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois and the southern wing John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky as their respective candidates for president. In the meanwhile, also regular and irregular delegates from some twenty-two states representing fragments of the old Whig party had convened in Baltimore on May 9th and nominated John Bell of Tennessee as their candidate for president, upon a platform ignoring the slave issue and declaring they would recognize no other political principle than the constitution of the country, the union of the states, and the enforcement of the laws. In the long contest between slavery extension and slavery restriction, which was now approaching its culmination, the growing demands and increasing bitterness of the pro-slavery party had served in an equal degree to intensify the feelings and stimulate the efforts of the Republican Party, and remembering the encouraging opposition strength which the united vote of Fremont and Fillmore had shown in 1856, they felt encouraged to hope for possible success in 1860, since the Fillmore party had practically disappeared throughout the free states. When, therefore, the Charleston Convention was rent asunder and adjourned on May 10th without making a nomination, the possibility of Republican victory seemed to have risen to probability. Such a feeling inspired the eager enthusiasm of the delegates to the Republican National Convention, which met according to appointment at Chicago on May 16th. A large temporary wooden building christened the Wigwam had been erected in which to hold its sessions, and it was estimated that 10,000 persons were assembled in it to witness the proceedings. William H. Seward of New York was recognized as the leading candidate, but Chase of Ohio, Cameron of Pennsylvania, Bates of Missouri and several prominent Republicans from other states were known to have active and zealous followers. The name of Abraham Lincoln had also often been mentioned during his growing fame, and fully a year before an ardent Republican editor of Illinois had requested permission to announce him in his newspaper. Lincoln, however, discouraged such action at that time, answering him, As to the other matter you kindly mention, I must in candor say I do not think myself fit for the presidency. I certainly am flattered and gratified that some partial friends think of me in that connection, but I really think it best for our cause that no concerted effort, such as you suggest, should be made. He had given an equally positive answer to an eager Ohio friend in the preceding July, but about Christmas 1859 an influential caucus of his strongest Illinois adherents made a personal request that he would permit them to use his name, and he gave his consent not so much in any hope of becoming the nominee for president, as in possibly reaching the second place on the ticket, or at least of making such a showing of strength before the convention as would aid him in his future senatorial ambition at home, or perhaps carry him into the cabinet of the Republican president should one succeed. He had not been eager to enter the lists, but once having agreed to do so, it was but natural that he should manifest a becoming interest, subject, however, now as always, to his inflexible rule of fair dealing and honorable faith to all his party friends. I do not understand Trumbull and myself to be rivals, he wrote December 9, 1859. You know I am pledged not to enter a struggle with him for the seat in the Senate now occupied by him, and yet I would rather have a full term in the Senate than in the Presidency. And on February 9th he wrote to the same Illinois friend, I am not in a position where it would hurt much for me not to be nominated on the national ticket, but I am where it would hurt some for me not to get the Illinois delegates. What I expected when I wrote the letters to Messrs. Dahl and others is now happening. Your discomfited assailants are most bitter against me, and they will for revenge upon me lay to the Bates egg in the south and to the Seward egg in the north and go far toward squeezing me out of the middle with nothing. Can you not help me a little in this matter in your end of the vineyard? It turned out that the delegates whom the Illinois State Convention sent to the National Convention at Chicago were men not only of exceptional standing and ability, but filled with the warmest zeal for Mr. Lincoln's success. They were able at once to impress upon delegates from other states his sterling personal worth and fitness and his superior availability. 
It needed but little political arithmetic to work out the sum of existing political chances. It was almost self-evident that in the coming November election victory or defeat would hang upon the result in the four pivotal states of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Indiana and Illinois. It was quite certain that no Republican candidate could carry a single one of the fifteen slave states, and equally sure that Breckenridge, on his extreme pro-slavery platform, could not carry a single one of the eighteen free states. But there was a chance that one or more of these four pivotal free states might cast its vote for Douglas and popular sovereignty. A candidate was needed, therefore, who could successfully cope with Douglas and the Douglas theory, and this ability had been convincingly demonstrated by Lincoln. As a mere personal choice, a majority of the convention would have preferred Seward, but in the four pivotal states there were many voters who believed Seward's anti-slavery views to be too radical. They shrank apprehensively from the phrase in one of his speeches that there is a higher law than the Constitution. These pivotal states all lay adjoining slave states, and their public opinion was infected with something of the undefined dread of abolitionism. When the delegates of the pivotal states were interviewed, they frankly confessed that they could not carry their states for Seward, and that would mean certain defeat if he were the nominee for president. For their voters Lincoln stood on more acceptable ground. His speeches had been more conservative, his local influence in his own state of Illinois was also a factor not to be idly thrown away. Plain practical reasoning of this character found ready acceptance among the delegates to the convention. Their eagerness for the success of the cause largely overbalanced their personal preferences for favorite aspirants. When the convention met, the fresh, hearty hopefulness of its members was a most inspiring reflection of the public opinion in the states that sent them. They went at their work with an earnestness which was an encouraging premonition of success, and they felt a gratifying support in the presence of the ten thousand spectators who looked on at their work. Few conventions have ever been pervaded by such a depth of feeling or exhibited such a reserve of latent enthusiasm. The cheers that greeted the entrance of popular favorites and the short speeches on preliminary business ran and rolled through the great audience in successive moving waves of sound that were echoed and re-echoed from side to side in the vast building. Not alone the delegates on the central platform, but in the multitude of spectators as well, felt they were playing a part in a great historical event. The temporary and afterward the permanent organization was finished on the first day, with somewhat less than usual of the wordy and tantalizing small talk which these routine proceedings always call forth. On the second day the platform committee submitted its work embodying the carefully considered and skillfully framed body of doctrines of which the Republican Party, made up only four years before from such previously heterogeneous and antagonistic political elements, was now able to find common and durable ground of agreement. Around its central tenet, which denied the authority of Congress, of territorial legislature, or of any individuals to give legal existence to slavery in any territory of the United States, were grouped vigorous denunciations of the various steps and incidents of the pro-slavery reaction and its prospective demands, while its positive recommendations embraced the immediate admission of Kansas, free homesteads to actual settlers, river and harbor improvements of national character, a railroad to the Pacific Ocean, and the maintenance of existing naturalization laws. The platform was about to be adopted without objection when a flurry of discussion arose over an amendment proposed by Mr. Giddings of Ohio to incorporate in it the phrase of the Declaration of Independence, which declares the right of all men to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Impatience was at once manifested lest any change should produce endless delay and dispute. I believe in the Ten Commandments, commented a member, but I do not want them in a political platform and the proposition was voted down. Upon this, the old anti-slavery veteran felt himself aggrieved, and taking up his hat, marched out of the convention. In the course of an hour's desultory discussion, however, a member, 
with stirring oratorical emphasis, asked whether the convention was prepared to go upon record before the country as voting down the words of the Declaration of Independence, whether the men of 1860 on the free prairies of the West quailed before repeating the words enunciated by the men in 76 at Philadelphia. In an impulse of patriotic reaction, the amendment was incorporated into the platform, and Mr. Giddings was brought back by his friends, his face beaming with triumph, and the stormy acclaim of the audience manifested the deep feeling which the incident evoked. On the third day it was certain that balloting would begin, and crowds hurried to the wigwam in a fever of curiosity. Having grown restless at the indispensable routine preliminaries, when Mr. Everts nominated William H. Seward of New York for president, they greeted his name with a perfect storm of applause. Then Mr. Judd nominated Abraham Lincoln of Illinois, and in the tremendous cheering that broke from the throats of his admirers and followers, the former demonstration dwindled to comparative feebleness. Again and again these contests of lungs and enthusiasm were repeated, as the choice of New York was seconded by Michigan, and that of Illinois by Indiana. When other names had been duly presented, the cheering at length subsided, and the chairman announced that balloting would begin. Many spectators had provided themselves with tally lists, and when the first roll call was completed, were able at once to perceive the drift of popular preference. Cameron, Chase, Bates, McLean, Dayton, and Colomer were endorsed by the substantial votes of their own states. But two names stood out in marked superiority. Seward, who had received 173 and one-half votes, and Lincoln, 102. The New York delegation was so thoroughly persuaded of the final success of their candidate that they did not comprehend the significance of this first ballot. Had they reflected that their delegation alone had contributed seventy votes to Seward's total, they would have understood that outside of the Empire State, upon this first showing, Lincoln held their favorite almost an even race. As the second ballot progressed, their anxiety visibly increased. They watched with eagerness as the complimentary votes first cast for state favorites were transferred now to one, now to the other of the recognized leaders in the contest, and their hopes sank when the result of the second ballot was announced. Seward, 184 and one-half, Lincoln, 181, and a volume of applause, which was with difficulty checked by the chairman, shook the wigwam at this announcement. Then followed a short interval of active caucusing in the various delegations, while excited men went about rapidly interchanging questions, solicitations and messages between delegations from different states. Neither candidate had yet received a majority of all the votes cast, and the third ballot was begun amid a deep, almost painful suspense, delegates and spectators alike recording each announcement of votes on their tally sheets with nervous fingers. But the doubt was of short duration before the secretaries made the official announcement, the totals had been figured up. Lincoln, 231 and one-half. Seward, 180. Counting the scattering votes, 465 ballots had been cast, and 233 were necessary to a choice. Seward had lost four and one-half. Lincoln had gained fifty and one-half, and only one and one-half votes more were needed to make a nomination. The wigwam suddenly became as still as a church, and everybody leaned forward to see whose voice would break the spell. Before the lapse of a minute, David K. Carter sprang upon his chair and reported a change of four Ohio votes from Chase to Lincoln. Then a teller shouted a name toward the skylight, and the boom of cannon from the roof of the wigwam announced the nomination and started the cheering of the overjoyed Illinoisians down the long Chicago streets while in the wigwam delegation after delegation changed its vote to the victor amid a tumult of hurrahs. When quiet was somewhat restored, Mr. Everts, speaking for New York and for Seward, moved to make the nomination unanimous, and Mr. Browning gracefully returned the thanks of Illinois for the honor the convention had conferred upon the state. In the afternoon the convention completed its work by nominating Hannibal Hamlin of Maine for vice president, and as the delegates sped homeward in the night trains, they witnessed in the bonfires and cheering crowds at the stations that a memorable presidential campaign was already begun. 
End of chapter 10「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」「十分」Lincoln Resolution, John Hanks and the Lincoln Rails, the Rail Splitter Candidate, the Wide Awakes, Douglas's Southern Tour, Jefferson Davis's Address, Fusion, Lincoln at the State House, the Election Result. The nomination of Lincoln at Chicago completed the preparations of the different parties of the country for the presidential contest. Of 1860, and presented the unusual occurrence of an appeal to the voters of the several states by four district political organizations. In the order of popular strength with which they afterward developed, they were 1. The Republican Party, whose platform declared in substance that slavery was wrong and that its further extension should be prohibited by Congress. Its candidates were Abraham Lincoln of Illinois for president and Hannibal Hamlin of Maine for vice president. 2. The Douglas Wing of the Democratic Party, which declared indifference whether slavery were right or wrong, extended or prohibited, and proposed to permit the people of a territory to decide whether they would prevent or establish it. Its candidates were Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois for president and Herschel V. Johnson of Georgia for Vice President. C. The Buchanan Wing of the Democratic Party, which declared that slavery was right and beneficial, and whose policy was to extend the institution and create new slave states. Its candidates were John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky for President and Joseph Lane of Oregon for Vice President. 4. The Constitutional Union Party, which professed to ignore the question of slavery and declared it would recognize no political principles other than the Constitution of the country, the Union of the States, and the enforcement of the laws. Its candidates were John Bell of Tennessee for President and Edward Everett of Massachusetts for Vice President. In the array of these opposing candidates and their platforms, it could be easily calculated from the very beginning that neither Lincoln nor Douglas had any chance to carry a slave state, nor Breckinridge nor Bell to carry a free state, and that neither Douglas in the free states nor Bell in either section could obtain electoral votes enough to succeed. Therefore, but two alternatives seemed probable. Either Lincoln would be chosen by electoral votes or, upon his failure to obtain a sufficient number, the election would be thrown into the House of Representatives, in which case the course of combination, chance, or intrigue could not be foretold. The political situation and its possible results thus involved a degree of uncertainty sufficient to hold out a contingent hope to all the candidates and to inspire the followers of each to active exertion. This hope and inspiration added to the hot temper which the long discussion of antagonistic principles had engendered, served to infuse into the campaign enthusiasm, earnestness, and even bitterness according to local conditions in the different sections. In campaign enthusiasm, the Republican Party easily took the lead. About a week before his nomination, Mr. Lincoln had been present at the Illinois State Convention at Decatur in Coles County, not far from the old Lincoln home, when, at a given signal, there marched into the convention old John Hanks, one of his boyhood companions, and another pioneer who bore on their shoulders two long fence rails decorated with a banner inscribed, Two Rails from a Lot Made by Abraham Lincoln and John Hanks in the Sagamon Bottom in the year 1830. 
They were greeted with a tremendous shout of applause from the whole convention, succeeded by a united call for Lincoln, who sat on the platform. The tumult would not subside until he rose to speak, when he said, "'Gentlemen, I suppose you want to know something about those things,' pointing to old John and the rails. "'Well, the truth is, John Hanks and I did make rails in the Sagamon Bottom. I don't know whether we made those rails or not. Fact is, I don't think they are a credit to the makers, laughing as he spoke. But I do know this. I made rails then, and I think I could make better ones than these now. Still louder cheering followed this short but effective reply. But the convention was roused to its full warmth of enthusiasm when a resolution was immediately and unanimously adopted, declaring that Abraham Lincoln is the first choice of the Republican Party of Illinois for the presidency and directing the delegates to the Chicago Convention to use all honorable means to secure his nomination and to cast the vote of the state as a unit for him. It was this resolution which the Illinois delegation had so successfully carried out at Chicago, and, besides, they had carried with them the two fence rails and set them up in state at the Lincoln headquarters at their hotel where enthusiastic lady friends gaily trimmed them with flowers and ribbons and lighted them up with tapers. These slight preliminaries, duly embellished in the newspapers, gave the key to the Republican campaign, which designated Lincoln as the rail splitter candidate, and added to his common Illinois sobriquet of Old Honest Abe, furnished both country and city campaign orators a powerfully sympathetic appeal to the rural and laboring element of the United States. When these homely but picturesque appellations were fortified by the copious pamphlet and newspaper biographies in which people read the story of his humble beginnings and how he had risen, by dint of simple, earnest work and native genius, through privation and difficulty, first to fame and leadership in his state, and now to fame and leadership in the nation, they grew quickly into symbols of a faith and trust destined to play no small part in a political revolution of which the people at large were not as yet even dreaming. Another feature of the campaign also quickly developed itself. On the preceding 5th of March, one of Mr. Lincoln's New England speeches had been made at Hartford, Connecticut, and at its close he was escorted to his hotel by a procession of the local Republican Club, at the head of which marched a few of its members bearing torches and wearing caps and capes of glazed oilcloth, the primary purpose of which was to shield their clothes from the dripping oil of their torches. Both the simplicity and the efficiency of the uniform caught the popular eye, as did also the name, Wide Awakes, applied to them by the Hartford Current. The example found quick imitation in Hartford and adjoining towns, and when Mr. Lincoln was made candidate for president, every city, town, and nearly every village in the North, within a brief space, had its organized wide awake club with their half military uniform and drill, and these clubs were often, later in the campaign, gathered into imposing torchlight processions miles in length on occasions of important party meetings and speech-making. It was the revived spirit of the Harrison campaign of twenty years before, but now, shorn of its fun and frolic, it was strengthened by the power of organization and the tremendous impetus of earnest devotion to a high principle. It was a noteworthy feature of the campaign that the letters of acceptance of all the candidates either in distinct words or unmistakable implication, declared devotion to the Union, while at the same time the adherents of each were charging disunion sentiments and intentions upon the other three parties. Douglas himself made a tour of speech-making through the southern states in which, while denouncing the political views of both Lincoln and Breckinridge, he nevertheless openly declared, in response to direct questions, that no grievance could justify disunion, and that he was ready to put the hemp around the neck and hang any man who would raise the arm of resistance to the constituted authorities of the country. During the early part of the campaign, 
the more extreme southern fire-eaters abated somewhat of their violent menaces of disunion. Between the Charleston and the Baltimore Democratic Conventions, an address published by Jefferson Davis and other prominent leaders had explained that the seventeen Democratic states which had voted at Charleston for the succeeders' platform could, if united with Pennsylvania alone, elect the Democratic nominees against all opposition. This hope, doubtless, floated before their eyes like a will-of-the-wisp until the October elections dispelled all possibility of securing Pennsylvania for Breckinridge. From that time forward, there began a renewal of disunion threats, which, by their constant increase throughout the South, prepared the public mind of that section for the coming succession. As the chances of Republican success gradually grew stronger, an undercurrent of combination developed itself among those politicians of the three opposing parties, more devoted to patronage than principle, to bring about the fusion of Lincoln's opponents on some agreed ratio of a division of the spoils. Such a combination made considerable progress in the three northern states of New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. It appears to have been engineered mainly by the Douglas faction, though, it must be said to his credit, against the open and earnest protest of Douglas himself. But the thrifty plotters cared little for his disapproval. By the secret manipulations of conventions and committees, a fusion electoral ticket was formed in New York, made up of adherents of the three different factions in the following proportion. Douglas, 18, Bell, 10, Breckinridge, 7. And the whole opposition vote of the state of New York was cast for this fusion ticket. The same tactics were pursued in Pennsylvania, where, however, the agreement was not so openly avowed. One-third of the Pennsylvania fusion electoral candidates were pledged to Douglas, the division of the remaining two-thirds between Bell and Breckinridge was not made public. The bulk of the Pennsylvania opposition vote was cast for this fusion ticket, but a respectable percentage refused to be bargained away and voted directly for Douglas or Bell. In New Jersey, a definite agreement was reached by the managers, and an electoral ticket formed, composed of two adherents of Bell, two of Breckinridge, and three of Douglas, and in this state a practical result was effected by the movement. A fraction of the Douglas voters formed a straight electoral ticket, adopting the three Douglas candidates on the fusion ticket, and by this action these three Douglas electors received a majority vote in New Jersey. On the whole, however, the fusion movement proved ineffectual to defeat Lincoln, and indeed it would not have done so even had the fusion electoral tickets deceived a majority in all three of the above-named states. The personal habits and surroundings of Mr. Lincoln were varied somewhat, though but slightly, during the whole of this election summer. Naturally, he withdrew at once from active work, leaving his law office and his whole law business to his partner, William H. Herndon, while his friends installed him in the governor's room in the State House at Springfield, which was not otherwise needed during the absence of the legislature. Here he spent the time during the usual business hours of the day, attended only by his private secretary, Mr. Nicolay. Friends and strangers alike were thus able to visit him freely, without ceremony, and they availed themselves largely of the opportunity. Few, if any, went away without being favorably impressed by his hearty Western greeting, and the frank sincerity of his manner and conversation, in which, naturally, all subjects of controversy were courteously and instinctively avoided by both the candidate and his visitors. By none was this free, neighborly intercourse enjoyed more than by the old-time settlers of Sangamon and the adjoining counties, who came to revive the incidents and memories of pioneer days with one who could give them such thorough and appreciative interest and sympathy. 
he employed no literary bureau wrote no public letters made no set or impromptu speeches except that once or twice during great political meetings at springfield he uttered a few words of greeting and thanks to passing street processions all these devices of propagandism he left to the leaders and committees of his adherents in their several states even the strictly confidential letters in which he indicated his advice on points in the progress of the campaign did not exceed a dozen in number and when politicians came to interview him at springfield he received them in the privacy of his own home and generally their presence created little or no public notice cautious politician as he was he did not permit himself to indulge in any overconfidence but then as always before showed unusual skill in estimating political chances thus he wrote about a week after the chicago convention so far as i can learn the nominations start well everywhere and if they get no back set it would seem as if they are going through again on july four long before this you have learned who was nominated at chicago we know not what a day may bring forth but today it looks as if the chicago ticket will be elected and on september twenty two to a friend in oregon no one on this side of the mountains pretends that any ticket can be elected by the people unless it be ours hence great efforts to combine against us are being made which however as yet have not had much success besides what we see in the newspapers i have a good deal of private correspondence and without giving details i will only say it all looks very favorable to our success his judgment was abundantly verified at the presidential election which occurred upon november sixth eighteen sixty lincoln electors were chosen in every one of the free states except new jersey where as has already been stated three douglas electors received majorities because their names were on both the fusion ticket and the straight douglas ticket while the other four republican electors in that state succeeded of the slave states eleven chose breckinridge electors three of them bell electors and one of them missouri douglas electors as provided by law the electors met in their several states on december fifth to officially cast their votes and on february thirteenth eighteen sixty one congress in joint session of the two houses made the official count as follows for lincoln one hundred and eighty for breckinridge seventy two for bell thirty nine and for douglas twelve giving lincoln a clear majority of fifty seven in the whole electoral college thereupon breckinridge who presided over the joint session officially declared that abraham lincoln was duly elected president of the united states for four years beginning march four eighteen sixty one End of chapter 11. Recording by Lana Jordan. Twelve of a short life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter 12 Lincoln's Cabinet Program Members from the South Questions and Answers Correspondence with Stevens Action of Congress Peace Convention Preparation of the Inaugural Lincoln's Farewell Address The Journey to Washington Lincoln's Midnight Journey During the long presidential campaign of 1860, between the Chicago Convention in the middle of May and the election at the beginning of November, Mr. Lincoln, relieved from all other duties, had watched political developments with very close attention not merely to discern the progress of his own chances, but doubtless also, much more seriously, to deliberate upon the future in case he should be elected. But it 
was only when, on the night of November 6, he sat in the telegraph office at Springfield, from which all but himself and the operators were excluded, and read the telegrams as they fell from the wires, that little by little the accumulating Republic majorities reported from all directions convinced him of the certainty of his success, and with that conviction there fell upon him the overwhelming, almost crushing weight of his coming duties and responsibilities. He afterward related that in that supreme hour, grappling resolutely with the mighty problem before him, he practically completed the first essential act of his administration, the selection of his future cabinet, the choice of men who were to aid him. From what afterward occurred, we may easily infer the general principle which guided his choice. One of his strongest characteristics, as his speeches abundantly show, was his belief in the power of public opinion and his respect for the popular will. That was to be found and to be wielded by the leaders of public sentiment. In the present instance, there were no truer representatives of that will than the men who had been prominently supported by the delegates to the Chicago Convention for the presidential nominations. Of these, he would take at least three, perhaps four, to compose one half of his cabinet. In selecting Seward, Chase, Bates, and Cameron, he could also satisfy two other points of the representative principle, the claims of locality and the elements of former party divisions now joined in the newly organized Republican Party. With Seward from New York, Cameron from Pennsylvania, Chase from Ohio, and himself from Illinois, the four leading free states each had a representative. With Bates from Missouri, the South could not complain of being wholly excluded from the cabinet. New England was properly represented by Vice President Hamlin. When, after the inauguration, Smith from Indiana, Wells from Connecticut, and Blair from Maryland were added to make up the seven cabinet members, the local distribution between East and West, North and South, was in no wise disturbed. It was indeed complained that in this arrangement there were four former Democrats and only three former Whigs, to which Lincoln laughingly replied that he had been a Whig and would be there to make the number even. It was not likely that this exact list was in Lincoln's mind on the night of the November election, but only the principal names in it, and much delay and some friction occurred before its completion. The post of Secretary of State was offered to Seward on December 8. Rumors have got into the newspapers, wrote Lincoln, to the effect that the department named above would be tendered you as a compliment, and with the expectation that you would decline it. I beg you to be assured that I have said nothing to justify these rumors. On the contrary, it has been my purpose from the day of the nomination at Chicago to assign you, by your leave, this place in the administration. Seward asked for a few days for reflection, then cordially accepted. Bates was tendered the Attorney Generalship on December 15 while making a personal visit to Springfield. Word had been meanwhile sent to Smith that he would probably be included. The assignment of places to Chase and Cameron worked less smoothly. Lincoln wrote Cameron a note on January 3rd saying he would nominate him for either Secretary of the Treasury or Secretary of War. He had not yet decided which, and on the same day, in an interview with Chase, whom he had invited to Springfield, said to him, I have done with you what I would not perhaps have ventured to do with any other man in the country, sent for you to ask whether you will accept the appointment of Secretary of the Treasury without, however, being exactly prepared to offer it to you. They discussed the situation very fully but without reaching a definite conclusion, agreeing to await the advice of friends. Meanwhile, the rumor that Cameron was going to go into the cabinet excited such 
hot opposition that Lincoln felt obliged to recall his tender in a confidential letter and asked him to write a public letter declining the place. Instead of doing this, Cameron fortified himself with recommendations from prominent Pennsylvanians and demonstrated that in his own state he had at least three advocates to one opponent. Pending the delay which this contest consumed, another cabinet complication found its solution. It had been warmly urged by conservatives that, in addition to Bates, another cabinet member should be taken from one of the southern states. The difficulty of doing this had been clearly foreshadowed by Mr. Lincoln in a little editorial which he wrote for the Springfield Journal on December 12. First, is it known that any such gentleman of character would accept a place in the cabinet? Second, if yea, on what terms does he surrender to Mr. Lincoln, or Mr. Lincoln to him, on the political differences between them, or do they enter upon the administration in open opposition to each other? It was very soon demonstrated that these differences were insurmountable. Through Mr. Seward, who was attending his senatorial duties at Washington, Mr. Lincoln tentatively offered a cabinet appointment successively to Gilmer of North Carolina, Hunt of Louisiana, and Scott of Virginia, no one of whom had the courage to accept. Toward the end of the recent canvass, and still more since the election, Mr. Lincoln had received urgent letters to make some public declaration to reassure and pacify the South, especially the cotton states, which were manifesting a constantly growing spirit of rebellion. Most of such letters remained unanswered, but in a number of strictly confidential replies he explained the reasons for his refusal. I appreciate your motive, he wrote October 23, when you suggest the propriety of my writing for the public something disclaiming all intention to interfere with slaves or slavery in the states, but in my judgment it would do no good. I have already done this many, many times, and it is in print, and open to all who will read. But those who will not read or heed what I have already publicly said would not read or heed a repetition of it. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one rose from the dead. To the letter of the Louisville Journal, he wrote, October 29, For the good men of the South, and I regard the majority of them as such. I have no objection to repeat seventy and seven times, but I have had bad men to deal with, both North and South, who are eager for something new upon which to base new misrepresentations, men who would like to frighten me, or at least to fix upon me the character of timidity and cowardice. Alexander H. Stevens of Georgia, who afterward became Confederate Vice President, made a strong speech against succession in that state on November 14, and Mr. Lincoln wrote him a few lines asking for a revised copy of it. In the brief correspondence which ensued, Mr. Lincoln again wrote him under date of December 22, I fully appreciate the present peril the country is in, and the weight of responsibility on me. Do the people of the South really entertain fears that a Republican administration would, directly or indirectly, interfere with the slaves or with them about the slaves? If they do, I wish to assure you, as once a friend, and still, I hope not an enemy, that there is no cause for such fears. The South will be in no more danger in this respect than it was in the days of Washington. I suppose, however, this does not meet the case. You think slavery is right and ought to be extended, while we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. That, I suppose, is the rub. It certainly is the only substantial difference between us. So, also, replying a few days earlier in a long letter to Honorable John A. Gilmer of North Carolina, to whom, as already stated, he offered a cabinet appointment, he said, on the territorial question, I am inflexible, as you see my position in the book. 
On that there is a difference between you and us, and it is the only substantial difference. You think slavery is right and ought to be extended. We think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. For this neither has any just occasion to be angry with the other. As to the state laws, mentioned in your sixth question, I really know very little of them. I have never read one. If any of them are in conflict with the fugitive slave cause, or any other part of the Constitution, I certainly shall be glad of their repeal. But I could hardly be justified, as a citizen of Illinois, or as President of the United States, to recommend the repeal of a statute of Vermont or South Carolina. Through his intimate correspondence with Mr. Seward and his personal friends in Congress, Mr. Lincoln was kept somewhat informed of the hostile temper of the Southern leaders, and that a tremendous pressure was being brought upon that body by timid conservatives and the commercial interests in the North to bring about some kind of compromise which would stay the progress of disunion, and on this point he sent an emphatic monition to Representative Washburn on December 13. Your long letter received prevent as far as possible any of our friends from demoralizing themselves and their cause by entertaining propositions for compromise of any sort on slavery extension. There is no possible compromise upon it but what puts us under again, and all your work to do over again. Whether it be a Missouri line or Eli Thayer's popular sovereignty, it is all the same. Let either be done and immediately filibustering and extending slavery recommences. On that point, hold firm as a chain of steel. Between the day when a president is elected by popular vote and that on which he is officially inaugurated, there exists an interim of four long months during which he has no more direct power in the affairs of government than any private citizen. However anxiously Mr. Lincoln might watch the development of public events at Washington and in the cotton states, whatever appeals might come to him through interviews or correspondence, no positive action of any kind was within his power beyond an occasional word of advice or suggestion. The position of the Republican leaders in Congress was not much better. Until the actual succession of states and the departure of their representatives, they were in a minority in the Senate, while the so-called South Americans and anti lecompton Democrats held the balance of power in the House. The session was mainly consumed in excited, profitless discussion. Both the Senate and the House appointed compromise committees, which met and labored, but could find no common ground of agreement. A peace convention met and deliberated at Washington, with no practical result except to waste the powder for a salute of one hundred guns over a sham report to which nobody paid the least attention. Throughout this period, Mr. Lincoln was by no means idle. Besides the many difficulties he had to overcome in completing his cabinets, he devoted himself to writing his inaugural address. Withdrawing himself some hours each day from his ordinary receptions, he went to a quiet room on the second floor of the store, occupied by his brother-in-law, on the south side of the public square in Springfield, where he could think and write in undisturbed privacy. When, after abundant reflection and revision, he had finished the document, he placed it in the hands of Mr. William H. Bailhosh, one of the editors of the Illinois State Journal, who locked himself and a single compositor into the composing room of the journal. Here, in Mr. Bailhock's presence, it was set up, proof taken and read, and a dozen copies printed, after which the types were again immediately distributed. The alert newspaper correspondents in Springfield, who saw Lincoln every day as usual, did not obtain the slightest hint of what was going on. Having completed his arrangements, Mr. Lincoln started on his journey to Washington on February 11, 1861, on a special train accompanied by Mrs. Lincoln and their three children, his two private secretaries, and a suite of about a dozen personal friends. 
Mr. Seward had suggested that in view of the feverish condition of public affairs, he should come a week earlier. But Mr. Lincoln allowed himself only time enough comfortably to fill the appointments he had made to visit the capitals and principal cities of the states on his route, in accordance with nonpartisan invitations from their legislatures and mayors which he had accepted. Standing on the front platform of the car, as the conductor was about to pull the bell rope, Mr. Lincoln made the following brief and pathetic address of farewell to his friends and neighbors of Springfield, the last time his voice was ever to be heard in the city which had been his home for so many years. My friends, not one, not in my situation, can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting. To this place, and the kindness of these people I owe everything. Here I have lived a quarter of a century, have passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born, and one is buried. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I may return, with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington, without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care, commending you, as I hope in your prayers you will commend me, I bid you an affectionate farewell. It was the beginning of a memorable journey. On the whole route from Springfield to Washington, at almost every station, even the smallest, was gathered a crowd of people in hope to catch a glimpse of the face of the President-elect, or, at least, to see the flying train. At the larger stopping places these gatherings were swelled to thousands, and in the great cities into almost unimaginable assemblages. Everywhere there were vociferous calls for Mr. Lincoln and, if he showed himself, for a speech. Whenever there were sufficient time, he would step to the rear platform of the car and bow his acknowledgments as the train was moving away, and sometimes utter a few words of thanks and greeting. At the capitals of Indiana, Ohio, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, as also in the cities of Cincinnati, Cleveland, Buffalo, New York, and Philadelphia, a halt was made for one or two days, and a program was carried out of a formal visit and brief address to each house of the legislature, street processions, large receptions in the evening, and other similar ceremonies. And in each of them there was an unprecedented outpouring of the people to take advantage of every opportunity to see and to hear the future chief magistrate of the Union. Party foes, as well as party friends, made up these expectant crowds. The public suspense was at a degree of tension which rendered every eye and ear eager to catch even the slightest indication of the thoughts or intentions of the man who was to be the official guide of the nation in a crisis the course and end of which even the wisest dared not predict. In the twenty or thirty brief addresses delivered by Mr. Lincoln on this journey, he observed the utmost caution of utterance and reticence of declaration. Yet the shades of meaning in his carefully chosen sentences were enough to show how alive he was to the trials and dangers confronting his administration, and to inspire hope and confidence in his judgment. He repeated that he regarded the public demonstrations not as belonging to himself, but to the high office with which the people had clothed him, and that if he failed, they could four years later substitute a better man in his place. And in his very first address at Indianapolis, he thus emphasized their reciprocal duties. If the union of these states and the liberties of this people shall be lost, it is but little to any one man of fifty-two years of age, but a great deal to the thirty millions of people who inhabit these United States, and to their posterity in all coming time. It is your business to rise up and preserve the Union and liberty for yourselves, and not for me. I appeal to you again to constantly bear in mind that not with politicians 
not with presidents, not with office-seekers, but with you, is the question, shall the Union, and shall the liberties of this country, be preserved to the latest generations? Many salient and interesting quotations could be made from his other addresses, but a comparatively few sentences will be sufficient to enable the reader to infer what was likely to be his ultimate conclusion and action. In his second speech at Indianapolis, he asked the question, On what rightful principle may a state, being not more than one-fiftieth part of the nation in soil and population, break up the nation, and then coerce a proportionally larger subdivision of itself in the most arbitrary way? At Steubenville, if the majority should not rule, who would be the judge? Where is such judge to be found? We should all be bound by the majority of the American people. If not, then the minority must control. Would that be right? At Trenton, I shall do all that may be in my power to promote a peaceful settlement of all our difficulties. The man does not live who is more devoted to peace than I am. None who would do more to preserve it, but it may be necessary to put the foot down firmly. At Harrisburg, while I am exceedingly gratified to see the manifestation upon your streets of your military force here, and exceedingly gratified at your promise to use that force upon a proper emergency, while I make these acknowledgments, I desire to repeat, in order to preclude any possible misconstruction, that I do most sincerely hope that we shall have no use for them, that it will never become their duty to shed blood, and most especially never to shed fraternal blood. I promise that so far as I may have wisdom to direct, if so painful a result shall in any wise be brought about, it shall be through no fault of mine. While Mr. Lincoln was yet at Philadelphia, he was met by Mr. Frederick W. Seward, son of Senator Seward, who brought him an important communication from his father and General Scott at Washington. About the beginning of the year, serious apprehension had been felt lest the sudden uprising of the secessionists in Virginia and Maryland might endeavor to gain possession of the national capital. An investigation by a committee of Congress found no active military preparation to exist for such a purpose, but considerable traces of disaffection and local conspiracy in Baltimore, and, to guard against such an outbreak, President Buchanan had permitted his Secretary of War, Mr. Holt, to call General Scott to Washington and charge him with the safety of the city, not only at that moment, but also during the counting of the presidential returns in February and the coming inauguration of Mr. Lincoln. For this purpose, General Scott had concentrated at Washington a few companies from the regular army and also, in addition, had organized and armed about 900 men of the militia of the District of Columbia. In connection with these precautions, Colonel Stone, who commanded these forces, had kept himself informed about the disaffection in Baltimore through the agency of the New York Police Department. The communication brought by young Mr. Seward contained, besides notes from his father and General Scott, a short report from Colonel Stone stating that there had arisen within the past few days imminent danger of violence to and the assassination of Mr. Lincoln in his passage through Baltimore should the time of that passage be known. All risk, he suggested, might easily be avoided by a change in the traveling arrangements which would bring Mr. Lincoln and a portion of his party through Baltimore by a night train without previous notice. The seriousness of this information was doubled by the fact that Mr. Lincoln had, that same day, held an interview with a prominent Chicago detective who had been for some weeks employed by the President of Philadelphia Wilmington and Baltimore Railway to investigate the danger to their property and trains from the Baltimore secessionists. The investigations of this detective, a Mr. Pinkerton, had been carried on without the knowledge of the New York detective, and he reported not identical 
but almost similar conditions of insurrectionary feeling and danger, and recommended the same precaution. Mr. Lincoln very earnestly debated the situation with his intimate personal friend, Honorable N. B. Judd of Chicago, perhaps the most active and influential member of his suite, who advised him to proceed to Washington that same evening on the eleven o'clock train. I cannot go tonight, replied Mr. Lincoln. I have promised to raise the flag over Independence Hall tomorrow morning, and to visit the legislature at Harrisburg. Beyond that, I have no engagements. The railroad schedule by which Mr. Lincoln had hitherto been traveling included a direct trip from Harrisburg through Baltimore to Washington on Saturday, February 23rd. When the Harrisburg ceremonies had been concluded on the afternoon of the 22nd, the danger and the proposed change of program were for the first time fully laid before a confidential meeting of the prominent members of Mr. Lincoln's suite. Reasons were strongly urged, both for and against the plan, but Mr. Lincoln finally decided and explained that while he himself was not afraid he would be assassinated, nevertheless, since the possibility of danger had been made known from two entirely independent sources and officially communicated to him by his future Prime Minister and the General of the American Armies, he was no longer at liberty to disregard it. That it was not the question of his private life, but the regular and orderly transmission of the authority of the government of the United States in the face of threatened revolution, which he had no right to put in the slightest jeopardy. He would, therefore, carry out the plan, the full details of which had been arranged with the railroad officials. Accordingly, that same evening, he, with a single companion, Colonel W. H. Lamont, took a car from Harrisburg back to Pennsylvania, at which place, about midnight, they boarded the through train from New York to Washington, and without recognition or any untoward incident, passed quietly through Baltimore and reached the capital about daylight on the morning of February 23rd, where they were met by Mr. Seward and Representative Washburn of Illinois and conducted to Willard's Hotel. When Mr. Lincoln's departure from Harrisburg became known, a reckless newspaper correspondent telegraphed to New York the ridiculous invention that he traveled disguised in a scotch cap and long military cloak. There was not word of truth in the absurd statement. Mr. Lincoln's family and suite proceeded to Washington by the originally arranged train and schedule and witnessed great crowds in the streets of Baltimore but encountered neither turbulence nor incivility of any kind. There was now, of course, no occasion for any, since the telegraph had definitely announced that the president-elect was already in Washington. End of chapter 12. Recording by Lana Jordan. Chapter 13 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 13. The Secession Movement. South Carolina's secession, Buchanan's neglect, disloyal cabinet members, Washington's central cabal, Anderson's transfer to Sumter, Star of the West, Montgomery Rebellion, Davis and Stevens, Cornerstone Theory, Lincoln inaugurated, his inaugural address, Lincoln's cabinet, the question of Sumter, Seward's memorandum, Lincoln's answer, Bombardment of Sumter, Anderson's Capitulation. It is not the province of these chapters to relate in detail the course of the secession movement in the cotton states in the interim which elapsed between the election and inauguration of President Lincoln. Still less can space be given to analyze and set forth the lamentable failure of President Buchanan to employ the executive authority and power of the government to prevent it 
or even hinder its development by any vigorous opposition or adequate protest. The determination of South Carolina to secede was announced by the governor of that state a month before the presidential election, and on the day before the election he sent the legislature of the state a revolutionary message to formally inaugurate it. From that time forward, the whole official machinery of the state not only led but forced the movement, which culminated on December 20th in the Ordinance of Secession by the South Carolina Convention. This official revolution in South Carolina was quickly imitated by similar official revolutions ending in secession ordinances in the state of Mississippi on January 9, 1861. Florida, January 10th, Alabama, January 11th, Georgia, January 19th, Louisiana, January 26th, and by a still bolder usurpation in Texas, culminating on February 1st. From the day of the presidential election, all these proceedings were known probably more fully to President Buchanan than to the general public, because many of the actors were his personal and party friends, while almost at their very beginning, he became aware that the three members of his cabinet were secretly or openly abetting and promoting them by their official influence and power. Instead of promptly dismissing these unfaithful servants, he retained one of them a month and the others twice that period and permitted them so far to influence his official conduct that in his annual message to Congress, he announced the fallacious and paradoxical doctrine that though a state had no right to secede, the federal government had no right to coerce her to remain in the Union nor could he justify his non-action by the excuse that contumacious speeches and illegal resolves of parliamentary bodies might be tolerated under the American theory of free assemblage and free speech. Almost from the beginning of the secession movement, it was accompanied from time to time by overt acts, both of treason and war, notably by the occupation and seizure by military order and force of the seceding states, of twelve or fifteen harbor forts, one extensive navy yard, half a dozen arsenals, three mints, four important custom houses, three revenue cutters, and a variety of miscellaneous federal property, for all of which insults to the flag and infractions of the sovereignty of the United States, President Buchanan could recommend no more efficacious remedy or redress than to ask the voters of the country to reverse their decision given at the presidential election and to appoint a day of fasting and prayer on which to implore the Most High, quote, to remove from our hearts that false pride of opinion which would impel us to persevere in wrong for the sake of consistency, end quote. Nor must mention be omitted of the astounding phenomenon that, encouraged by President Buchanan's doctrine of non-coercion and purpose of non-action, a central cabal of Southern senators and representatives issued from Washington on December 14th their public proclamation of the duty of secession. Their executive committee, using one of the rooms of the Capitol building itself as the headquarters of the conspiracy and rebellion, they were appointed to lead and direct. During the month of December, while the active treason of cotton state officials and the fatal neglect of the federal executive were in their most damaging and demoralizing stages, an officer of the United States Army had the high courage and distinguished honor to give the ever-growing revolution its first effective check. Major Robert Anderson, though a Kentuckian by birth and allied by marriage to a Georgia family, was, late in November, placed in command of the federal forts in Charleston Harbor, and, having repeatedly reported that his little garrison of sixty men was insufficient for the defense of Fort Moultrie, and vainly asked for reinforcements which were not sent to him, he suddenly and secretly, on the night after Christmas, transferred his command from the insecure position of Moultrie to the strong and unapproachable walls of Fort Sumter, 
midway in the mouth of the charleston harbor where he could not be assailed by the raw charleston militia companies that had for weeks been threatening him with a storming assault in this stronghold surrounded on all sides by water he loyally held possession for the government and sovereignty of the united states the surprised and baffled rage of the south carolina rebels created a crisis at washington that resulted in the expulsion of the president's treacherous counselors and the reconstruction of mr buchanan's cabinet to unity and loyalty the new cabinet though unable to obtain president buchanan's consent to aggressive measures to re-establish the federal authority was nevertheless able to prevent further concessions to the insurrection and to effect a number of important defensive precautions among which was the already mentioned concentration of a small military force to protect the national capital meanwhile the governor of south carolina had begun the erection of batteries to isolate and besiege fort sumter and the first of these on a sand spit of morris island commanding the main ship channel by a few shots turned back on january ninth the merchant steamer star of the west in which general scott had attempted to send a reinforcement of two hundred recruits to major anderson battery building was continued with uninterrupted energy until a triangle of siege works was established on the projecting points of neighboring islands mounting a total of thirty guns and seventeen mortars manned and supported by a volunteer force of from four to six thousand men military preparation though not on so extensive or definite a scale was also carried on in the other revolted states and while mr lincoln was making his memorable journey from springfield to washington telegrams were printed in the newspapers from day to day showing that their delegates had met at montgomery alabama formed a provisional congress and adopted a constitution and government under the title of the confederate states of america of which they elected jefferson davis of mississippi president and alexander h stevens of georgia vice president it needs to be constantly borne in mind that the beginning of this vast movement was not a spontaneous revolution but a chronic conspiracy the secession of south carolina truly said one of the chief actors is not an event of a day it is not anything produced by mr lincoln's election or by the non-execution of the fugitive slave law it is a matter which has been gathering head for thirty years the central motive and dominating object of the revolution was frankly avowed by vice president stevens in a speech he made at savannah a few weeks after his inauguration Quote, the prevailing ideas entertained by him jefferson and most of the leading statesmen at the time of the formation of the old constitution were that the enslavement of the african was in violation of the laws of nature that it was wrong in principle socially morally and politically our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea its foundations are laid its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the negro is not equal to the white man that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition this our new government is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical philosophical and moral truth End quote. in the week which elapsed between mr lincoln's arrival in washington and the day of inauguration he exchanged the customary visits of ceremony with president buchanan his cabinet the supreme court the two houses of congress and other dignitaries in his rooms at willard's hotel he also held consultations with leading republicans about the final composition of his cabinet and pressing questions of public policy careful preparations had been made for the inauguration and under the personal eye of general scott the military force in the city was ready instantly to suppress any attempt to disturb the peace or quiet of the day on march fourth the outgoing and incoming presidents rode side by side in a carriage from the executive mansion to the capitol and back 
escorted by an imposing military and civic procession, and an immense throng of spectators heard the new executive read his inaugural address from the east portico of the capital. He stated frankly that a disruption of the Federal Union was being formidably attempted, and discussed dispassionately the theory and illegality of secession. He held that the Union was perpetual, that resolves and ordinances of disunion are legally void, and announced that to the extent of his ability he would faithfully execute the laws of the Union in all the states. The power confided to him would be used to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government, and to collect the duties and imposts. But beyond what might be necessary for these objects, there would be no invasion, no using of force against or among the people anywhere. Where hostility to the United States in any interior locality should be so great and universal as to prevent competent resident citizens from holding the federal offices, there would be no attempt to force obnoxious strangers among them for that object. The mails, unless repelled, would continue to be furnished in all parts of the Union, and this course would be followed until current events and experience should show a change to be necessary. To the South he made an earnest plea against the folly of this Union, and in favor of maintaining peace and fraternal goodwill, declaring that their property, peace, and personal security were in no danger from a Republican administration. Quote, One section of our country believes slavery is right and ought to be extended, he said, while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended. That is the only substantial dispute. Physically speaking, we cannot separate. We cannot remove our respective sections from each other, nor build an impassable wall between them. A husband and wife may be divorced and go out of the presence and beyond the reach of the other, but the different parts of our country cannot do this. They cannot but remain face to face, and intercourse, either amicable or hostile, must continue between them. Is it possible, then, to make that intercourse more advantageous or more satisfactory after separation than before? Can aliens make treaties easier than friends can make laws? Can treaties be more faithfully enforced between aliens than laws can among friends? Suppose you go to war. You cannot fight always. And when, after much loss on both sides, and no gain on either, you cease fighting, the identical old questions as to terms of intercourse are again upon you. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. End quote. But the peaceful policy here outlined was already more difficult to follow than Mr. Lincoln was aware. On the morning after inauguration, the Secretary of War brought to his notice freshly received letters from Major Anderson, commanding Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, announcing that in the course of a few weeks the provisions of the garrison would be exhausted, and therefore an evacuation or surrender would become necessary unless the fort were relieved by supplies or reinforcements, and this information was accompanied by the written opinions of the officers that to relieve the fort would require a well-appointed army of 20,000 men. The new president had appointed as his cabinet William H. Seward, Secretary of State, Salmon P. Chase, Secretary of the Treasury, Simon Cameron, Secretary of War, Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, Caleb B. Smith, Secretary of the Interior, Montgomery Blair, P. 
postmaster general, and Edward Bates, attorney general. The president and his official advisers at once called into council the highest military and naval officers of the Union to consider the new and pressing emergency revealed by the unexpected news from Sumter. The professional experts were divided in opinion. Relief by a force of 20,000 men was clearly out of the question. No such Union army existed, nor could one be created within the limit of time. The officers of the Navy thought that men and supplies might be thrown into the fort by swift-going vessels, while on the other hand, the Army officers believed that such an expedition would surely be destroyed by the formidable batteries which the insurgents had erected to close the harbor. In view of all of the conditions, Lieutenant General Scott, General-in-Chief of the Army, recommended the evacuation of the fort as a military necessity. President Lincoln, thereupon, asked the several members of his cabinet the written question, assuming it to be possible to now provision Fort Sumter under all the circumstances. Is it wise to attempt it? Only two members replied in the affirmative, while the other five argued against the attempt, holding that the country would recognize that the evacuation of the fort was not an indication of policy, but a necessity created by the neglect of the old administration. Under this advice, the president withheld his decision until he could gather further information. Meanwhile, three commissioners had arrived from the provisional government at Montgomery, Alabama, under the instructions to endeavor to negotiate a de facto and de jure recognition of the independence of the Confederate States. They were promptly informed by Mr. Seward that he could not receive them, that he did not see in the Confederate States a rightful and accomplished revolution and an independent nation, and that he was not at liberty to recognize the commissioners as diplomatic agents or to hold correspondence with them. Failing in this direct application, they made further efforts through Mr. Justice Campbell of the Supreme Court as a friendly intermediary, who came to Seward in the guise of a loyal official, though his correspondence with Jefferson Davis soon revealed a treasonable intent. In replying to Campbell's earnest entreaties that peace should be maintained, Seward informed him confidentially that the military status at Charleston would not be changed without notice to the governor of South Carolina. On March 29th, a cabinet meeting for the second time discussed the question of Sumter. Four of the seven members now voted in favor of an attempt to supply the fort with provisions, and the president signed a memorandum order to prepare certain ships for such an expedition under the command of Captain G. V. Fox. So far, Mr. Lincoln's new duties as President of the United States had not in any wise put him at a disadvantage with his constitutional advisers. Upon the old question of slavery, he was as well informed and had clearer convictions and purposes than either Seward or Chase and upon the newer question of secession and the immediate decision about Fort Sumter, which it involved, the members of his cabinet were, like himself, compelled to rely on the professional advice of experienced Army and Navy officers. Since these differed radically in their opinions, the President's own powers of perception and logic were as capable of forming a correct decision as men who had been governors and senators. He had reached at least a partial decision in the memorandum he gave Fox to prepare ships for the Sumter expedition. It must, therefore, have been a great surprise to the President when, on April 1st, Secretary of State Seward handed him a memorandum setting forth a number of most extraordinary propositions. For a full enumeration of the items, the reader must carefully study the entire document, which is printed below in a footnote but the principal points for which it had evidently been written and presented can be given in a few sentences. A month has elapsed, and the administration has neither a domestic nor a foreign policy. The administration must at once adopt and carry out a novel, radical, and aggressive policy. It must 
cease saying a word about slavery and raise a great outcry about union it must declare war against france and spain and combine and organize all the governments of north and south america in a crusade to enforce the monroe doctrine this policy once adopted it must be the business of someone incessantly to pursue it it is not in my especial province wrote mr seward but i neither seek to evade nor assume responsibility this phrase which is a key to the whole memorandum enables the reader easily to translate its meaning into something like the following after a month's trial you mr lincoln are a failure as president the country is in desperate straits and must use a desperate remedy that remedy is to submerge the south carolina insurrection in a continental war some new man must take the executive helm and wield the undivided presidential authority i should have been nominated at chicago and elected in november but am willing to take your place and perform your duties why william h seward who was fairly entitled to rank as a great statesman should have written this memorandum and presented it to mr lincoln has never been explained nor is it capable of explanation its suggestions were so visionary its reasoning so fallacious its assumptions so unwarranted its conclusions so malapropos that it falls below critical examination had mr lincoln been an envious or a resentful man he could not have wished for a better occasion to put a rival under his feet the president doubtless considered the incident one of phenomenal strangeness but it did not in the least disturb his unselfish judgment or mental equipoise there was in his answer no trace of excitement or passion he pointed out in a few sentences of simple quiet explanation that what the administration had done was exactly a foreign and domestic policy which the secretary of state himself had concurred in and helped to frame only that mr seward proposed to go further and give up sumter upon the central suggestion that some one mind must direct mr lincoln wrote with simple dignity quote, if this must be done i must do it when a general line of policy is adopted i apprehend that there is no danger of its being changed without good reason or continuing to be a subject of unnecessary debate still upon points arising in its progress i wish and suppose i am entitled to have the advice of all the cabinet End quote mr lincoln's unselfish magnanimity is the central marvel of the whole affair his reply ended the argument mr seward doubtless saw at once how completely he had put himself in the president's power apparently neither of the men ever again alluded to the incident no other persons except mr seward's son and the president's private secretary ever saw the correspondence or knew of the occurrence the president put the papers away in an envelope and no word of the affair came to public until a quarter of a century later when the details were published in mr lincoln's biography in one mind at least there was no further doubt that the cabinet had a master for only some weeks later mr seward is known to have written quote, there is but one vote in the cabinet and that is cast by the president End quote this mastery mr lincoln retained with a firm dignity throughout his administration when near the close of the war he sent mr seward to meet the rebel commissioners at the hampton roads conference he finished his short letter of instructions with the imperative sentence you will not assume to definitely consummate anything from this strange episode our narrative must return to the question of fort sumter on april fourth official notice was sent to major anderson of the coming relief with the instruction to hold out till the eleventh or twelfth if possible but authorizing him to capitulate whatever it might become necessary to save himself and command two days later the president sent a special messenger with written notice to the governor of south carolina that an attempt would be made to supply fort sumter with provisions only and that if such attempt were not resisted no further effort would be made to throw in men 
arms, or ammunition without further notice, or unless in case of an attack on the fort. The building of batteries around Fort Sumter had begun, under the orders of Governor Pickens, about the 1st of January, and continued with industry and energy, and about the 1st of March, General Beauregard, an accomplished engineer officer, was sent by the Confederate government to take charge of and complete the works. On April 1st, he telegraphed to Montgomery, batteries ready to open Wednesday or Thursday. What instructions? At this point, the Confederate authorities at Montgomery found themselves face to face with the fatal alternative either to begin war or to allow their rebellion to collapse. Their claim to independence was denied, their commissioners were refused a hearing, yet not an angry word, provoking threat, nor harmful act had come from President Lincoln. He had promised them peace, protection, freedom from irritation had offered them the benefit of the mails. Even now, all he proposed to do was not to send guns or ammunition or men to Sumter, but only bread and provisions to Anderson and his soldiers. His prudent policy placed them in the exact attitude described a month earlier in his inaugural. They could have no conflict without being themselves the aggressors. But the rebellion was organized by ambitious men with desperate intentions. A member of the Alabama legislature, present at Montgomery, said to Jefferson Davis and three members of his cabinet, Gentlemen, unless you sprinkle blood in the face of the people of Alabama, they will be back in the old Union in less than ten days. And the sanguinary advice was adopted. In answer to his question, what instructions, Beauregard, on April 10th, was ordered to demand the evacuation of Fort Sumter and, in case of refusal, to reduce it. The demand was presented to Anderson, who replied that he would evacuate the fort by noon of April 15th unless assailed, or unless he received supplies or controlling instructions from his government. This answer being unsatisfactory to Beauregard, he sent Anderson notice that he would open fire on Sumter at 420 on the morning of April 12th. Promptly at the hour indicated, the bombardment was begun. As has been related, the rebel siege works were built on the points of the islands forming the harbor, at distances varying from 1,300 to 2,500 yards, and numbered 19 batteries, with an armament of 47 guns, supported by a land force of from four to 6,000 volunteers. The disproportion between means of attack and defense was enormous. Sumter, though a work 300 by 350 feet in size, with well-constructed walls and casemats of brick, was in very meager preparation for such a conflict. Of its 48 available guns, only 21 were in the casemats, 27 being on the ramparts in Barbet. The garrison consisted of nine commissioned officers, 68 non-commissioned officers and privates, eight musicians, and 43 non-combatant workmen compelled by the besiegers to remain to hasten the consumption of provisions. Under the fire of the 17 mortars and the rebel batteries, Anderson could reply only with a vertical fire from the guns of small caliber in his casemats which was of no effect against the rebel bomb proofs of sand and roofs of sloping railroad iron. But, refraining from exposing his men to serve his barbette guns, his garrison was also safe in its protecting casemats. It happened, therefore, that although the attack was spirited and the defense resolute, the combat went on for a day and a half without a single casualty. It came to an end on the second day, only when the cartridges of the garrison were exhausted, and the red hot shot from the rebel batteries had set the buildings used as officers' quarters on fire, creating heat and smoke that rendered further defense impossible. There was also the further discouragement that the expedition of relief, which Anderson had been instructed to look for on the 11th or 12th, had failed to appear.
several unforeseen contingencies had prevented the assembling of the vessels at the appointed rendezvous outside charleston harbor though some of them reached it in time to hear the opening guns of the bombardment but as accident had deranged and thwarted the plan agreed upon they could do nothing except impatiently await the issue of the fight a little after noon of april thirteenth when the flagstaff of the fort had been shot away and its guns remained silent an invitation to capitulate with the honors of war came from general beauregard which anderson accepted and on the following day sunday april fourteenth he hauled down his flag with impressive ceremonies and leaving the fort with his faithful garrison proceeded in a steamer to new york End of chapter 13。r 14 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 14. President's Proclamation Calling for 75 Regiments. Responses of the Governors. Maryland and Virginia. The Baltimore Riot. Washington Isolated. Lincoln Takes the Responsibility. Robert E. Lee. Arrival of the New York 7th, Suspension of Habeas Corpus, The Annapolis Route, Butler in Baltimore, Taney on the Merriman Case, Kentucky, Missouri, Lyon Captures Camp Jackson, Boonville Skirmish, The Missouri Convention, Gamble Made Governor, The Border States. The bombardment of Fort Sumter changed the political situation as if by magic. There was no longer room for doubt, hesitation, concession, or compromise. Without awaiting the arrival of the ships that were bringing provisions to Anderson's starving garrison, the hostile Charleston batteries had opened their fire on the fort by the formal order of the Confederate government, and peaceable secession was, without provocation, changed to active war. The rebels gained possession of the Charleston Harbor, but their mode of obtaining it awakened the patriotism of the American people to a stern determination that the insult to the national authority and flag should be redressed, and the unrighteous experiment of a rival government founded on slavery as its cornerstone should never succeed. Under the conflict, thus began the long-tolerated barbarous institution itself was destined ignobly to perish on his journey from springfield to washington mr lincoln had said that devoted as he was to peace he might find it necessary quote, to put the foot down firmly end quote. that time had now come on the morning of April 15, 1861, the leading newspapers of the country printed the President's proclamation, reciting that, whereas the laws of the United States were opposed and the execution thereof obstructed in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings, the militia of the several states of the Union, to the aggregate number of 75,000, was called forth to suppress said combinations and cause the laws to be duly executed. The orders of the War Department specify that the period of service under this call should be for three months and to further conform to the provisions of the act of 1795 under which the call was issued the president's proclamation also convened the congress in special session on the coming fourth of july 
public opinion in the free states which had been sadly demoralized by the long discussions over slavery and by the existence of four factions in the late presidential campaign was instantly crystallized and consolidated by the sumter bombardment and the president's proclamation into a sentiment of united support to the government for the suppression of rebellion the several free state governors sent loyal and enthusiastic responses to the call for militia and tendered double the numbers asked for the people of the slave states which had not yet joined the montgomery confederacy namely virginia north carolina tennessee arkansas missouri kentucky maryland and delaware remained however more or less divided on the issue as it now presented itself the governors of the first six of these were already so much engaged in the secret intrigues of the secession movement that they sent the secretary of war contumacious and insulting replies and distinct refusals to the president's call for troops the governor of delaware answered that there was no organized militia in his state which he had legal authority to command but that the officers of organized volunteer regiments might at their own option offer their services to the united states while the governor of maryland in complying with the requisition stipulated that the regiments from his state should not be required to serve outside its limits except to defend the district of columbia a swift almost bewildering rush of events however quickly compelled most of them to take sides secession feeling was rampant in baltimore and when the first armed and equipped northern regiment the massachusetts sixth passed through that city on the morning of april nineteenth on its way to washington the last four of its companies were assailed by street mobs with missiles and firearms while marching from one depot to the other and in the running fight which ensued four of its soldiers were killed and about thirty wounded while the mob probably lost two or three times as many this tragedy instantly threw the whole city into a wild frenzy of insurrection that same afternoon an immense secession meeting in monument square listened to a torrent of treasonable protest and denunciation in which governor hicks himself was made momentarily to join the militia was called out preparations were made to arm the city and that night the railroad bridges were burned between baltimore and the pennsylvania line to prevent the further transit of union regiments the revolutionary furor spread to the country towns and for a whole week the union flag practically disappeared from maryland while these events were taking place to the north equally threatening incidents were occurring to the south of washington the state of virginia had been for many weeks balancing uneasily between loyalty and succession in the new revolutionary stress her weak remnant of conditional unionism gave way and on april seventeenth two days after the president's call her state convention secretly passed a secession ordinance while governor letcher ordered a military seizure of the united states navy yard at norfolk and the united states armory at harper's ferry under orders from washington both establishments were burned to prevent their falling into insurrectionary hands but the destruction in each case was only partial and much valuable war material thus passed to rebel uses all these hostile occurrences put the national capital in the greatest danger for three days it was entirely cut off from communication with the north by either telegraph or mail under the orders of general scott the city was hastily prepared for a possible siege the flour at the mills and other stores of provisions were taken possession of the capitol and other public buildings were barricaded and detachments of troops stationed in them business was suspended by a common impulse streets were almost deserted except by squads of military patrol shutters of stores and even many residences remained unopened throughout the day the signs were none too reassuring 
In addition to the public rumors whispered about by serious faces on the streets, General Scott reported in writing to President Lincoln on the evening of April 22nd, Of rumors, the following are probable. First, that from 1,500 to 2,000 troops are at the White House, four miles below Mount Vernon, a narrow point in the Potomac engaged in erecting a battery. Second, that an equal force is collected or in progress of assemblage on the two sides of the river to attack Fort Washington. And third, that extra cars went up yesterday to bring down from Harper's Ferry about 2,000 other troops to join in a general attack on this capital. That is, on many of its fronts at once. I feel confident that with our present forces, we can defend the Capitol, the Arsenal, and all the executive buildings, seven, against 10,000 troops not better than our district volunteers. Throughout this crisis, President Lincoln not only maintained his composure, but promptly assumed the high responsibilities the occasion demanded. On Sunday, April 21st, he summoned his cabinet to meet at the Navy Department, and with their unanimous concurrence issued a number of emergency orders relating to the purchase of ships, the transportation of troops and munitions of war, the advance of $2 million of money to a Union Safety Committee in New York, and other military and naval measures, which were dispatched in duplicate by private messengers over unusual and circuitous routes. In a message to Congress, in which he afterward explained these extraordinary transactions, he said, quote, It became necessary for me to choose whether, using only the existing means, agencies, and processes which Congress had provided, I should let the government fall at once into ruin, or whether, availing myself on the broader powers conferred by the Constitution in cases of insurrection, I would make an effort to save it with all its blessings for the present age and for posterity." End quote. Unwelcome as was the thought of a possible capture of Washington City, President Lincoln's mind was much more disturbed by many suspicious indications of disloyalty in public officials, and especially in officers of the Army and Navy. Hundreds of clerks of Southern birth employed in the various departments suddenly left their desks and went south. The commandment of the Washington Navy Yard and the quartermaster general of the army resigned their positions to take service under Jefferson Davis. One morning, the captain of a light battery on which General Scott had placed special reliance for the defense of Washington came to the president at the White House to asseverate and protest his loyalty and fidelity, and that same night secretly left his post and went to Richmond to become a Confederate officer. The most prominent case, however, was that of Colonel Robert E. Lee, the officer who captured John Brown at Harper's Ferry and who afterward became the leader of the Confederate armies. As a lieutenant, he had served on the staff of General Scott in the war with Mexico. Personally knowing his ability, Scott recommended him to Lincoln as the most suitable officer to command the Union Army about to be assembled under the President's call for 75 regiments, and this command was informally tendered him through a friend. Lee, however, declined the offer, explaining that, quote, though opposed to secession and deprecating war, I could take no part in an invasion of the southern states, end quote. He resigned his commission in a letter written on April 20th, and without waiting for notice of its acceptance, which alone could discharge him from his military obligation, proceeded to Richmond, where he was formally and publicly invested with the command of the Virginia military and naval forces on April 22nd. While two days later, the rebel vice president, Alexander H. Stevens, and a committee of the Richmond Convention signed a formal military league, making Virginia an immediate member of the Confederate States, and placing her armies under the command of Jefferson Davis. 
the sudden uprising in maryland and the insurrectionary activity in virginia had been largely stimulated by the dream of the leading conspirators that their new confederacy would combine all the slave states and that by the adhesion of both maryland and virginia they would fall heir to a ready-made seat of government while the bombardment of sumter was in progress the rebel secretary of war announcing the news in a jubilant speech at montgomery in the presence of jefferson davis and his colleagues confidently predicted that the rebel flag would before the end of may quote, float over the dome of the capitol at washington end quote. the disloyal demonstrations in maryland and virginia rendered such a hope so plausible that jefferson davis telegraphed to governor letcher at richmond that he was preparing to send him thirteen regiments and added quote, sustain baltimore if practicable we reinforce you End quote. while senator mason hurried to that city personally to furnish advice and military assistance but the flattering expectation was not realized the requisite preparation and concert of action were both wanting the union troops from new york and new england pouring into philadelphia flanked the obstructions of the baltimore route by devising a new one by way of chesapeake bay and annapolis and the opportune arrival of the seventh regiment of new york and washington on april twenty fifth rendered that city entirely safe against surprise or attack relieved the apprehension of officials and citizens and renewed its business and public activity the mob frenzy of baltimore and the maryland towns subsided almost as quickly as it had risen the union leaders and newspapers asserted themselves and soon demonstrated their superiority in numbers and activity serious embarrassment had been created by the timidity of governor hicks who while baltimore remained under mob terrorism officially protested against the landing of union troops at annapolis and still worse summoned the maryland legislature to meet on april twenty sixth a step which he had theretofore stubbornly refused to take this event had become doubly dangerous because a Baltimore City election held during the same terror week had reinforced the legislature with ten secession members, creating a majority eager to pass a secession ordinance at the first opportunity. The question of either arresting or dispersing the body by military force was one of the problems which the crisis forced upon President Lincoln. On full reflection, he decided against either measure i think it would not be justifiable he wrote to general scott nor efficient for the desired object first they have a clearly legal right to assemble and we cannot know in advance that their action will not be lawful and peaceful and if we wait until they shall have acted their arrest or dispersion will not lessen the effect of their action secondly we cannot permanently prevent their action if we arrest them we cannot long hold them as prisoners and when liberated they will immediately reassemble and take their action and precisely the same if we simply disperse them they will immediately reassemble in some other place i therefore conclude that it is only left to the commanding general to watch and await their action which if it shall be to arm their people against the united states he is to adopt the most prompt and efficient means to counteract, even if necessary, to the bombardment of their cities, and, in the extremest necessity, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. End quote. Two days later, the President formally authorized General Scott to suspend the writ of habeas corpus along his military lines or in their vicinity if resistance should render it necessary arrivals of additional troops enabled the general to strengthen his military hold on annapolis and the railroads and on may thirteenth general b f butler with about one thousand men moved into baltimore and established a fortified camp on federal hill the bulk of his force being the sixth massachusetts which had been mobbed in that city on april nineteenth 
already on the previous day the bridges and railroad had been repaired and the regular transit of troops through the city re-established under these changing conditions the secession majority of the maryland legislature did not venture on any official treason they sent a committee to interview the president vented their hostility in spiteful reports and remonstrances and prolonged their session by a recess nevertheless so inveterate was their disloyalty and plotting against the authority of the union that four months later it became necessary to place the leaders under arrest finally to head off their darling project of a maryland secession ordinance one additional incidence of this insurrectionary period remains to be noticed one john merriman claiming to be a confederate lieutenant was arrested in baltimore for enlisting men for the rebellion and chief justice taney of the united states supreme court the famous author of the dred scott decision issued a writ of habeas corpus to obtain his release from fort mchenry under the president's orders general cadwallader of course declined to obey the writ upon this the chief justice ordered the general's arrest for contempt but the officer sent to serve the writ was refused entrance to the fort in turn the indignant chief justice taking counsel of his passion instead of his patriotism announced dogmatically that quote, the president under the constitution and laws of the united states cannot suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus nor authorize any military officer to do so end quote and some weeks afterward filed a long written opinion in support of this dictum it is unnecessary here to quote the opinions of several eminent jurists who successfully refuted his labored argument nor to repeat the vigorous analysis with which in his special message to congress of july fourth president lincoln vindicated his own authority while these events were occurring in maryland and virginia the remaining slave states were gradually taking sides some for others against rebellion under radical and revolutionary leadership similar to that of the cotton states the governors and state officials of north carolina tennessee and arkansas placed their states in an attitude of insurrection and before the middle of may practically joined them to the confederate government by the formalities of military leagues and secession ordinances but in the border slave states that is those contiguous to the free states the eventual result was different in these though secession intrigue and sympathy were strong and though their governors and state officials favored the rebellion the underlying loyalty and unionism of the people thwarted their revolutionary schemes this happened even in the northwestern part of virginia itself the forty-eight counties of that state lying north of the alleghanies and adjoining pennsylvania and ohio repudiated the action at richmond seceded from secession and established a loyal provisional state government president lincoln recognized them and sustained them with military aid and in due time they became organized and admitted to the union as the state of west virginia in delaware though some degree of secession feeling existed it was too insignificant to produce any noteworthy public demonstration in kentucky the political struggle was deep and prolonged the governor twice called the legislature together to initiate secession proceedings but that body refused compliance and warded off his scheme by voting to maintain the state neutrality next the governor sought to utilize the military organization known as the state guard to effect his object the union leaders offset this movement by enlisting several volunteer union regiments at the june election nine union congressmen were chosen and only one secessionist while in august a new legislature was elected with a three-fourths union majority in each branch other secession intrigues proved equally abortive 
and when finally in september confederate armies invaded kentucky at three different points the kentucky legislature invited the union armies of the west into the state to expel them and voted to place forty thousand union volunteers at the service of president lincoln in missouri the struggle was more fierce but also more brief as far back as january the conspirators had perfected a scheme to obtain possession through the treachery of the officer in charge of the important jefferson barracks arsenal at st louis with its store of sixty thousand stand of arms and a million and a half cartridges the project however failed rumors of the danger came to general scott who ordered thither a company of regulars under the command of captain nathaniel lyon an officer not only loyal by nature and habit but also imbued with strong anti-slavery convictions lyon found valuable support in the watchfulness of a union safety committee composed of leading st louis citizens who secretly organized a number of union regiments recruited largely from the heavy german population and from these sources lyon was enabled to make such a show of available military force as effectively to deter any mere popular uprising to seize the arsenal a state convention elected to pass a secession ordinance resulted unexpectedly to the conspirators in the return of a majority of union delegates who voted down the secession program and adjourned to the following december thereupon the secession governor ordered his state militia into temporary camps of instruction with the idea of taking missouri out of the union by a concerted military movement one of these encampments established at st louis and named camp jackson in honor of the governor furnished such unquestionable evidences of intended treason that captain lyon whom president lincoln had meanwhile authorized to enlist ten thousand union volunteers and if necessary to proclaim martial law made a sudden march upon camp jackson with his regulars and six of his newly enlisted regiments stationed his force in commanding positions around the camp and demanded its surrender the demand was complied with after but slight hesitation and the captured militia regiments were on the following day disbanded under parole unfortunately as the prisoners were being marched away a secession mob insulted and attacked some of lyon's regiments and provoked a return fire in which about twenty persons mainly lookers-on were killed or wounded and for a day or two the city was thrown into the panic and lawlessness of a reign of terror upon this the legislature in session at jefferson city the capital of the state with a three-fourth secession majority rushed through the forms of legislation a military bill placing the military and financial resources of missouri under the governor's control for a month longer various incidents delayed the culmination of the approaching struggle each side continuing its preparations and constantly accentuating the rising antagonism the crisis came when on june eleventh governor jackson and captain lyon now made brigadier general by the president met in an interview at st louis in this interview the governor demanded that he be permitted to exercise sole military command to maintain the neutrality of missouri while lyon insisted that the federal military authority must be left in unrestricted control it being impossible to reach any agreement governor jackson hurried back to his capital burning railroad bridges behind him as he went and on the following day june twelfth issued his proclamation calling out fifty thousand state militia and denouncing the lincoln administration as quote, an unconstitutional military despotism end quote lyon was also prepared for this contingency on the afternoon of june thirteenth he embarked with a regular battery and several battalions of his union volunteers on steamboats moved rapidly up the missouri river to jefferson city drove the governor and the secession legislature into precipitate flight took possession of the capital and continuing his expedition 
scattered after a slight skirmish a small rebel military force which had hastily collected at boonville rapidly following these events the loyal members of the missouri state convention which had in february refused to pass a secession ordinance were called together and passed ordinances under which was constituted a loyal state government that maintained the local civil authority of the united states throughout the greater part of missouri during the whole of the civil war only temporarily interrupted by invasions of transient confederate armies from arkansas it will be seen from the foregoing outline that the original hope of the southern leaders to make the ohio river the northern boundary of their slave empire was not realized they indeed secured the adhesion of virginia north carolina tennessee and arkansas by which the territory of the confederate states government was enlarged nearly one-third and its population and resources nearly doubled but the northern tier of slave states maryland west virginia kentucky and missouri not only decidedly refused to join the rebellion but remained true to the union and this reduced the contest to a trial of military strength between eleven states with five million one hundred fifteen thousand seven hundred ninety whites and three million five hundred eight thousand one hundred thirty one slaves against twenty four states with twenty one million six hundred eleven four hundred twenty two whites and three hundred forty two thousand two hundred twelve slaves and at least a proportionate difference in all other resources of war at the very outset the conditions were prophetic of the result end of chapter fourteen fifteen of a short life of abraham lincoln this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. this reading by allison hester of athens georgia a short life of abraham lincoln by john g nicolay chapter fifteen davis's proclamation for privateers lincoln's proclamation of blockade the call for three years volunteers Southern military preparations, rebel capital moved to Richmond, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas admitted to Confederate states, desertion of Army and Navy officers, Union troops fortify Virginia short of the Potomac, concentration at Harper's Ferry, concentration at Fortress Monroe and Cairo, English neutrality. Seward's 21st of May, Dispatch. Lincoln's Corrections. Preliminary Skirmishes. Forward to Richmond. Plan of McDowell's Campaign. From the slower political developments in the border slave states, we must return and follow up the primary hostilities of the rebellion. The bombardment of Sumter, President Lincoln's call for troops, the Baltimore riot, the burning of Harper's Ferry Armory and Norfolk Navy Yard, and the interruption of railroad communication, which, for nearly a week, isolated the capital and threatened it with siege and possible capture, fully demonstrated the beginning of serious civil war. Jefferson Davis's proclamation on April 17th of intention to issue letters of Mark was met two days later by President Lincoln's counter-proclamation, instituting a blockade of the southern ports and declaring that privateers would be held amenable to the laws against piracy. His first call for 75,000 three-months militia was dictated as to numbers by the sudden emergency and as to form and term of service by the provisions of the Act of 1795, it needed only a few days to show that this form of enlistment was both cumbrous and inadequate, and the creation of a more powerful army was almost immediately begun. 
On May 3rd, a new proclamation was issued, calling into service 42,034 three years volunteers, 22,714 enlisted men to add 10 regiments to the regular army, and 18,000 seamen for blockade service, a total immediate increase of 82,748 swelling the entire military establishment to an army of 156,861 and a navy of 25,000. No express authority of law yet existed for these measures, but President Lincoln took the responsibility of ordering them, trusting that Congress would legalize his acts. His confidence was entirely justified. At the special session, which met under his proclamation on the 4th of July, these acts were declared valid, and he was authorized, moreover, to raise an army of a million men and $250 million in money to carry on the war and suppress the rebellion, while other legislation conferred upon him supplementary authority to meet the emergency. Meanwhile, the first effort of the governors of the loyal states was to furnish their quotas under the first call for militia. This was easy enough as to men. It required only a few days to fill the regiments and forward them to the state capitals and principal cities, but to arm and equip them for the field on the spur of the moment was a difficult task which involved much confusion and delay even though existing armories and foundries pushed their work to the utmost and new ones were established. Under the militia call, the governors appointed all the officers required by their respective quotas, from company lieutenant to major general of division, while under the new call for three years volunteers, their authority was limited to the simple organization of regiments. In the South, war preparation also immediately became active. All the indications are that up to their attack on Sumter, the Southern leaders hoped to effect separation through concession and compromise by the North. That hope, of course, disappeared with South Carolina's opening guns, and the Confederate government made what haste it could to meet the ordeal it dreaded, even while it had provoked it. The rebel Congress was hastily called together and passed acts recognizing war and regulating privateering, admitting Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas to the Confederate States, authorizing a $50 million loan, practically confiscating debts due from Southern to Northern citizens, and removing the seat of government from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. Four different calls for Southern volunteers had been made, aggregating 82,000 men, and Jefferson Davis's message now proposed to further organize and hold in readiness an army of 100,000. The work of erecting forts and batteries for defense was being rapidly pushed at all points, on the Atlantic coast, on the Potomac, and on the Mississippi and other western streams. For the present, the Confederates were well supplied with cannon and small arms from the captured navy yards at Norfolk and Pensacola, and the six or eight arsenals located in the South. The martial spirit of their people was roused to the highest enthusiasm, and there was no lack of volunteers to fill the companies and regiments which the Confederate legislators authorized Davis to accept either by regular calls on state executives in accordance with, or singly in defiance of, their central dogma of states' rights, as he might prefer. The secession of the southern states not only strengthened the rebellion with the arms and supplies stored in the various military and navy depots within their limits, and the fortifications erected for their defense, what was of yet greater help to the revolt a considerable portion of the officers of the army and navy, perhaps one-third, abandoned the allegiance which they had sworn to the United States, and, under the false doctrine of the state supremacy taught by southern leaders, gave their professional skill and experience to the destruction of the government which had educated and honored them. 
The defection of Robert E. Lee was a conspicuous example, and his loss to the Union in service to the rebel army cannot easily be measured. So also were the similar cases of Adjutant General Cooper and Quartermaster General Johnston. In gratifying contrast stands the steadfast loyalty and devotion of Lieutenant General Winfield Scott, who, though he was a Virginian and loved his native state, never wavered an instant in his allegiance to the flag he had heroically followed in the War of 1812 and triumphantly planted over the capital of Mexico in 1847. Though unable to take the field, he, as general-in-chief, directed the assembling and first movements of the Union troops. The largest part of the three months regiments were ordered to Washington City as the most important position in a political and most exposed in a military point of view. The great machine of war, once started, moved, as it always does, by its own inherent energy from arming to concentration, from concentration to skirmish and battle. It was not long before Washington was a military camp. Gradually, the hesitation to invade the sacred soil of the South faded out under the stern necessity to forestall an invasion of the equally sacred soil of the North. And on May 24th, the Union regiments in Washington crossed the Potomac and placed themselves in a great semicircle of formidable earthworks 18 miles long on the Virginia shore from Chain Bridge to Hunting Creek, below Alexandria. Meanwhile, a secondary concentration of force developed itself at Harper's Ferry, 49 miles northwest of Washington. When, on April 20th, a Union detachment had burned and abandoned the armory at that point, it was at once occupied by a handful of rebel militia, and immediately thereafter, Jefferson Davis had hurried his regiments thither to sustain or overall Baltimore, and when that prospect failed, it became a rebel camp of instruction. Afterward, as Major General Patterson collected his Pennsylvania quota, he turned it toward that point as a probable field of operations. As a mere town, Harper's Ferry was unimportant, but lying on the Potomac, and being at the head of the great Shenandoah Valley, down which not only a good turnpike, but also an effective railroad ran southeastward to the very heart of the Confederacy. It was, and remained through the entire war, a strategical line of the first importance, protected, as the Shenandoah Valley was, by the main chain of the Alleghenies on the west and the Blue Ridge on the east. A part of the eastern quotas had also been hurried to Fortress Monroe, Virginia, lying at the mouth of Chesapeake Bay, which became and continued an important base for naval as well as military operations. In the west, even more important than St. Louis, was the little town of Cairo, lying at the extreme southern end of the state of Illinois, at the confluence of the Ohio River with the Mississippi. Commanding, as it did, thousands of miles of river navigation in three different directions, and being also the southernmost point of the earliest military frontier, it had been the first care of General Scott to occupy it. And, indeed, it proved itself to be the military key of the whole Mississippi Valley. It was not an easy thing promptly to develop a military policy for the suppression of the rebellion. The so-called Confederate States of America covered a military field having more than six times the area of Great Britain, with a coastline of over 3,500 miles and an interior frontier of over 7,000 miles. Much less was it possible promptly to plan and set on foot concise military campaigns to reduce the insurgent states to allegiance. Even the great military genius of General Scott was unable to do more than suggest a vague outline for the work. 
the problem was not only too vast but as yet too indefinite since the political future of west virginia kentucky and missouri still hung in more or less uncertainty the passive and negligent attitude which the buchanan administration had maintained toward the insurrection during the whole three months between the presidential election and mr lincoln's inauguration gave the rebellion an immense advantage in the courts and cabinets of europe until within three days of the end of buchanan's term not a word of protest or even explanation was sent to counteract the impression that disunion was likely to become permanent indeed the non-coercion doctrine of buchanan's message was in the eyes of european statesmen equivalent to an acknowledgment of such a result and the formation of the confederate government followed so quickly by the fall of fort sumter seemed to them a practical realization of their forecast the course of events appeared not merely to fulfill their expectations but also in the case of england and france gratified their eager hopes to england it promised cheap cotton and free trade with the south to france it appeared to open the way for colonial ambitions which napoleon the third so soon set on foot an imperial scale before charles francis adams whom president lincoln appointed as the new minister to england arrived in london and obtained an interview with lord john russell mr seward had already received several items of disagreeable news one was that prior to his arrival the queen's proclamation of neutrality had been published practically raising the confederate states to the rank of a belligerent power and before they had a single privateer afloat giving these an equality in british ports with united states ships of war another was that an understanding had been reached between england and france which would lead both governments to take the same course as to recognition whatever that course might be third that three diplomatic agents of the confederate states were in london whom the british minister had not yet seen but whom he had caused to be informed that he was not unwilling to see unofficially under the irritation produced by this hasty and equivocal action of the british government mr seward wrote a despatch to mr adams under date of may twenty first which had it been sent in the form of the original draft would scarcely have failed to lead to war between the two nations while it justly set forth with emphasis and courage what the government of the united states would endure and what it would not endure from foreign powers during the southern insurrection its phraseology written in a heat of indignation was so blunt and exasperating as to imply intentional disrespect when mr seward read the document to president lincoln the latter at once perceived its objectionable tone and retained it for further reflection a second reading confirmed his first impression thereupon taking his pen the frontier lawyer in a careful revision of the whole despatch so amended and changed the work of the trained and experienced statesman as entirely to eliminate its offensive crudeness and bring it within all the dignity and reserve of the most studied diplomatic courtesy if after mr seward's remarkable memorandum of april first the secretary of state had needed any further experience to convince him of the president's mastery in both administrative and diplomatic judgment this second incident afforded him the full evidence no previous president had ever had such a sudden increase of official work devolve upon him as president lincoln during the early months of his administration the radical change of parties through which he was elected not only literally filled the white house with applicants for office but practically compelled a wholesale substitution of new appointees for the old to represent the new thought and will of the nation the task of selecting these was greatly complicated by the sharp competition between the heterogeneous elements of which the republican party was composed 
This work was not half completed when the Sumter bombardment initiated active rebellion and precipitated the new difficulty of sifting the loyal from the disloyal and the yet more pressing labor of scrutinizing the organization of the immense new volunteer army called into service by the proclamation of May 3rd. Mr. Lincoln used often to say at this period, when besieged by claims to appointment, that he felt like a man letting rooms at one end of his house, while the other end was on fire. In addition to this merely routine work was the much more delicate and serious duty of deciding the hundreds of novel questions affecting the constitutional principles and theories of administration. The great departments of government, especially those of war and navy, could not immediately expedite either the supervision or clerical details of this sudden expansion, and almost every case of resulting confusion and delay was brought by impatient governors and state officials to the president for complaint and correction. Volunteers were coming rapidly enough to the various rendezvous in the different states, but where were the rations to feed them, money to pay them, tents to shelter them, uniforms to clothe them, rifles to arm them, officers to drill and instruct them, or transportation to carry them? In this carnival of patriotism, this hurly-burly of organization, the weaknesses as well as the virtues of human nature quickly developed themselves, and there was manifest not only the inevitable friction of personal rivalry, but also the disturbing and baneful effects of occasional falsehood and dishonesty, which could not always be immediately traced to the responsible culprit. It happened in many instances that there were alarming discrepancies between the full paper regiments and brigades reported as ready to start from the state capitals and the actual number of recruits that railroad trains brought to the Washington camps. And Mr. Lincoln several times ironically compared the process to that of a man trying to shovel a bushel of fleas across a barn floor. While the month of May insensibly slipped away amid these preparatory vexations, camps of instruction rapidly grew to small armies at a few principal points even under such incidental delay and loss. And during June, the confronting Union and Confederate forces began to produce the conflicts and casualties of earnest war. As yet, they were both few and unimportant. The assassination of Ellsworth when Alexandria was occupied, a slight cavalry skirmish at Fairfax Courthouse, the rout of a Confederate regiment at Philippi, West Virginia, the blundering leadership through which two Union detachments fired upon each other in the dark at Big Bethel, Virginia, the ambush of a Union railroad train at Vienna Station, and Lyon skirmish, which scattered the first collection of rebels at Boonville, Missouri. Comparatively speaking, all these were trivial in numbers of dead and wounded, the first few drops of blood before the heavy sanguinary showers the future was destined to bring. But the effect upon the public was irritating and painful to a degree entirely out of proportion to their real extent and gravity. The relative loss and gain in these affairs was not greatly unequal. The victories of Philippi and Boonville easily offset the disasters of Big Bethel and Vienna. But the public mind was not yet schooled to patience and to the fluctuating chances of war. The newspapers demanded prompt progress and ample victory as imperatively as they were wont to demand party triumph in politics or achievement in commercial enterprise. Forward to Richmond, repeated the New York Tribune day after day, and many sheets of lesser note and influence echoed the cry. There seemed, indeed, a certain reason for this clamor, because the period of enlistment of the three months' regiments was already two-thirds gone, and they were not yet all armed and equipped for field service. President Lincoln was fully alive to the need of meeting this popular demand. 
the special session of congress was soon to begin and to it the new administration must look not only to ratify what had been done but to authorize a large increase of the military force and heavy loans for coming expenses of the war on june twenty ninth therefore he called his cabinet and principal military officers to a council of war at the executive mansion to discuss a more formidable campaign than had yet been planned general scott was opposed to such an undertaking at that time he preferred waiting until autumn meanwhile organizing and drilling a large army with which to move down the mississippi and end the war with a final battle at new orleans aside from the obvious military objections to this course such a procrastination in the present irritation of the public temper was not to be thought of and the old general gracefully waived his preference and contributed his best judgment to the perfecting of an immediate campaign into virginia the confederate forces in virginia had been gathered by the orders of general lee into a defensive position at the manassas junction where a railroad from richmond and another from harper's ferry come together here general beauregard who had organized and conducted the sumter bombardment had command of a total of about twenty five thousand men which he was drilling the junction was fortified with some slight field works and fifteen heavy guns supported by a garrison of two thousand while the main body was camped in a line of seven miles length behind bull run a winding sluggish stream flowing southeasterly toward the potomac the distance was about thirty two miles southwest of washington another confederate force of about ten thousand under general j e johnston was collected at winchester and harper's ferry on the potomac to guard the entrance to the shenandoah valley and an understanding existed between johnston and beauregard that in case either were attacked the other would come to his aid by the quick railroad transportation between the two places the new Union plan contemplated that Brigadier General McDowell should march from Washington against Manassas and Bull Run with a force sufficient to beat Beauregard, while General Patterson, who had concentrated the bulk of the Pennsylvania regiments in the neighborhood of Harper's Ferry in numbers nearly or quite double that of his antagonist, should move against Johnston and either fight or hold him so that he could not come to the aid of beauregard at the council mcdowell emphasized the danger of such a junction but general scott assured him if johnston joins beauregard he shall have patterson on his heels with this understanding mcdowell's movement was ordered to begin on july ninth end of chapter fifteen Chapter 16 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 16 Congress the president's message men and money voted the contraband dennison appoints mcclellan rich mountain mcdowell bull run patterson's failure mcclellan at washington while these preparations for a virginia campaign were going on another campaign was also slowly shaping itself in western virginia but before either of them reached any decisive results the thirty-seventh congress chosen at the presidential election of eighteen sixty met in special session on the fourth of july eighteen sixty one in pursuance of the president's proclamation of april fifteenth there being no members present in either branch from the seceded states the number in each house was reduced nearly one-third a great change in party feeling was also manifest 
no more rampant secession speeches were to be heard of the rare instances of men who were yet to join the rebellion ex-vice president breckinridge was the most conspicuous example and their presence was offset by prominent southern unionists like andrew johnson of tennessee and john j crittenden of kentucky the heated antagonisms which had divided the previous congress into four clearly defined factions were so far restrained or obliterated by the events of the past four months as to leave but a feeble opposition to the republican majority now dominant in both branches which was itself rendered moderate and prudent by the new conditions the message of president lincoln was temperate in spirit but positive and strong in argument reciting the secession and rebellion of the confederate states and their unprovoked assault on fort sumter he continued quote, having said to them in the inaugural address you can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors he took pains not only to keep this declaration good but also to keep the case so free from the power of ingenious sophistry that the world should not be able to misunderstand it by the affair at fort sumter with its surrounding circumstances that point was reached then and thereby the assailants of the government began the conflict of arms without a gun in sight or in expectancy to return their fire save only the few in the fort sent to that harbor years before for their own protection and still ready to give that protection in whatever was lawful this issue embraces more than the fate of these united states it presents to the whole family of man the question whether a constitutional republic or democracy a government of the people by the same people can or cannot maintain its territorial integrity against its own domestic foes with his singular felicity of statement he analyzed and refuted the sophism that secession was lawful and constitutional Quote, this sophism derives much perhaps the whole of its currency from the assumption that there is some omnipotent and sacred supremacy pertaining to a state to each state of our federal union our states have neither more nor less power than that reserved to them in the union by the constitution no one of them ever having been a state out of the union the states have their status in the union and they have no other legal status if they break from this they can only do so against law and by revolution the union and not themselves separately procured their independence and their liberty by conquest or purchase the union gave each of them whatever of independence or liberty it has the union is older than any of the states and in fact it created them as states originally some dependent colonies made the union and in turn the union threw off their old dependence for them and made them states such as they are not one of them ever had a state constitution independent of the union a noteworthy point in the message is president lincoln's expression of his abiding confidence in the intelligence and virtue of the people of the united states it may be affirmed said he without extravagance that the free institutions we enjoy have developed the powers and improved the condition of our whole people beyond any example in the world of this we now have a striking and an impressive illustration so large an army as the government has now on foot was never before known without a soldier in it but who has taken his place there of his own free choice but more than this there are many single regiments whose members one and another possess full practical knowledge of all the arts sciences professions and whatever else whether useful or elegant is known in the world and there is scarcely one from which there could not be selected a president a cabinet a congress and perhaps a court abundantly competent to administer the government itself this is essentially a people's contest on the side of the union 
it is a struggle for maintaining in the world that form and substance of government whose leading object is to elevate the condition of men to lift artificial weights from all shoulders to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life i am most happy to believe that the plain people understand and appreciate this it is worthy of note that while in this the government's hour of trial large numbers of those in the army and navy who have been favored with the offices have resigned and proved faults to the hand which had pampered them not one common soldier or common sailor is known to have deserted his flag hearty applause greeted that portion of the message which asked for means to make the contest short and decisive and congress acted promptly by authorizing a loan of two hundred fifty million dollars and an army not to exceed one million men all of president lincoln's war measures for which no previous sanction of law existed were duly legalized additional direct income and tariff taxes were laid and the force bill of 1795 and various other laws relating to conspiracy piracy unlawful recruiting and kindred topics were amended or passed throughout the whole history of the south by no means the least of the evils entailed by the institution of slavery was the dread of slave insurrections which haunted every master's household and this vague terror was at once intensified by the outbreak of civil war it stands to the lasting credit of the negro race in the united states that the wrongs of their long bondage provoked them to no such crime and that the civil war appears not to have even suggested much less started any organization or attempt but the john brown raid had indicated some possibility of the kind and when the union troops began their movements generals butler in maryland and patterson in pennsylvania moving toward harper's ferry and mcclellan in west virginia in order to reassure non-combatants severely issued orders that all attempts at slave insurrection should be suppressed it was a most pointed and significant warning to the leaders of the rebellion how much more vulnerable the peculiar institution was in war than in peace and that their ill-considered scheme to protect and perpetuate slavery would prove the most potent engine for its destruction the first effect of opening hostilities was to give adventurous or discontented slaves the chance to escape into union camps where even against orders to the contrary they found practical means of protection or concealment for the sake of the help they could render as cooks servants or teamsters or for the information they could give or obtain or the invaluable service they could render as guides practically therefore at the very beginning the war created a bond of mutual sympathy based on mutual helpfulness between the southern negro and the union volunteer and as fast as the union troops advanced and secession masters fled more or less slaves found liberation and refuge in the union camps at some points indeed this tendency created an embarrassment to the union commanders a few days after general butler assumed command of the union troops at fortress monroe the agent of a rebel master who had fled from the neighborhood came to demand under the provisions of the fugitive slave law three field hands alleged to be in butler's camp butler responded that as virginia claimed to be a foreign country the fugitive slave law was clearly inoperative unless the owner would come and take an oath of allegiance to the united states in connection with this incident the newspaper report stated that as the breastworks and batteries which had been so rapidly erected for confederate defense in every direction on the virginia peninsula were built by enforced negro labor under rigorous military impressment negroes were manifestly contraband of war under international law the dictum was so pertinent and the equity so plain that 
though it was not officially formulated by the general until two months later it sprang at once into popular acceptance and application and from that time forward the words slave and negro were everywhere within the union lines replaced by the familiar significant term contraband while butler's happy designation had a more convincing influence on public thought than a volume of discussion it did not immediately solve the whole question within a few days he reported that he had slave property to the value of sixty thousand dollars in his hands and by the end of july nine hundred contrabands men women and children of all ages what was their legal status and how should they be disposed of it was a knotty problem for upon its solution might depend the sensitive public opinion and balancing undecided loyalty and political action of the border slave states of maryland west virginia kentucky and missouri in solving the problem president lincoln kept in mind the philosophic maxim of one of his favorite stories that when the western methodist presiding elder riding about the circuit during the spring freshets was importuned by his young companion how they should ever be able to get across the swollen waters of the fox river which they were approaching the elder quieted him by saying he had made it the rule of his life never to cross fox river till he came to it the president did not immediately decide but left it to be treated as a question of camp and local police in the discretion of each commander under this theory later in the war some commanders excluded others admitted such fugitives to their camps and the curt formula of general orders we have nothing to do with slaves we are neither negro stealers nor negro catchers was easily construed by subordinate officers to justify the practice of either course for the present butler was instructed not to surrender such fugitives but to employ them in suitable labor and leave the question of their final disposition for future determination congress greatly advanced the problem soon after the battle of bull run by adopting an amendment which confiscated a rebel master's right to his slave when by his consent such slave was employed in service or labor hostile to the united states the debates exhibited but little spirit of partisanship even on this feature of the slavery question the border state members did not attack the justice of such a penalty they could only urge that it was unconstitutional and inexpedient on the general policy of war both houses with but few dissenting votes passed the resolution offered by mr crittenden which declared that the war was not waged for oppression or subjugation or to interfere with the rights or institution of states quote, but to defend and maintain the supremacy of the constitution and to preserve the union with all the dignity equality and rights of the several states unimpaired end quote the special session adjourned on august sixth having in a single month completed and enacted a thorough and comprehensive system of war legislation the military events that were transpiring in the meanwhile doubtless had their effect in hastening the decision and shortening the labors of congress to command the thirteen regiments of militia furnished by the state of ohio governor dennison had given a commission of major general to george b mcclellan who had been educated at west point and served with distinction in the mexican war and who through unusual opportunities in travel and special duties in surveys and exploration had gained acquirements and qualifications that appeared to fit him for a brilliant career being but thirty-five years old and having reached only the grade of captain he had resigned from the army and was at the moment serving as president of the ohio and mississippi railroad general scott warmly welcomed his appointment to lead the ohio contingent 
and so industriously facilitated his promotion that by the beginning of june mcclellan's militia commission as a major general had been changed to a commission for the same grade in the regular army and he found himself assigned to the command of a military department extending from western virginia to missouri though this was a leap in military title rank and power which excels the inventions of romance it was necessitated by the sudden exigencies of army expansion over the vast territory bordering the insurrection and for a while seemed justified by the hopeful promise indicated in the young officer's zeal and activity his instructions made it a part of his duty to encourage and support the unionists of western virginia in their political movement to divide the state and erect a union commonwealth out of that portion of it lying northwest of the alleghanies general lee not fully informed of the adverse popular sentiment sent a few confederate regiments into that region to gather recruits and hold the important mountain passes mcclellan in turn advanced a detachment eastward from wheeling to protect the baltimore and ohio railroad and at the beginning of june an expedition of two regiments led by colonel kelly made a spirited dash upon philippi where by a complete surprise he routed and scattered porterfield's recruiting detachment of one thousand confederates following up his initial success mcclellan threw additional forces across the ohio and about a month later had the good fortune on july eleventh by a flank movement under rosecrans to drive a regiment of the enemy out of strong entrenchments on rich mountain forced the surrender of the retreating garrison on the following day july twelfth and to win a third success on the thirteenth over another flying detachment at carrick's ford one of the crossings of the cheat river where the confederate general garnet was killed in a skirmish fire between sharpshooters these incidents happening on three successive days and in distance forty miles apart made a handsome showing for the young department commander when gathered into the single short telegram in which he reported to washington that garnet was killed his force routed at least two hundred of the enemy killed and seven guns and one thousand prisoners taken our success is complete and secession is killed in this country concluded the despatch the result indeed largely overshadowed in importance the means which accomplished it the union loss was only thirteen killed and forty wounded in subsequent effect these two comparatively insignificant skirmishes permanently recovered the state of west virginia to the union the main credit was of course due to the steadfast loyalty of the people of that region this victory afforded welcome relief to the strained and impatient public opinion of the northern states and sharpened the eager expectation of the authorities at washington of similar results from the projected virginia campaign the organization and command of that column were entrusted to brigadier general mcdowell advanced to this grade from his previous rank of major he was forty-two years old an accomplished west point graduate and had won distinction in the mexican war though since at that time he had been mainly engaged in staff duty on the morning of july sixteenth he began his advance from the fortifications of washington with a marching column of about twenty eight thousand men and a total of forty nine guns an additional division of about six thousand being left behind to guard his communications owing to the rawness of his troops the first few days march was necessarily cautious and cumbersome the enemy under beauregard had collected about twenty three thousand men and thirty five guns and was posted behind bull run a preliminary engagement occurred on thursday july eighteenth at blackburn's ford on that stream which served to develop the enemy's strong position but only delayed the advance until the whole of mcdowell's force reached centerville here mcdowell halted spent friday and saturday in reconnoitering and on sunday july twenty first began the battle by a circuitous march across bull run and attacking the enemy's left flank 
It proved that the plan was correctly chosen, but by a confusion in the march, the attack, intended for daybreak, was delayed until nine o'clock. Nevertheless, the first half of the battle, during the forenoon, was entirely successful, the Union lines steadily driving the enemy southward and enabling additional Union brigades to join the attacking column by a direct march from Centerville. At noon, however, the attack came to a halt, partly through the fatigue of the troops, partly because the advancing line, having swept the field for nearly a mile, found itself in a valley, from which further progress had to be made with all the advantage of the ground in favor of the enemy. In the lull of the conflict, which for a while ensued, the Confederate commander, with little hope except to mitigate a defeat, hurriedly concentrated his remaining artillery and supporting regiments into a semicircular line of defense at the top of the hill that the Federals would be obliged to mount, and kept them well concealed among the young pines at the edge of the timber with an open field in their front. Against the second position of the enemy, comprising twelve regiments, twenty-two guns, and two companies of cavalry, McDowell advanced in the afternoon with an attacking force of fourteen regiments, twenty-four guns, and a single battalion of cavalry, but with all the advantages of position against him. A fluctuating and intermitting attack resulted. The nature of the ground rendered a combined advance impossible. The Union brigades were sent forward and repulsed by piecemeal. A battery was lost by mistaking a Confederate for a Union regiment. Even now, the victory seemed to vibrate when a new flank, attacked by seven rebel regiments from an entirely unexpected direction, suddenly impressed the Union troops with the belief that Johnston's army from Harper's Ferry had reached the battlefield, and, demoralized by this belief, the Union commands, by a common impulse, gave up the fight as lost, and half marched, half ran from the field. Before reaching Centerville, the retreat at one point degenerated into a downright panic among the Army Teamsters and a considerable crowd of miscellaneous camp followers. And here, a charge or two by the Confederate cavalry companies captured 13 Union guns and quite a harvest of Army wagons. When the truth came to be known, it was found that through the want of skill and courage on the part of General Patterson in his operations at Harper's Ferry, General Johnston, with his whole Confederate army, had been allowed to slip away, and so far from coming suddenly into the Battle of Bull Run, the bulk of them were already in Beauregard's camps on Saturday, and performed the heaviest part of the fighting in Sunday's conflict. The sudden cessation of the battle left the Confederates in doubt whether their victory was final or only a prelude to a fresh Union attack. But as the Union forces not only retreated from the field, but also from Centerville, it took on, in their eyes, the proportions of a great triumph, confirming their expectation of achieving ultimate independence and, in fact, giving them a standing in the eyes of foreign nations, which they had hardly dared hope for so soon. In numbers of killed and wounded, the two armies suffered about equally, and General Johnston writes, The Confederate Army was more disorganized by victory than that of the United States by defeat. Manassas was turned into a fortified camp, but the rebel leaders felt themselves unable to make an aggressive movement during the whole of the following autumn and winter. The shock of the defeat was deep and painful to the administration and the people of the North. Up to late Sunday afternoon, favorable reports had come to Washington from the battlefield, and everyone believed in an assured victory. When a telegram came about five o'clock in the afternoon that the day was lost and McDowell's army in full retreat through Centerville, General Scott refused to credit the news so contradictory of everything which had been heard up to that hour. But the intelligence was quickly confirmed. The impulse of retreat once started, McDowell's effort to arrest it at Centerville proved useless. 
the regiments and brigades not completely disorganized made an unmolested and comparatively orderly march back to the fortifications of washington while on the following day a horde of stragglers found their way across the bridges of the potomac into the city president lincoln received the news quietly and without any visible sign of perturbation or excitement but he remained awake and in the executive office all of Sunday night, listening to the personal narratives of a number of congressmen and senators who had, with undue curiosity, followed the army and witnessed some of the sounds and sights of the battle. By the dawn of Monday morning, the president had substantially made up his judgment of the battle and its probable results, and the action dictated by the untoward event. This was, in brief, that the militia regiments enlisted under the three months' call should be mustered out as soon as practicable. The organization of the new three years' forces be pushed forward both east and west. Manassas and Harper's Ferry and the intermediate lines of communication be seized and held, and a joint movement organized from Cincinnati on East Tennessee and from Cairo on Memphis. Meanwhile, General McClellan was ordered from West Virginia to Washington, where he arrived on July 26 and assumed command of the Division of the Potomac, comprising the troops in and around Washington on both sides of the river. He quickly cleared the city of stragglers and displayed a gratifying activity in beginning the organization of the Army of the Potomac from the new three years volunteers that were pouring into Washington by every train. He was received by the administration and the army with the warmest friendliness and confidence, and for a while seemed to reciprocate those feelings with zeal and gratitude. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of a Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter Seventeen. General Scott's Plans criticized as the anaconda, the three fields of conflict, Fremont appointed, Major General, his military failures, Battle of Wilson's Creek, Hunter ordered to Fremont, Fremont's proclamation, President revokes Fremont's proclamation, Lincoln's letter to Browning, surrender of Lexington, Fremont takes the field, Cameron's visit to Fremont, Fremont's removal, the military genius and experience of General Scott, from the first, pretty correctly defined the grand outline of military operations, which would become necessary in reducing the revolted southern states to renewed allegiance. Long before the Battle of Bull Run was planned, he urged that the first 75 regiments of three months militia could not be relied on for extensive campaigns, because their term of service would expire before they could be well organized. His outline suggestion, therefore, was that the new three years volunteer army be placed in 10 or 15 healthy camps and given at least four months of drill and tactical instruction and when the navy had by a rigid blockade closed all the harbors along the seaboard of the southern states the fully prepared army should by invincible columns move down the mississippi river to new orleans leaving a strong cordon of military posts behind it to keep open the stream join hands with the blockade and thus envelop the principal area of rebellion in a powerful military grasp which would paralyze and effectually kill the insurrection. Even while suggesting this plan, however, the general admitted that the great obstacle to its adoption would be the impatience of the patriotic and loyal Union people and leaders who would refuse to wait the necessary length of time. The general was correct in his apprehension. 
The newspapers criticized his plans in caustic editorials and ridiculous cartoons as Scott's Anaconda, and public opinion rejected it in an overwhelming demand for a prompt and energetic advance. Scott was correct in military theory, while the people and the administration were right in practice under existing political conditions. Although Bull Run seemed to justify the general, West Virginia and Missouri vindicated the president and the people. It can now be seen that still a third element, geography, intervened to give shape and sequence to the main outlines of the Civil War. When at the beginning of May, General Scott gave his advice, the seat of government of the first seven Confederate states was still at Montgomery, Alabama. By the adhesion of the four interior border states to the insurrection and the removal of the archives and administration of Jefferson Davis to Richmond, Virginia, toward the end of June, as the capital of the now eleven Confederate states, Washington necessarily became the center of Union attack and Richmond the center of Confederate defense. From the day when McDowell began his march to Bull Run, to that when Lee evacuated Richmond in his final hopeless flight, the route between these two opposing capitals remained the principal and dominating line of military operations, and the region between Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac River on the east, and the chain of the Alleghenies on the west, the primary field of strategy. According to geographical features, the second great field of strategy lay between the Allegheny Mountains and the Mississippi River, and the third between the Mississippi River, the Rocky Mountains, and the Rio Grande. Except in West Virginia, the attitude of neutrality assumed by Kentucky for a considerable time delayed the definition of the military frontier and the beginning of active hostilities in the second field thus giving greater momentary importance to the conditions existing and events transpiring in Missouri, with the city of St. Louis as the principal center of the third great military field. The same necessity which dictated the promotion of General McClellan at one bound from captain to major general compelled a similar phenomenal promotion, not alone of officers of the regular army, but also of eminent civilians to high command and military responsibility in the immense volunteer force authorized by Congress. Events, rather than original purpose, had brought McClellan into prominence and ranking duty, but now by design the President gave John C. Fremont a commission of Major General and placed him in command of the third great military field with headquarters at St. Louis with the leading idea that he should organize the military strength of the Northwest, first, to hold Missouri to the Union, and second, by a carefully prepared military expedition over the Mississippi River. By so doing, he would sever the Confederate states, reclaim or conquer the region lying west of the Great Stream, and thus reduce by more than one-half the territorial area of the insurrection. Though he had been an army lieutenant, he had no experience in active war, yet the talent and energy he had displayed in western military exploration and the political prominence he had reached as candidate of the Republican Party for President in 1856 seemed to fit him preeminently for such a duty. While most of the volunteers from New England and the Middle States were concentrated at Washington and dependent points, the bulk of the western regiments was, for the time being, put under the command of Fremont for present and prospective duty. But the high hopes which the administration placed in the general were not realized. The genius which could lead a few dozen or a few hundred Indian scouts and mountain trappers over desert plains and through the fastnesses of the Sierra Nevada that could defy savage hostilities and outlive starvation amid imprisoning snows, failed signally before the task of animating and combining the patriotic enthusiasm of eight or ten great northwestern states, and organizing and leading an army of 100,000 eager volunteers in a comprehensive and decisive campaign to recover a great national highway. 
From the first, Fremont failed in promptness, in foresight, in intelligent supervision, and, above all, in inspiring confidence and attracting assistance and devotion. His military administration created serious extravagance and confusion, and his personal intercourse excited the distrust and resentment of the governors and civilian officials, whose counsel and cooperation were essential to his usefulness and success. While his resources were limited, and while he fortified St. Louis and reinforced Cairo, a yet more important point needed his attention and help. Lyon, who had followed Governor Jackson and General Price in their flight from Boonville to Springfield in southern Missouri, found his forces diminished beyond his expectation by the expiration of the term of service of his three months' regiments, and began to be threatened by a northward concentration of Confederate detachments from the Arkansas line and the Indian Territory. The neglect of his appeals for help placed him in the situation where he could neither safely remain inactive nor safely retreat. He therefore took the chances of scattering the enemy before him by a sudden daring attack with his 5,000 effectives against nearly treble numbers in the Battle of Wilson's Creek at daylight on August 10th. The casualties on the two sides were nearly equal and the enemy was checked and crippled but the Union Army sustained a fatal loss in the death of General Lyon, who was instantly killed while leading a desperate bayonet charge. His skill and activity had, so far, been the strength of the Union cause in Missouri. The absence of his counsel and personal example rendered a retreat to the railroad terminus at Rolla necessary. This discouraging event turned public criticism sharply upon Fremont. Loath to yield to mere public clamor, and adverse to hasty changes in military command, Mr. Lincoln sought to improve the situation by sending General David Hunter to take a place on Fremont's staff. General Fremont needs assistance, said his note to Hunter, which it is difficult to give him. He is losing the confidence of men near him, whose support any man in his position must have to be successful. His cardinal mistake is that he isolates himself and allows nobody to see him, and by which he does not know what is going on in the very matter he is dealing with. He needs to have by his side a man of large experience. Will you not, for me, take that place? Your rank is one grade too high to be ordered to do it, but will you not serve the country and oblige me by taking it voluntarily? This note indicates, better than pages of description, the kind, helpful, and forbearing spirit with which the President, through the long four years of war, treated his military commanders and subordinates, and which, in several instances, met such ungenerous return. But even while Mr. Lincoln was attempting to smooth this difficulty, Fremont had already burdened him with two additional embarrassments. One was a perplexing personal quarrel the general had begun with the influential Blair family, represented by Colonel Frank Blair, the indefatigable Unionist leader in Missouri, and Montgomery Bear, the postmaster general in Lincoln's cabinet, who had hitherto been Fremont's most influential friends and supporters, and in addition, the father of these, Francis P. Blair, Sr., a veteran politician whose influence dated from Jackson's administration and through whose assistance Fremont had been nominated as a presidential candidate in 1856. The other embarrassment was of a more serious and far-reaching nature. Conscious that he was losing the esteem and confidence of both civil and military leaders in the West, Fremont's adventurous fancy caught at the idea of rehabilitating himself before the public by a bold political maneuver. Day by day, the relation of slavery to the Civil War was becoming a more troublesome question and exciting impatient and angry discussion. Without previous consultation with the President or any of his advisors or friends, Fremont, on August 30th, wrote and printed as commander of the Department of the West 
a proclamation establishing martial law throughout the state of Missouri and announcing that, quote, all persons who shall be taken with arms in their hands within these lines shall be tried by court martial and if found guilty will be shot. The property, real and personal, of all persons in the state of Missouri who shall take up arms against the United States or who shall be directly proven to have taken an active part with their enemies in the field is declared to be confiscated to the public use and their slaves if any they have, are hereby declared free men. End quote. The reason given in the proclamation for this drastic and dictatorial measure was to suppress disorder, maintain the public peace, and protect persons and property of loyal citizens, all simple police duties. For issuing his proclamation without consultation with the president, he could offer only the flimsy excuse that it involved two days of time to communicate with Washington while he well knew that no battle was pending and no invasion in progress. This reckless misuse of power, President Lincoln also corrected with his dispassionate prudence and habitual courtesy. He immediately wrote to the general, My dear sir, Two points in your proclamation of August 30th give me some anxiety. First, should you shoot a man, according to the proclamation, the Confederates would very certainly shoot our best men in their hands in retaliation, and so, man for man, indefinitely. It is, therefore, my order that you allow no man to be shot under the proclamation without first having my approbation or consent. Second, I think there is great danger that the closing paragraph, in relation to the confiscation of property and the liberating slaves of traitorous owners, will alarm our Southern Union friends and turn them against us, perhaps ruin our rather fair prospect of Kentucky. Allow me, therefore, to ask that you will, as of your own motion, modify that paragraph so as to conform to the first and fourth sections of the Act of Congress entitled, An Act to Confiscate Property Used for Insurrectionary Purposes, approved August 6, 1861, and a copy of which act I herewith send you. This letter is written in a spirit of caution and not of censure. I send it by a special messenger in order that it may certainly and speedily reach you. But the headstrong general was too blind and selfish to accept this mild redress of a fault that would have justified instant displacement from command. He preferred that the president should openly direct him to make the correction. Admitting that he decided in one night upon the measure, he added, quote, if I were to retract it of my own accord, it would imply that I thought myself wrong, and that I had acted without reflection, which the gravity of the point demanded. End quote. The inference is plain that Fremont was unwilling to lose the influence of his hasty step upon public opinion, but by this course he had deliberately placed himself in an attitude of political hostility to the administration. The incident produced something of the agitation which the general had evidently counted upon. Radical anti-slavery men throughout the free states applauded his act and condemned the president, and military emancipation at once became a subject of excited discussion. Even strong conservatives were carried away by the feeling that rebels would be but properly punished by the loss of their slaves. To Senator Browning, the president's intimate personal friend, who entertained this feeling, Mr. Lincoln wrote a searching analysis of Fremont's proclamation and its dangers. Quote, Yours of the 17th is just received, and coming from you, I confess it astonishes me, that you should object to my adhering to a law which you had assisted in making and presenting to me less than a month before is odd enough but this is a very small part. General Fremont's proclamation as to confiscation of property and the liberation of slaves is purely political and not within the range of military law or necessity. 
if a commanding general finds a necessity to seize the farm of a private owner for a pasture an encampment or a fortification he has the right to do so and to so hold it as long as the necessity lasts and this is within military law because within military necessity but to say the farm shall no longer belong to the owner or his heirs forever and this as well when the farm is not needed for military purposes as when it is is purely political without the savor of military law about it and the same is true of slaves if the general needs them he can seize them and use them and when the need is past it is not for him to fix their permanent future condition that must be settled according to laws made by lawmakers and not by military proclamations the proclamation in the point in question is simply dictatorship it assumes that the general may do anything he pleases confiscate the lands and free the slaves of loyal people as well as of disloyal ones and going the whole figure i have no doubt would be more popular with some thoughtless people than that which has been done but i cannot assume this reckless position nor allow others to assume it on my responsibility you speak of it as being the only means of saving the government on the contrary it is itself the surrender of the government can it be pretended that it is any longer the government of the united states any government of constitution and laws wherein a general or a president may make permanent rules of property by proclamation i do not say congress might not with propriety pass a law on the point just as general fremont proclaimed i do not say i might not as a member of congress vote for it what i object to is that i as president shall expressly or impliedly seize and exercise the permanent legislative functions of the government so much as to principle now as to policy no doubt the thing was popular in some quarters and would have been more so if it had been a general declaration of emancipation the kentucky legislature would not budge till that proclamation was modified and general anderson telegraphed me that on the news of general fremont having actually issued deeds of manumission a whole company of our volunteers threw down their arms and disbanded i was so assured as to think it probable that the very arms we had furnished kentucky would be turned against us i think to lose kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game kentucky gone we cannot hold missouri nor as i think maryland these all against us and the job on our hands is too large for us we would as well consent to separation at once including the surrender of this capital End quote. if it be objected that the president himself decreed military emancipation a year later then it must be remembered that fremont's proclamation differed in many essential particulars from the president's edict of january first eighteen sixty three by that time also the entirely changed conditions justified a complete change of policy but above all the supreme reason of military necessity upon which alone mr lincoln based the constitutionality of his edict of freedom was entirely wanting in the case of fremont the harvest of popularity which fremont evidently hoped to secure by his proclamation was soon blighted by a new military disaster the confederate forces which had been united in the battle of wilson's creek quickly became disorganized through the disagreement of their leaders and the want of provisions and other military supplies and mainly returned to arkansas and the indian territory whence they had come but general price with his missouri contingent gradually increased his followers and as the union retreat from springfield to rolla left the way open began a northward march through the western part of the state to attack colonel mulligan who with about twenty eight hundred federal troops entrenched himself at lexington on the missouri river secession sympathy was strong along the line of his march and price gained adherence so rapidly that on september eighteenth he was able to invest mulligan's position with a somewhat irregular army numbering about twenty thousand after a two days siege the garrison was compelled to surrender 
through the exhaustion of the supply of water in their cisterns. The victory won, Price again immediately retreated southward, losing his army almost as fast as he had collected it, made up, as it was, more in the spirit and quality of a sudden border foray than an organized campaign. For this new loss, Fremont was subjected to a shower of fierce criticism, which, this time, he sought to disarm by ostentatious announcements of immediate activity. I am taking the field myself, he telegraphed, and hope to destroy the enemy either before or after the junction of forces under McCulloch. Four days after the surrender, the St. Louis newspapers printed his order organizing an army of five divisions. The document made a respectable show of force on paper, claiming an aggregate of nearly 39,000. In reality, however, being scattered and totally unprepared for the field, it possessed no such effective strength. For a month longer, extravagant newspaper reports stimulated the public with the hope of substantial results from Fremont's intended campaign. Before the end of that time, however, President Lincoln, under growing apprehension, sent Secretary of War Cameron and the Adjutant General of the Army to Missouri to make a personal investigation. Reaching Fremont's camp on October 13th, they found the movement to be a mere forced, spasmodic display, without substantial strength, transportation, or coherent and feasible plan and that at least two of the division commanders were without means to execute the orders they had received, and utterly without confidence in their leader or knowledge of his intentions. To give Fremont yet another chance, the Secretary of War withheld the President's order to relieve the general from his command, which he had brought with him on Fremont's insistence that a victory was really within his reach. When this hope also proved delusive, and suspicion was aroused that the general might be intending not only to deceive, but to defy the administration, President Lincoln sent the following letter by a special friend to General Curtis, commanding at St. Louis. Quote, Dear Sir, on receipt of this, with the accompanying enclosures, you will take safe, certain and suitable measures to have the enclosure addressed to Major General Fremont delivered to him with all reasonable dispatch, subject to these conditions only, that if, when General Fremont shall be reached by the messenger, yourself, or anyone sent by you, he shall then have, in personal command, fought and won a battle, or shall then be actually in a battle, or shall then be in the immediate presence of the enemy in expectation of a battle, it is not to be delivered, but held for further orders. After, and not till after, the delivery of General Fremont, let the enclosure addressed to General Hunter be delivered to him. End quote. The order of removal was delivered to Fremont on November 2nd. By that date, he had reached Springfield, but had won no victory, fought no battle, and was not in the presence of the enemy. Two of his divisions were not yet even with him. Still laboring under the delusion, perhaps imposed on him by his scouts, his orders stated that the enemy was only a day's march distant and advancing to attack him. The enclosure mentioned in the President's letter to Curtis was an order to General David Hunter to relieve Fremont. When he arrived and assumed command, the scouts he sent forward found no enemy within reach and no such contingency of battle or hope of victory as had been rumored and assumed. Fremont's personal conduct in these disagreeable circumstances was entirely commendable. He took leave of the army in a short farewell order, couched in terms of perfect obedience to authority and courtesy to his successor, asking for him the same cordial support he had himself received. Nor did he, by word or act, justify the suspicions of insubordination for which some of his indiscreet adherents had given cause. Under the instructions, President Lincoln had outlined in his order to Hunter that General gave up the idea of indefinitely pursuing Price and divided the army into two corps of observation, 
which were drawn back and posted, for the time being, at the two railroad termini of Rolla and Sedalia, to be recruited and prepared for further service. End of chapter 17. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay Chapter 18 Blockade Hatteras Inlet Port Royal captured, the Trent affair, Lincoln suggests arbitration, Seward's dispatch, McClellan at Washington, Army of the Potomac, McClellan's quarrel with Scott, retirement of Scott, Lincoln's memorandum, all quiet on the Potomac, conditions in Kentucky, Cameron's visit to Sherman, East Tennessee, Instructions to Buell, Buell's Neglect, Halleck in Missouri. Following the fall of Fort Sumter, the Navy of the United States was in no condition to enforce the blockade from Chesapeake Bay to the Rio Grande declared by Lincoln's proclamation of April 19. Of the 42 vessels then in commission, nearly all were on foreign stations. Another serious cause of weakness was that within a few days after the Sumter attack, 124 officers of the Navy resigned, or were dismissed for disloyalty, and the number of such was doubled before the 4th of July. Yet, by strenuous efforts of the Department in fitting out ships that had been laid up, in completing those under construction, and in extensive purchases and arming of all classes of vessels that could be put to use, from screw and sidewheel merchant steamers to ferry boats and tugs, a legally effective blockade was established within a period of six months. A considerable number of new warships was also placed under construction. The special session of Congress created a commission to study the subject of ironclads, and on its recommendation, three experimental vessels of this class were placed under contract. One of these, completed early in the following year, rendered a momentous service, hereafter to be mentioned, and completely revolutionized naval warfare. Meanwhile, as rapidly as vessels could be gathered and prepared, the Navy Department organized effective expeditions to operate against points on the Atlantic coast. On August 29, a small fleet, under command of Flag Officer Stringham, took possession of Hatteras Inlet after silencing the forts the insurgents had erected to guard the entrance and captured 25 guns and 700 prisoners. This success, achieved without the loss of a man to the Union fleet, was of great importance, opening as it did the way for a succession of victories in the interior waters of North Carolina early in the following year. A more formidable expedition and still greater success soon followed. Early in November, Captain DuPont assembled a fleet of 50 sail, including transports, before the Port Royal Sound forming a column of nine warships with a total of 112 guns, the line steamed by the mid-channel between Fort Beauregard to the right and Fort Walker to the left, the first of 20 and the second of 23 guns, each ship delivering its fire as it passed the forts. Turning at the proper point, they again gave broadside after broadside while steaming out, and so repeated their circular movement. The battle was decided when, on the third round, the forts failed to respond to the fire of the ships. When Commander Rogers carried and planted the stars and stripes on the ramparts, he found them utterly deserted, everything having been abandoned by the flying garrisons. Further reconnaissance proved that the panic extended itself over the whole network of sea islands between Charleston and Savannah, permitting the immediate occupation of the entire region and affording a military base for both the Navy and the Army of incalculable advantage in the further reduction of the coast. Another naval exploit, however, almost at the same time, absorbed greater public attention and for a while created an intense degree of excitement and suspense. 
ex-senators J. M. Mason and John Slidell, having been accredited by the Confederate government as envoys to European courts, had managed to elude the blockade and reach Havana. Captain Charles Weeks, commanding the San Jacinto, learning that they were to take passage for England on the British mail steamer Trent, intercepted that vessel on November 8 near the coast of Cuba, took the rebel emissaries prisoner by the usual show of force, and brought them to the United States, but allowed the Trent to proceed on her voyage. The incident and alleged insult produced as great excitement in England as in the United States, and the British government began instant and significant preparations for war for what it hastily assumed to be a violation of international law and an outrage on the British flag. Instructions were sent to Lord Lyons, the British minister at Washington, to demand the release of the prisoners and a suitable apology, and, if this demand were not complied with within a single week, to close his legation and return to England. In the northern states, the capture was greeted with great jubilation. Captain Wilkes was applauded by the press, his act was officially approved by the Secretary of the Navy, and the House of Representatives unanimously passed a resolution thanking him for his brave, adroit, and patriotic conduct. While the President and Cabinet shared the first impulses of rejoicing, second thoughts impressed them with the grave nature of the international question involved, and the serious dilemma of disavowal or war precipitated by the imperative British demand. It was fortunate that Secretary Seward and Lord Lyons were close personal friends, and still more that though British public opinion had strongly favored the rebellion, the Queen of England entertained the kindliest feelings for the American government. Under her direction, Prince Albert instructed the British cabinet to formulate and present the demand in the most courteous diplomatic language, while on their part, the American president and cabinet discussed the affair in a temper of judicious reserve. President Lincoln's first desire was to refer the difficulty to friendly arbitration, and his mood is admirably expressed in the autograph experimental draft of a dispatch suggesting this course. The President is unwilling to believe, he wrote, that Her Majesty's government will press for a categorical answer upon what appears to him to be only a partial record, in the making up of which he has been allowed no part. He is reluctant to volunteer his view of the case, with no assurance that Her Majesty's government will consent to hear him. Yet this much he directs me to say, that this government has intended no affront to the British flag, or to the British nation, nor has it intended to force into discussion an embarrassing question, all which is evident by the fact hereby asserted, that the act complained of was done by an officer without orders from, or expectation of, the government. But being done, it was no longer left to us to consider whether we might not, to avoid a controversy, waive an unimportant though strict right, because we too, as well as Great Britain, have a people justly jealous of their rights, and in whose presence our government could undo the act complained of only upon a fair showing that it was wrong, or at least very questionable. The United States government and people are still willing to make reparation upon such showing. Accordingly, I am instructed by the President to inquire whether Her Majesty's government will hear the United States upon the matter in question. The President desires, among other things, to bring into view and have considered the existing rebellion in the United States, the position Great Britain has assumed, including Her Majesty's proclamation in relation thereto, the relation the persons whose seizure is the subject of complaint bore to the United States, and the object of their voyage at the time they were seized, the knowledge which the master of the Trent had of their relation to the United States, and of the object of their voyage, at the time he received them on board for the voyage, the place of the seizure, and the precedents and respective positions assumed in analogous cases between Great Britain and the United States. Upon a submission containing the foregoing facts, with those set forth in the before-mentioned dispatch to your lordship, together with all other facts which either party may deem material, I am instructed to say the government of the United States will, if agreed to by Her Majesty's government, go to such friendly arbitration as is usual among nations, and will abide the award. The most practiced diplomatic pen in Europe could not have written a more dignified, courteous, or succinct presentation of the case, and yet, 
Under the necessities of the movement, it was impossible to adopt this procedure. Upon full discussion, it was decided that war with Great Britain must be avoided, and Mr. Seward wrote a dispatch defending the course of Captain Wilkes up to the point where he permitted the Trent to proceed on her voyage. It was his further duty to have brought her before a prize court. Failing in this, he had left the capture incomplete under rules of international law, and the American government had thereby lost the right and the legal evidence to establish the contraband character of the vessel and the person seized. Under the circumstances, the prisoners were therefore willingly released. Excited American feeling was grievously disappointed at the result, but American good sense readily accommodated itself both to the correctness of the law expounded by the Secretary of State and to the public policy that averted a great international danger, particularly as this decision forced Great Britain to depart from her own and to adopt the American traditions respecting this class of neutral rights. It has already been told how Captain George B. McClellan was suddenly raised in rank at the very outset of the war, first to a major generalship in the three months militia, then to the command of the military department of the Ohio, from that to a major generalship in the regular army, and after his successful campaign in West Virginia was called to Washington and placed in command of the Division of the Potomac, which comprised all the troops in and around Washington on both sides of the river. Called thus to the capital of the nation to guard it against the results of the disastrous Battle of Bull Run, and to organize a new army for extended offensive operations, the surrounding conditions naturally suggested to him that in all likelihood he would play a conspicuous part in the great drama of the Civil War. His ambition rose eagerly to the prospect. On the day on which he assumed command, July 27, he wrote to his wife, I find myself in a new and strange position here. President, Cabinet, General Scott, and all deferring to me. By some strange operation of magic, I seem to have become the power of the land. And three days later, they give me my way in everything, full swing and unbounded confidence. Who would have thought when we were married that I should so soon be called upon to save my country? And still a few days afterward, I shall carry this thing on guard and crush the rebels in one campaign. From the giddy elevation to which such an imaginary achievement raised his dreams, there was but one higher step, and his colossal egotism immediately mounted to occupy it. On August 9, just two weeks after his arrival in Washington, he wrote, I would cheerfully take the dictatorship and agree to lay down my life when the country is saved. While in the same letter, he adds, with the most naive unconsciousness of his hallucination, I am not spoiled by my unexpected new position. Coming to the national capital in the hour of deepest public depression over the Bull Run defeat, McClellan was welcomed by the President, the Cabinet, and General Scott with sincere friendship, by Congress with a hopeful eagerness, by the people with enthusiasm, and by Washington society with adulation. Externally he seemed to justify such a greeting. He was young, handsome, accomplished, genial, and winning in conversation and manner. He at once manifested great industry and quick decision, and speedily exhibited a degree of ability in Army organization which was not equaled by any officer during the Civil War. Under his eye the stream of the new three years' regiments pouring into the city went to their camps, fell into brigades and divisions, and were supplied with equipments, horses, and batteries, and underwent the routine of drill, tactics, and reviews, which, without the least apparent noise or friction, in three months made the Army of the Potomac a perfect fighting machine of over 150,000 men and more than 200 guns. Recognizing his ability in this work, the government had indeed given him its full confidence and permitted him to exercise almost unbounded authority which he fully utilized in favoring his personal friends and drawing to himself the best resources of the whole country in arms, supplies, and officers of education and experience. For a while, his outward demeanor indicated respect and gratitude for the promotion and liberal favors bestowed upon him. But his phenomenal rise was fatal to his usefulness. The dream that he was to be the sole savior of his country, 
announced confidentially to his wife just two weeks after his arrival in Washington, never again left him so long as he continued in command. Coupled with this dazzling vision, however, was soon developed the tormenting twofold hallucination. First, that everybody was conspiring to thwart him, and second, that the enemy had from double to quadruple the numbers to defeat him. For the first month he could not sleep for the nightmare that Beauregard's demoralized army had by a sudden bound from Manassas seized the city of Washington. He immediately began a quarrel with General Scott, which, by the 1st of November, drove the old hero into retirement and out of his pathway. The cabinet members who, wittingly or unwittingly, had encouraged him in this, he some weeks later stigmatized as a set of geese. Seeing that President Lincoln was kind and unassuming in discussing military questions, McClellan quickly contracted the habit of expressing contempt for him in his confidential letters, and the feeling rapidly grew until it reached a mark of open disrespect. The same trait manifested itself in his making exclusive confidence of only two or three of his subordinate generals and ignoring the counsel of all the others. And when, later on, Congress appointed a standing committee of leading senators and representatives to examine into the conduct of the war, he placed himself in a similar attitude respecting their inquiry and advice. McClellan's activity and judgment as an army organizer naturally created great hopes that he would be equally efficient as a commander in the field. But these hopes were grievously disappointed. To his first great defect of estimating himself as the sole savior of the country, must at once be added the second, of his utter inability to form any reasonable judgment of the strength of the enemy in his front. On September 8, when the Confederate Army at Manassas numbered 41,000, he rated it at 130,000. By the end of October, that estimate had risen to 150,000, to meet which he asked that his own force should be raised to an aggregate of 240,000, with a total of effectives of 208,000 and 488 guns. He suggested that to gather this force, all other points should be left on the defensive, that the Army of the Potomac held the fate of the country in its hands, that the advance should not be postponed beyond November 25, and that a single will should direct the plan of accomplishing a crushing defeat of the rebel army at Manassas. On the 1st of November, the President, yielding at last to General Scott's urgent solicitation, issued the orders placing him on the retired list, and in his stead appointing General McClellan to the command of all the armies. The administration indulged the expectation that at last the young Napoleon, as the newspapers often called him, would take advantage of the fine autumn weather, and by a bold move with his single will and his immense force, outnumbering the enemy nearly four to one, would redeem his promise to crush the army at Manassas and save the country. But the November days came and went, as the October days had come and gone. McClellan and his brilliant staff galloped unceasingly from camp to camp, and review followed review, while autumn imperceptibly gave place to the cold and storms of winter, and still there was no sign of forward movement. Under his own growing impatience, as well as that of the public, the President, about the 1st of December, inquired pointedly in a memorandum suggesting a plan of campaign, how long would it require to actually get in motion? McClellan answered, by December 15, probably 25, and put aside the President's suggestion by explaining, I have now my mind actively turned toward another plan of campaign that I do not think at all anticipated by the enemy, nor by many of our own people. December 25 came, as November 25 had come, and still there was no plan, no preparation, no movement. Then McClellan fell seriously ill. By a spontaneous and most natural impulse, the soldiers of the various camps began the erection of huts to shelter them from snow and storm. In a few weeks, the Army of the Potomac was practically, if not by order, in winter quarters and day after day the monotonous telegraphic phrase, All Quiet on the Potomac, was read from the northern newspapers and northern homes, until, by mere iteration, it degenerated from an expression of deep disappointment to a note of sarcastic criticism. While so unsatisfactory a condition of affairs existed in the first great military field east of the Alleghenies, 
The outlook was quite as unpromising, both in the second, between the Alleghenies and the Mississippi, and in the third, west of the Mississippi. When the Confederates, about September 1, 1861, invaded Kentucky, they stationed General Pello at the strongly fortified town of Columbus on the Mississippi River with about 6,000 men. General Buckner at Bowling Green on the railroad north of Nashville with 5,000, and General Zolikoffer with six regiments in eastern Kentucky fronting Cumberland Gap. Up to that time, there were no Union troops in Kentucky, except a few regiments of home guards. Now, however, the state legislature called for active help, and General Anderson, exercising nominal command from Cincinnati, sent Brigadier General Sherman to Nashville to confront Buckner, and Brigadier General Thomas to Camp Dick Robinson to confront Zolikoffer. Neither side was as yet in a condition of force and preparation to take the aggressive. When, a month later, Anderson, on account of ill health, turned over the command to Sherman, the latter had gathered only about 18,000 men, and was greatly discouraged by the task of defending 300 miles of frontier with that small force. In an interview with Secretary of War Cameron, who called upon him on his return from Fremont's camp about the middle of October, he strongly urged that he needed for immediate defense 60,000, and for ultimate offense, 200,000 before we were done. Great God, exclaimed Cameron, where are they to come from? Both Sherman's demand and Cameron's answer were a pertinent comment on McClellan's policy of collecting the whole military strength of the country at Washington to fight the one great battle for which he could never get ready. Sherman was so distressed by the seeming magnitude of his burden that he soon asked to be relieved, and when Brigadier General Buell was sent to succeed him in command of that part of Kentucky lying east of the Cumberland River, it was the expectation of the President that he would devote his main attention and energy to the accomplishment of a specific object which Mr. Lincoln had very much at heart. Ever since the days in June when President Lincoln had presided over the Council of War which discussed and decided upon the Bull Run Campaign, he had devoted every spare moment of his time to the study of such military books and leading principles of the art of war as would aid him in solving questions that must necessarily come to himself for final decision. His acute perceptions, retentive memory, an unusual power of logic enabled him to make rapid progress in the acquisition of the fixed and accepted rules on which military writers agree. In this, as in other sciences, the main difficulty, of course, lies in applying fixed theories to variable conditions. When, however, we remember that at the outbreak of hostilities all the great commanders of the Civil War had experience only as captains and lieutenants, it is not strange that in speculative military problems the President's mature reasoning powers should have gained almost as rapidly by observation and criticism as theirs by practice and experiment. The mastery he attained of the difficult art, and how intuitively correct was his grasp of military situations, has been attested since in the enthusiastic admiration of brilliant technical students, amply fitted by training and intellect to express an opinion, whose comment does not fall short of declaring Mr. Lincoln the ablest strategist of the war. The President had early discerned what must become the dominating and decisive lines of advance in gaining and holding military control of the southern states. Only two days after the Battle of Bull Run, he had written a memorandum suggesting three principal objects for the Army when reorganized. First, to gather a force to menace Richmond. Second, a movement from Cincinnati upon Cumberland Gap in East Tennessee. Third, an expedition from Cairo against Memphis. In his eyes, the second of these objectives never lost its importance, and it was, in fact, substantially adopted by indirection and by necessity in the closing periods of the war. The eastern third of the state of Tennessee remained from the first stubbornly and devotedly loyal to the Union. At an election on June 8, 1861, the people of 29 counties, by more than two to one, voted against joining the Confederacy, and the most rigorous military repression by the orders of Jefferson Davis and Governor Harris was necessary to prevent a general uprising against the rebellion. The sympathy of the President, 
even more than that of the whole North, went out warmly to these unfortunate Tennesseans, and he desired to convert their mountain fastnesses into an impregnable patriotic stronghold. Had his advice been followed, it would have completely severed railroad communication, by way of the Shenandoah Valley, Knoxville, and Chattanooga, between Virginia and the Gulf States, accomplishing in the winter of 1861 what was not attained until two years later. Mr. Lincoln urged this in a second memorandum, made late in September, and seeing that the principal objection to it lay in the long and difficult line of land transportation, his message to Congress of December 3, 1861, recommended, as a military measure, the construction of a railroad to connect Cincinnati by way of Lexington, Kentucky, with that mountain region. A few days after the message, he personally went to the President's room in the Capitol building, and calling around him a number of leading senators and representatives, and pointing out a map before them, the East Tennessee region, said to them in substance, I am thoroughly convinced that the closing struggle of the war will occur somewhere in this mountain country. By our superior numbers and strength, we will everywhere drive the rebel armies back from the level districts lying along the coast, from those lying south of the Ohio River, and from those lying east of the Mississippi River. Yielding to our superior force, they will gradually retreat to the more defensible mountain districts, and make their final stand in that part of the South where the seven states of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia come together. The population there is overwhelmingly and devotedly loyal to the Union. The dispatches from Brigadier General Thomas on October 28 and November 5 show that, with four additional good regiments, he is willing to undertake the campaign and is confident that he can take immediate possession. Once established, the people will rally to his support, and by building a railroad over which to forward him regular supplies and needed reinforcements from time to time, we can hold it against all attempts to dislodge us, and at the same time menace the enemy in any one of the states I have named. While his hearers listened with interest, it was evident that their minds were still full of the prospect of a great battle in Virginia, the capture of Richmond, and an early suppression of the rebellion. Railroad building appeared to them altogether too slow an operation of war. To show how sagacious was the President's advice, we may anticipate by recalling that in the following summer General Buell spent as much time, money, and military strength in his attempted march from Corinth to East Tennessee as would have amply sufficed to build the line from Lexington to Knoxville recommended by Mr. Lincoln, the general's effort resulting only in his being driven back to Louisville, that in 1863 Burnside, under greater difficulties, made the march and successfully held Knoxville, even without a railroad, which Thompson, with a few regiments, could have accomplished in 1861, and that in the final collapse of the rebellion in the spring of 1865, the beaten armies of both Johnston and Lee attempted to retreat for a last stand to this same mountain region which Mr. Lincoln pointed out in December 1861. Though the President received no encouragement from senators and representatives in his plan to take possession of East Tennessee, that object was specially enjoined in the instructions to General Buell when he was sent to command in Kentucky. It so happens that a large majority of the inhabitants of eastern Tennessee are in favor of the Union. It therefore seems proper that you should remain on the defensive on the line from Louisville to Nashville, while you throw the masses of your forces by rapid marches by Cumberland Gap or Walker's Gap on Knoxville, in order to occupy the railroad at that point, and thus enable the loyal citizens of eastern Tennessee to rise while you at the same time cut off the railway communication between eastern Virginia and the Mississippi. Three times within the same month, McClellan repeated this injunction to Buell with additional emphasis. Senator Andrew Johnson and Representative Horace Maynard telegraphed him from Washington. Our people are oppressed and pursued as beasts of the forest. The government must come to their relief. Buell replied, keeping the word of promise to the ear, but with his ambition fixed on a different campaign, gradually but doggedly broke it to the hope. 
When, a month later, he acknowledged that his preparations and intent were to move against Nashville, the President wrote him, Of the two, I would rather have a point on the railroad south of Cumberland Gap than Nashville. First, because it cuts a great artery of the enemy's communication which Nashville does not, and secondly, because it is in the midst of loyal people who would rally around it while Nashville is not, but my distress is that our friends in East Tennessee are being hanged and driven to despair, and even now, I fear, are thinking of taking rebel arms for the sake of personal protection. In this we lose the most valuable stake we have in the South. McClellan's comment amounted to a severe censure, and this was quickly followed by an almost positive command to advance on eastern Tennessee at once. Again Buell promised compliance, only, however, again to report in a few weeks his conviction that an advance into east Tennessee is impracticable at this time on any scale which would be sufficient. It is difficult to speculate upon the advantages lost by this unwillingness of a commander to obey instructions. To say nothing of the strategical value of East Tennessee to the Union, the fidelity of its people is shown in the reports sent to the Confederate government that the whole country is now in a state of rebellion, that civil war has broken out in East Tennessee, and that they look for the reestablishment of the federal authority in the South with as much confidence as the Jews look for the coming of the Messiah. Henry W. Halleck, born in 1815, graduated from West Point in 1839, who, after distinguished service in the Mexican War, had been breveted Captain of Engineers, but soon afterward resigned from the Army to pursue the practice of law in San Francisco, was, perhaps, the best professionally equipped officer among the number of those called by General Scott in the summer of 1861 to assume important command in the Union Army. It is probable that Scott intended he should succeed himself as General-in-Chief, but when he reached Washington the autumn was already late, and because of Fremont's conspicuous failure it seemed necessary to send Halleck to the Department of the Missouri, which, as reconstituted, was made to include, in addition to several northwestern states, Missouri and Arkansas, and so much of Kentucky as lay west of the Cumberland River. This change of department lines indicates the beginning of what soon became a dominant feature of military operations, namely that instead of the vast regions lying west of the Mississippi, the great river itself and the country lying immediately adjacent to it on either side became the third principal field of strategy and action, under the necessity of opening and holding it as a great military and commercial highway. While the intention of the government to open the Mississippi River by a powerful expedition received additional emphasis through Halleck's appointment, that general found no immediate means adequate to the task when he assumed command at St. Louis. Fremont's regime had left the whole department in the most deplorable confusion. Halleck reported that he had no army, but rather a military rabble to command, and for some weeks devoted himself with energy and success to bringing order out of the chaos left him by his predecessor. A large element of his difficulty lay in the fact that the population of the whole state was tainted with disloyalty to a degree which rendered Missouri less a factor in the larger questions of general army operations than, from the beginning to the end of the war, a local district of bitter and relentless factional hatred and guerrilla, or, as the term was constantly employed, bushwhacking warfare, intensified and kept alive by annual roving Confederate incursions from Arkansas and the Indian Territory in dulcetory summer campaigns. End of chapter 18of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay.
Chapter 19 Lincoln Directs Cooperation Halleck and Buell Ulysses S. Grant Grant's Demonstration Victory at Mill River Fort Henry Fort Donelson Buell's Tardiness Halleck's Activity Victory of Pea Ridge Halleck Receives General Command Pittsburgh Landing Island No. 10 Halleck's Corinth Campaign Halleck's Mistakes Toward the end of December 1861, the prospects of the administration became very gloomy. McClellan had indeed organized a formidable army at Washington, but it had done nothing to efface the memory of the Bull Run defeat. On the contrary, a practical blockade of the Potomac by rebel batteries on the Virginia shore, and another small but irritating defeat at Ball's Bluff, greatly heightened public impatience. The necessary surrender of Mason and Slidell to England was exceedingly unpalatable. Government expenditures had risen to $2 million a day, and a financial crisis was imminent. Buell would not move into East Tennessee, and Halleck seemed powerless in Missouri. Added to this, McClellan's illness completed a stagnation of military affairs both east and west. Congress was clamoring for results, and its Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War was pushing a searching inquiry into the causes of previous defeats. To remove this inertia, President Lincoln directed specific questions to the Western commanders. Are General Buell and yourself in concert? He telegraphed Halleck on December 31. And next day he wrote, I am very anxious that, in case of General Buell's moving toward Nashville, the enemy shall not be greatly reinforced, and I think there is a danger he will be from Columbus. It seems to me that a real or feigned attack on Columbus from upriver at the same time would either prevent this or compensate for it by throwing Columbus into our hands. Similar questions also went to Buell, and their replies showed that no concert, arrangement, or plans existed, and that Halleck was not ready to cooperate. The correspondence started by the President's inquiry for the first time clearly brought out an estimate of the Confederate strength opposed to a southward movement in the West. Since the Confederate invasion of Kentucky on September 4, the rebels had so strongly fortified Columbus on the Mississippi River that it came to be called the Gibraltar of the West, and now had a garrison of 20,000 to hold it, while General Buckner was supposed to have a force of 40,000 at Bowling Green on the railroad between Louisville and Nashville. For more than a month, Buell and Halleck had been aware that a joint river and land expedition southward up the Tennessee or the Cumberland River, which would outflank both positions and cause their evacuation, was practicable with but little opposition. Yet neither Buell nor Halleck had exchanged a word about it or made the slightest preparation to begin it, each being busy in his own field and with his own plans. Even now, when the President had started the subject, Halleck replied that it would be bad strategy for himself to move against Columbus, or Buell against Bowling Green, but he had nothing to say about a Tennessee River expedition or cooperation with Buell to effect it except by indirectly complaining that to withdraw troops from Missouri would risk the loss of that state. The President, however, was no longer satisfied with indecision and excuses, and telegraphed to Buell on January 7, Please name as early a day as you safely can on or before which you can be ready to move southward in concert with Major General Halleck. Delay is ruining us, and it is indispensable for me to have something definite. I send a like dispatch to Major General Halleck. To this Buell made no direct reply, while Halleck answered that he had asked Buell to designate a date for a demonstration, and explained two days later, I can make, with the gunboats and available troops, a pretty formidable demonstration, but no real attack. In point of fact, Halleck had on the previous day, January 6, 
written to Brigadier General U.S. Grant. I wish you to make a demonstration in force, and he added full details to which Grant responded on January 8. Your instructions of the 6th were received this morning, and immediate preparations made for carrying them out, also adding details on his part. Ulysses S. Grant was born on April 27, 1822, was graduated from West Point in 1843, and breveted captain for gallant conduct in the Mexican War, but resigned from the Army and was engaged with his father in a leather store at Galena, Illinois, when the Civil War broke out. Employed by the governor of Illinois a few weeks at Springfield to assist in organizing militia regiments under the president's first call, Grant wrote a letter to the War Department at Washington tendering his services and saying, I feel myself competent to command a regiment, if the President in his judgment should see fit to entrust one to me. For some reason, never explained, this letter remained unanswered, though the department was then and afterward in constant need of educated and experienced officers. A few weeks later, however, Governor Yates commissioned him colonel of one of the Illinois Three Years Regiments. From that time until the end of 1861, Grant, by constant and specially meritorious service, rose in rank to Brigadier General and to the command of the important post of Cairo, Illinois, having meanwhile, on November 7th, won the Battle of Belmont on the Missouri shore opposite Columbus. The demonstration ordered by Halleck was probably intended only as a passing show of activity, but it was executed by Grant, though under strict orders to avoid a battle, with a degree of promptness and earnestness that drew after it momentous consequences. He pushed a strong reconnaissance by 8,000 men within a mile or two of Columbus and sent three gunboats up the Tennessee River, which drew the fire of Fort Henry. The results of the combined expedition convinced Grant that a real movement in that direction was practicable, and he hastened to St. Louis to lay his plan personally before Halleck. At first that general would scarcely listen to it, but returning to Cairo, Grant urged it again and again, and the rapidly changing military condition soon caused Halleck to realize its importance. Within a few days, several items of interesting information reached Halleck. That General Thomas in eastern Kentucky had won a victory over the rebel General Zollicoffer, capturing his fortified camp on the Cumberland River annihilating his army of over ten regiments, and fully exposing Cumberland Gap. That the Confederates were about to throw strong reinforcements into Columbus. That seven formidable Union ironclad river gunboats were ready for service. And that a rise of fourteen feet had taken place in the Tennessee River, greatly weakening the rebel batteries on that stream and the Cumberland. The advantages on the one hand and the dangers on the other, which these reports indicated, moved Halleck to a sudden decision. When Grant, on January 28, telegraphed him, With permission, I will take Fort Henry on the Tennessee and establish and hold a large camp there. Halleck responded on the 30th, Make your preparations to take and hold Fort Henry. It would appear that Grant's preparations were already quite complete when he received written instructions by mail on February 1, for on the next day he started 15,000 men on transports, and on February 4 himself followed with seven gunboats under command of Commodore Foote. Two days later, Grant had the satisfaction of sending a double message in return. Fort Henry is ours. I shall take and destroy Fort Donelson on the 8th. Fort Henry had been an easy victory. The rebel commander, convinced that he could not defend the place, had early that morning sent away his garrison of 3,000 on a retreat to Fort Donelson, and simply held out during a two-hours bombardment until they could escape capture. To take Fort Donelson was a more serious enterprise. That stronghold, lying twelve miles away on the Cumberland River, was a much larger work, with a garrison of six thousand and armed with seventeen heavy and forty-eight field guns. 
If Grant could have marched immediately to an attack of the combined garrisons, there would have been a chance of quick success. But the high water presented unlooked-for obstacles, and nearly a week elapsed before his army began stretching itself cautiously around the three miles of Donelson's entrenchments. During this delay, the conditions became greatly changed. When the Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston received news that Fort Henry had fallen, he had held a council at Bowling Green with his subordinate generals Hardy and Beauregard, and seeing that the Union success would, if not immediately counteracted, render both Nashville and Columbus untenable, resolved, to use his own language, to defend Nashville at Donelson. An immediate retreat was begun from Bowling Green to Nashville, and heavy reinforcements were ordered to the garrison of Fort Donelson. It happened, therefore, that when Grant was ready to begin his assault, the Confederate garrison with its reinforcements outnumbered his entire army. To increase the discouragement, the attack by gunboats on the Cumberland River on the afternoon of February 14 was repulsed, seriously damaging two of them, and a heavy sortie from the fort threw the right of Grant's investing line into disorder. Fortunately, General Halleck at St. Louis strained all his energies to send reinforcements, and these arrived in time to restore Grant's advantage in numbers. Serious disagreement among the Confederate commanders also hastened the fall of the place. On February 16, General Buckner, to whom the senior officers had turned over the command, proposed an armistice and the appointment of commissioners to agree on terms of capitulation. To this Grant responded with a characteristic spirit of determination, no terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. Buckner complained that the terms were ungenerous and unchivalric, but that necessity compelled him to accept them. And Grant telegraphed Halleck on February 16, we have taken Fort Donelson and from twelve to 15,000 prisoners. The senior Confederate generals, Pillow and Floyd, and a portion of the garrison had escaped by the Cumberland River during the preceding night. Since the fall of Fort Henry on February 6, a lively correspondence had been going on in which General Halleck besought Buell to come with his available forces, assist in capturing Donelson, and command the column up the Cumberland to cut off both Columbus and Nashville. President Lincoln, scanning the news with intense solicitude and losing no opportunity to urge effective cooperation, telegraphed Halleck, You have Fort Donelson safe, unless Grant shall be overwhelmed from outside, to prevent which latter will, I think, require all the vigilance, energy, and skill of yourself and Buell acting in full cooperation. Columbus will not get it, Grant, but the force from Bowling Green will. They hold the railroad from Bowling Green to within a few miles of Fort Donelson, with the bridge at Clarksville undisturbed. It is unsafe to rely that they will not dare to expose Nashville to Buell. A small part of their force can retire slowly toward Nashville, breaking up the railroad as they go, and keep Buell out of that city twenty days. Meantime, Nashville will be abundantly defended by forces from all south and perhaps from here at Manassas. Could not a cavalry force from General Thomas on the Upper Cumberland dash across, almost unresisted, and cut the railroad at or near Knoxville, Tennessee? In the midst of a bombardment at Fort Donelson, why could not a gunboat run up and destroy the bridge at Clarksville? Our success or failure at Fort Donelson is vastly important and I beg you to put your soul in the effort. I send a copy of this to Buell. This telegram abundantly shows with what minute understanding and accurate judgment the President comprehended military conditions and results in the West. Buell, however, was too intent upon his own separate movement to seize the brilliant opportunity offered him. As he, only in a feeble advance, followed up the retreating Confederate column from Bowling Green to Nashville, Halleck naturally appropriated to himself the merit of the campaign and telegraphed to Washington on the day after the surrender, 
Make Buell, Grant, and Pope major generals of volunteers, and give me command in the West. I ask this in return for Forts Henry and Donelson. The eagerness of General Halleck for a superior command in the West was, to say the least, very pardonable. A vast horizon of possibilities was opening up to his view. Two other campaigns under his direction were exciting his liveliest hopes. Late in December, he had collected an army of 10,000 at the railroad terminus in Rolla, Missouri, under command of Brigadier General Curtis, for the purpose of scattering the rebel forces under General Price at Springfield or driving them out of the state. Despite the hard winter weather, Halleck urged on the movement with almost peremptory orders, and Curtis executed the intentions of his chief with such alacrity that Price was forced into a rapid and damaging retreat from Springfield toward Arkansas. While forcing this enterprise in the southwest, Halleck had also determined on an important campaign in southeast Missouri. Next to Columbus, which the enemy evacuated on March 2, the strongest Confederate fortifications on the Mississippi River were at Island No. 10, about 40 miles further to the south. To operate against these, he planned an expedition under Brigadier General Pope to capture the town of New Madrid as a preliminary step. Columbus and Nashville were almost sure to fall as the result of Donelson. If now he could bring his two Missouri campaigns into a combination with two swift and strong Tennessee expeditions while the enemy was in scattered retreat, he could look forward to the speedy capture of Memphis. But to the realization of such a project, the hesitation and slowness of Buell were a serious hindrance. That general had indeed started a division under Nelson to Grant's assistance, but it was not yet in the Cumberland when Donelson surrendered. Halleck's demand for enlarged power, therefore, became almost imperative. He pleaded earnestly with Buell. I have asked the President to make you a Major General. Come down to the Cumberland and take command. The Battle of the West is to be fought in that vicinity. There will be no battle at Nashville. His telegrams to McClellan were more urgent. Give it, the Western Division, to me, and I will split secession in twain in one month. And again, I must have command of the armies in the West. Hesitation and delay are losing us the golden opportunity. Lay this before the President and Secretary of War. May I assume command? Answer quickly. But McClellan was in no mood to sacrifice the ambition of his intimate friend and favorite, General Buell, and induce the President to withhold his consent. And while the generals were debating by telegraph, Nelson's division of the army of Buell moved up the Cumberland and occupied Nashville under the orders of Grant. Halleck, however, held tenaciously to his views and requests, explaining to McClellan that he himself proposed going to Tennessee. That is now the great strategic line of the Western Campaign, and I am surprised that General Buell should hesitate to reinforce me. He was too late at Fort Donelson. Believe me, General, you make a serious mistake in having three independent commands in the West. There never will and never can be any cooperation at the critical moment. All military history proves it. This insistence had greater point because of the news received that Curtis, energetically following Price into Arkansas, had won a great Union victory at Pea Ridge between March 5 and 8 over the united forces of Price and McCulloch, commanded by Van Dorn. At this juncture, events at Washington, hereafter to be mentioned, caused the reorganization of military commands and President Lincoln's Special War Order No. 3 consolidated the western departments of Hunter, Halleck, and Buell, as far east as Knoxville, Tennessee, under the title of the Department of the Mississippi, and placed General Halleck in command of the whole. Meanwhile, Halleck had ordered the victorious Union Army at Fort Donelson to move forward to Savannah on the Tennessee River under the command of Grant. And, now that he had superior command, directed Buell to march all of his forces, not required to defend Nashville, 
as rapidly as possible to the same point. Halleck was still at St. Louis, and through the indecision of his further orders, through the slowness of Buell's march, and through the unexplained inattention of Grant, the Union armies narrowly escaped a serious disaster, which, however, the determined courage of the troops and subordinate officers turned into a most important victory. The golden opportunity so earnestly pointed out by Halleck, while not entirely lost, was nevertheless seriously diminished by the hesitation and delay of the Union commanders to agree upon some plan of effective cooperation. When, at the fall of Fort Donelson, the Confederates retreated from Nashville toward Chattanooga and from Columbus toward Jackson, a swift advance by the Tennessee River could have kept them separated. But as that open highway was not promptly followed in force, the flying Confederate detachments found abundant leisure to form a junction. Grant reached Savannah on the east bank of the Tennessee River about the middle of March, and in a few days began massing troops at Pittsburgh Landing, six miles further south, on the west bank of the Tennessee. Still keeping his headquarters at Savannah to await the arrival of Buell and his army. During the next two weeks, he reported several times that the enemy was concentrating at Corinth, Mississippi, an important railroad crossing 20 miles from Pittsburgh Landing, the estimate of their number varying from 40 to 80,000. All this time, his mind was so filled with an eager intention to begin a march upon Corinth and a confidence that he could win a victory by a prompt attack that he neglected the essential precaution of providing against an attack by the enemy, which at the same time was occupying the thoughts of the Confederate commander, General Johnston. General Grant was therefore greatly surprised on the morning of April 6, when he proceeded from Savannah to Pittsburgh Landing to learn the cause of a fierce cannonade. He found that the Confederate army, 40,000 strong, was making an unexpected and determined attack in force on the Union camp, whose five divisions numbered a total of about 33,000. The Union generals had made no provision against such an attack. No entrenchments had been thrown up, no plan or understanding arranged. A few preliminary picket skirmishes had, indeed, put the Union front on the alert, but the commanders of brigades and regiments were not prepared for the impetuous rush with which the three successive Confederate lines began the main battle. On their part, the enemy did not realize their hope of effecting a complete surprise, and the nature of the ground was so characterized by a network of local roads, alternating patches of woods and open fields, miry hollows and abrupt ravines, that the lines of conflict were quickly broken into short, disjointed movements that admitted of little or no combined or systematic direction. The effort of the Union officers was necessarily limited to a continuous resistance to the advance of the enemy from whatever direction it came. That of the Confederate leaders to the general purpose of forcing the Union lines away from Pittsburgh Landing so that they might destroy the Federal transports and thus cut off all means of retreat. In this effort, although during the whole of Sunday, April 6, the Union front had been forced back a mile and a half, the enemy had not entirely succeeded. About sunset, General Beauregard, who, by the death of General Johnston during the afternoon, succeeded to the Confederate command, gave orders to suspend the attack, in the firm expectation, however, that he would be able to complete his victory the next morning. But in this hope, he was disappointed. During the day, the vanguard of Buell's army had arrived on the opposite bank of the river. Before nightfall, one of his brigades was ferried across and deployed in front of the exultant enemy. During the night and early Monday morning, three superb divisions of Buell's army, about 20,000 fresh, well-drilled troops, were advanced to the front under Buell's own direction. And by three o'clock of that day, the two wings of the Union Army were once more in possession of all the ground that had been lost on the previous day, while the foiled and disorganized Confederates were in full retreat upon Corinth. The severity of the battle may be judged by the losses. In the Union Army, 
killed 1,754, wounded 8,408, missing 2,885. In the Confederate Army, killed 1,728, wounded 8,012, missing 954. Having comprehended the uncertainty of Buell's successful junction with Grant, Halleck must have received tidings of the final victory at Pittsburgh Landing with emotions of deep satisfaction. To this was now joined the further gratifying news that the enemy on the same momentous April 7 had surrendered Island No. 10, together with six or 7,000 Confederate troops, including three general officers, to the combined operations of General Pope and Flag Officer Foote. Full particulars of these two important victories did not reach Halleck for several days. Following previous suggestions, Pope and Foote promptly moved their gunboats and troops down the river to the next Confederate stronghold, Fort Pillow, where extensive fortifications aided by an overflow of the adjacent river banks indicated strong resistance and considerable delay. When all the conditions became more fully known, Halleck at length adopted the resolution, to which he had been strongly leaning for some time, to take the field himself. About April 10, he proceeded from St. Louis to Pittsburgh Landing, and on the 15th ordered Pope with his army to join him there, which the latter, having his troops already on transports, succeeded in accomplishing by April 22. Halleck immediately effected a new organization, combining the armies of the Tennessee, of the Ohio, and of the Mississippi into respectively his right wing, center, and left wing. He assumed command of the whole himself, and nominally made Grant second in command. Practically, however, he left Grant so little authority or work that the latter felt himself slighted, and asked to leave to proceed to another field of duty. It required but a few weeks to demonstrate that however high were Halleck's professional acquirements in other respects, he was totally unfit for a commander in the field. Grant had undoubtedly been careless in not providing against the enemy's attack at Pittsburgh Landing. Halleck, on the other extreme, was now doubly overcautious in his march upon Corinth. From first to last, his campaign resembled a siege. With over 100,000 men under his hand, he moved at a snail's pace, building roads and breastworks, and consuming more than a month in advancing a distance of 20 miles, during which period Beauregard managed to collect about 50,000 effective Confederates and construct defensive fortifications with equal industry around Corinth. When, on May 29, Halleck was within assaulting distance of the rebel entrenchments, Beauregard had leisurely removed his sick and wounded, destroyed or carried away his stores, and that night finally evacuated the place, leaving Halleck to reap, practically, a barren victory. Nor were the general's plans and actions any more fruitful during the following six weeks. He wasted the time and energy of his soldiers multiplying useless fortifications about Corinth. He dispatched Buell's wing of the army on a march toward eastern Tennessee, but under such instructions and limitations that long before reaching its objective, it was met by a Confederate army under General Bragg and forced into a retrograde movement which carried it back to Louisville. More deplorable, however, than either of these errors in judgment was Halleck's neglect to seize the opportune moment when, by a vigorous movement in cooperation with the brilliant naval victories under Flag Officer Farragut, commanding a formidable fleet of Union warships, he might have completed the overshadowing military task of opening the Mississippi River. End of chapter 19